Section Zero of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume Two, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rosato Johnson, and John Rudd. Section Zero. An Outline Narrative Tracing briefly the causes, connections, and consequences of the great events from the rise of Greece to the Christian era, Charles F. Horn, Ph.D. Earth's upward struggle has been baffled by so many stumbles that critics have not been lacking to suggest that we do not advance at all, but only swing in circles like a squirrel in its cage. Certain it is that each ancient civilization seemed to bear in itself the seeds of its own destruction. Yet it may be held with equal truth that each new power, rising above the ruins of the last, held something nobler, was borne upward by some truth its rival could not reach. At no period is this more evident than in the five centuries immediately preceding the Christian era. Persia, Greece, Carthage, Rome, each in turn, with some justice, proclaimed Lord of the world, each in turn felt the impulse of her glory, and advanced rapidly in culture and knowledge of the arts, and each in turn succumbed to the temptations that beset unlimited success. They degenerated not only in physical strength, but in moral honesty. Let us recognize, however, that the term world ruler, as applied to even the greatest of these nations, has but a restricted sense when the Persian monarch called himself Lord of the Sun and Moon. He only meant in a figurative way that he was acquainted with no other king so powerful as himself, that beyond his own dominions he heard only of feeble colonies, and beyond those the wilderness. Alexander, when he sighed for more worlds to conquer, had in reality made himself lord of less than a quarter of Asia, and of about one-sixtieth part of Europe. No man and no nation has ever yet been entrusted with the government of the entire globe. None has proved sufficiently fitted for the giant task. Each empire has been, as it were, but an experiment, and beyond the border line of seas and deserts which ringed each boastful conqueror, there was always other races developing along slower, and it may be sure, lines. In those old days, our world was in truth too big for conquest. Armies marched on foot. Provisions could not be carried in any quantity unless a general clung to the seashore and depended on his ships. What Alexander might with more truth have sighed for was some modern means of swift transportation possessed of which he might still have enjoyed many interesting bloody battles in more distant lands. THE DEVELOPMENT OF THE GREEKS Taking the idea world power, in the restricted sense suggested, Persia lost it to Greece at Salamis. As the Asiatic hordes fled behind their panic-stricken king, the Greeks, looking round their limited horizon, could see no power that might vie with them. The idea of pressing home their success and overthrowing the entire unwieldy Persian Empire was at once conceived. But the Greeks were of all races least like to weld earth into one dominion. They could not even unite among themselves. In short, it cannot be too emphatically pointed out that the work of Greece was not to consolidate but to separate, to teach the value of each individual man. Asia had made monarchies in plenty. King after king had passed in splendid, glittering pomp across her plains, circled by a crowd of obsequious courtiers. 
trampling on a nameless multitude of slaves. Europe was to make democracies, or at least to try her hand at them. It has been well said that a democracy is the strongest government for defense, the weakest for attack. Every little Greek city clung jealously to its own freedom and to its equally obvious right to dominate its neighbors. The supreme danger of the Persian invasion united them for a moment, but as soon as safety was assured, they recommenced their bickering. Sparta, with her record of ancient leadership, Athens, with her new won glory against the common foe, each tried to draw the other cities in her train. There was no one man who could dominate them all and consecrate their strength against the enemy. So, for a time, Persia continued to exist. She even, by degrees, regained something of her former influence over the divided cities. Among these, Athens held the foremost rank. She was, as we have previously seen, far more truly representative of the Greek spirit than her rival. Sparta, was aristocratic and conservative, Athens democratic and progressive. The genius of her leaders gathered the lesser towns into a great naval league, in which she grew ever more powerful. Her allies sank to be dependent on unwilling vassals, forced to contribute large sums to the treasury of their overlord. This was the age of Pericles. As Athens became wealthy, her citizens became cultured. Statues, temples, theaters made the city beautiful. Dramatists, orators, and poets made her intellectually renowned. A marvelous outburst, this of Athens, displaying for the first time in history the full capacity of the human mind. Had there been similar flowerings of genius amid forgotten Asiatic times? One doubts it. Doubts if such brilliancy could ever anywhere have passed and left no clearer record of its triumphs. Amid such splendor, it seems captious to point out the flaw. Yet Athenian and all Greek civilization did ultimately decline. It represented intellectual but not moral culture. The Greeks delighted intensely in the purely physical life about them. They had small conception of anything beyond. To enjoy, to be successful, that was all their goal. The means scarce counted. The Athenians called Aristides the just, but so little did they honor his high rectitude that they banished him for a decade. His title or it may have been his insistence on the subject, bored them. His rival, Themistocles, was more suited to their taste, a clever scamp who must always be dealing with both sides in every quarrel and outwitting both. Athens was driven to banish him also, at last, at his too flagrant treachery. But he was not dismissed with the scathing scorn our modern age would heap upon a traitor. He was sent regretfully, as one turns from a charming but too persistently lawless friend. The banishment was only for ten years, and he had his nest already prepared with the Persian king. If you would understand the Greek spirit in its fullest perfection, study Themistocles. Rampant individualism seeking personal pleasure, clamorous for the admiration of its fellows, but not restrained from secret falsity by any strong moral sense. That was what the Greeks developed in the end. Neither must Athens be regarded as a democracy in the modern sense. She was only so by contrast with Persia or with Sparta. Not every man in the beautiful city voted or enjoyed the riches that flowed into her coffers and could thus afford, free from pecuniary care, to devote himself to art. Athens probably had never more than 30,000 citizens. The rest of the adult male population, vastly outnumbering these, were slaves, 
or foreigners attracted by the city's splendor. But those thirty thousand were certainly men. There were giants in those days. One sometimes stands in wonder at their boldness. What all Greece could not do, what Persia had completely failed in, they undertook. Athens alone should conquer the world. By force of arms they would found an empire of intellect. They fought Persia and Sparta both at once. Plague swept their city, yet they would not yield. Their own subject allies turned against them, and they fought those too. They sent fleets and armies against Syracuse, the mighty power of the West. It was Athens against all mankind. She was unequal to the task, superbly unequal to it. The destruction of her army at Syracuse was only the foremost of a series of inevitable disasters, which left her helpless. After that, Sparta, and then Thebes, became the leading city of Greece. Athens slowly regained her fighting strength, her intellectual supremacy she had not lost. Socrates, greatest of her sons, endeavored to teach a morality higher than the earth had yet received, higher than his contemporaries could grasp. Plato gave to thought a scientific basis. Then Macedonia, a border kingdom of ancient kinship to the Greeks, but not recognized as belonging among them, began to obtrude herself in their affairs, and at length won that leadership for which they had all contended. A hundred and fifty years had elapsed since the Greeks had stood united against Persia. During all that time their strength had been turned against themselves. Now, at last, the internecine wars were checked, and all the power of the sturdy race was directed by one man, Alexander, King of Macedon. Democracy had made the Greeks intellectually glorious, but politically weak. Monarchy rose from the ruin they had wrought. As though that ancient invasion of Xerxes had been a crime of yesterday, Alexander proclaimed his intention of avenging it, and the Greeks applauded. They understood Persia now far better than in the elder days. They saw what a feeble mass the huge heterogeneous empire had become. Its people were slaves, its soldiers mercenaries. The Greeks themselves had been hired to suppress more than one Persian rebellion, and to foment these also. They had learned the enormous advantage their stronger personality gave them against the masses of sheep-like Asiatics. So it was in holiday mood that they followed Alexander, and in schoolboy roughness that they trampled on the civilization of the East. In fact, it is worth noting that the most vigorous resistance they encountered was not from the Persians, but from the remnant of the Semites the merchants of the Phoenician city of Tyre. In less than eight years, B.C. 331 to 323, Alexander overran the whole known world of the East, only stopping when, on the border of India, his soldiers broke into open revolt, not against fighting, but against further wandering. If this invasion had been the mere outcome of one man's ambition— it might scarce be worth recording. But Alexander was only the topmost wave in the surging of a long, imminent, inevitable racial movement. Its effect upon civilization, upon the world, was incalculably vast. Alexander and his successors were city-builders, administrators. As such, they spread Greek culture, the Greek idea of individualism all over the world. How deep was the change made upon the embruted Asiatics, we may perhaps question. Our own age has seen how much of education may be lavished upon an inferior race without materially altering the brute instincts within. The building up of the soul in man is not a matter of individuals, but of centuries. Yet, in at least a superficial way, Greek thought became the thought of all mankind. 
we may dismiss Alexander's savage conquests with a sigh of pity, but we cannot deny him recognition as a most potent teacher of the world. His empire did not last. It was in too obvious opposition to all that we have recognized as the Grecian spirit. At his death the same impulse seems to have stirred each one of his subordinates to snatch for himself a kingdom from the confusion. Instead of one there were soon three, four, and then a dozen semi-Grecian states in Asia. The Greek element, in each, grew very faint. From this time onward, Asia takes a less prominent place in world affairs. Her ancient leadership in the march of civilization had long been yielded to the Greeks. Now her resemblance of military power disappeared as well. Only two further happenings in all Asia seem worth noting, down to the birth of Christ. One of these was the Tartar conquest of China, an event which coalesced the Tartars, helped make them a nation. It was thus fraught with the most disastrous consequences for the Europe of the future. The other was the revolt of the Hebrews under Judas Maccabeus, against the Grecian rulers. This was a religious revolt, a religious war. Here, for the first time, we find a people who will believe, who can believe, in no god but their own, who will die sooner than give worship to another. We approach the borders of an age where the spirit is more valued than the body, where the mental is stronger than the physical, where facts are dominated by ideas. Had Alexander, even at the moment of his greatest strength, directed his forces westward instead of east, he would have found a different world and encountered a sturdier resistance. He himself recognized this, and during his last years was gathering all the resources of his unwieldy empire to hurl them against Carthage and against Italy. What the issue might have been, no man can say. Alexander's death ended forever the impossible attempt to unite his race. Once more and until the end, the Grecian strength was wasted against itself. This gave opportunity to the growing powers of the West. Alexander is scarce gone ere we hear Carthage boasting that the Mediterranean is but a private lake in her possession. She rules all western Africa and Spain, Sardinia and Corsica. She masters the Greek of Sicily, against whom Athens failed. Rome is compelled to sign treaties with her as an inferior. THE GROWTH OF ROME Rome was husbanding her strength. The little republic of B.C. 510 had grown much during the two centuries of Grecian splendor. Her people had become far better fitted for conquest than their eastern kinsmen. It is presumable that here, too, it was the difference of surroundings which had differentiated the race. The ancient Etrurian, non-Aryan civilization, on which the Latins intruded, was apparently more advanced than their own. For centuries their utmost prowess scarce sufficed to maintain their independence. Thus it was not possible for them to become too self-satisfied, to stand afar off and look down on their neighbors with Grecian scorn. The ego was less prominently developed, the necessity of mutual dependence and united action was more deeply taught. Their records display less of brilliancy, but more of patient persistency than those of Greece, less of spectacular individualism, more of truly patriotic self-suppression. In Rome, even more than in Sparta, the state was everything. During the early days, men found their highest glory in making their city glorious. Their proudest boast was to be citizens of Rome. To trace the slow steps by which the tiny republic grew to be mistress of all Italy would take too long. She settled her internal difficulties as all such difficulties must be settled, if the race is to progress. That is, she became more democratic. 
as the lower classes advanced in knowledge and intelligence. They insisted on a share of the government. They fought their way to it. They united Rome, mastered the other Latin cities, and admitted them to partnership in her power. She conquered the Etruscans and the Samnites. For a moment we find her almost overwhelmed by an inroad of the wild Celtic tribes from the forests of Central Europe. But fortunately for her, the other Italian states were equally crushed. It was weakness against weakness, and the Romans retained their foremost place. Not till more than a century later were they brought into serious conflict with the Greeks. In the year B.C. 280, Pyrrhus, king of Epirus, who had won a temporary leadership over a portion of the Greek land, undertook the conquest of the West. Fifty years before, Alexander, with far greater power, might have been victorious over a feebler Rome. Pyrrhus failed completely. If the Romans had less dash and a less wide experience of varied warfare than his followers, they had far more of true heroic endurance. The Greeks had reached that stage of individual culture where they were much too selfishly intelligent to be willing to die in battle. Pyrrhus withdrew from Italy. Grecian brilliancy was helpless against Roman strength of union. Then came the far more serious contest between Rome and Carthage. Carthage was a Phoenician, a Semite state, and hers was the last, the most gigantic struggle made by Semitism to recover its waning superiority, to dominate the ancient world. Three times in three tremendous wars did she and Rome put forth their utmost strength against each other. Hannibal, perhaps, the greatest military genius who ever lived, fought upon the side of Carthage. At one time, Rome seemed crushed, helpless before him. Yet in the end, Rome won. It was not by the brilliancy of her commanders, not by the superiority of her resources. It was the grim, cool courage of the Aryan mind, showing strongest and calmest when face to face with ruin. Our modern philosophers, being Aryan, assure us that the victory of Carthage would have been an irretrievable disaster to mankind, that her falsity, her narrow selfishness, her bloody inhumanity would have stifled all progress that her dominion would have been the tyranny of a few heartless masters over a world of tortured slaves. On the other hand, Rome up to this point had certainly been a generous mistress to her subjects. She had left them peace and prosperity among themselves. She had given them as much political freedom as was consistent with her sovereignty. She had well nigh succeeded in welding all Italy into a Roman nation. It is noteworthy that the large majority of the Italian cities clung to her, even in the darkest straits to which she was reduced by Hannibal. Yet when the fall of her last great rival left Rome irresistible abroad, her methods changed. It is hard to see how even Carthaginians could have been more cruel, more grasping, more corrupt than the Roman rulers of the provinces. Having conquered the governments of the world, Rome had to face outbreak after outbreak from the unarmed, unsheltered masses of the people. Her barbarity drove them to mad despair. Servile wars, slave outbreaks, are dotted all over the last century of the Roman Republic. The good, if there was any good, that Roman dominion brought the world at that period, was the spreading of Greek culture across the western half of the world. As Rome mastered the Greek states one by one, their genius won a subtler triumph over the conqueror. Her generals recognized and admired a culture superior to their own. They carried off the statues of Greece for the adornment of their villas, and with equal eagerness they appropriated her manners and her thought, her literature and her gods. But this superficial culture could not save the Roman Republic from the dry rot that sapped her vitals from within. As a mere matter of numbers, 
the actual citizens of Rome, or even of the semi-Roman districts, close around her, were too few to continue fighting over all the vast empire they controlled. The sturdy peasant population of Italy slowly disappeared. The actual inhabitants of the capital came to consist of a few thousand vastly wealthy families who held all the power. A few thousand more of poorer citizens depended on the rich, and then a vast swarm of slaves and foreigners, feeders on the crumbs of the Roman table. In the battles against Carthage, the mass of Rome's armies had consisted of her own citizens, or of allies closely united to them in blood and fortune. Her later victories were won by hired troops, men gathered from every clime and every race. Roman generals still might lead them. Roman laws environed them. Roman gold employ them. Yet the fact remained that in these armies lay the strength of the Republic, no longer within her walls, no longer in the stout hearts of her citizens. Perhaps the world itself was slow in seeing this degeneration. The Gracchi brothers tried to stem the tide, and they were slain, sacrificed by the nation they sought to save. Cornelius Sulla, the man who completed, and at the same time made plain to all, the change that had been growing up. Having bitter grievances against his enemies in the capital, he appealed for redress, not to the Roman Senate, not to the votes of the populace, but to the swords of the legions he commanded. Twice he marched his soldiers against Rome. He brushed aside the feeble resistance that was offered and entered the city like a conqueror. The blood of those who had opposed his wishes flowed in streams. Three thousand senators and knights, the flower of the Roman aristocracy, were slain at his nod. Of the common folk and of the Italians throughout the peninsula, the slaughter was immeasurable. And when his bloody vengeance was at last glutted, Sulla ruled as an extravagant, conscienceless, licentious dictator. Rome had found a fitting master. The Struggle of Individuals for Supremacy The Roman people, the mighty race who had defied a Hannibal at their gates, was clearly come to an end. Sulla had provided the power of the Republic to be an empty shell. After his death, men used the empty forms a while, but the surviving aristocrats had learned their awful lesson. They put no further faith in the strength of the city. They watched the armies and the generals, they intrigued for the various commands. It was an exciting game. Life and fortune were the stakes they risked. The prize? The mastery of a helpless world, waiting to be plundered. Pompey and Caesar proved the ablest players. Pompey overthrew what was left of the Greek Asiatic kingdoms, and returned to Rome the idol of his troops well nigh as powerful has been Sulla. Caesar, looking in his turn for a place to build up an army devoted to himself, selected Gaul, and spent eight years in subduing and civilizing what was in a way the most important of all of Rome's conquests. In Gaul he came in contact with another, fresher Aryan race. Rome received new soldiers for her legions, new brains fitted to understand and carry on the work of civilizing the world. When Caesar, turning away from Britain, marched these new formed legions back against Rome, even as Sulla had done, it was almost like another Gallic invasion of the south. Pompey fled. He gathered his legions from Asia, and the world resounded once more to the clash of arms. This, then, was the third and final stage of the huge struggle for empire. War was still the business of the world. Rome had first defeated foreign nations, then she had to defeat the uprisings of the subject peoples. Now her chiefs, finding her exhausted, fought among themselves for the supreme power. Armies of Asiatics, armies of Gauls, each claiming to represent Rome, 
battled over her helpless body. Caesar was victorious. But when the conquering power which had once belonged to the united nation became embodied in a single man, there was a new way by which it might be checked. The government of Rome, like that of the Greek and Asiatic tyrannies, became a despotism tempered by assassination, and Caesar was its foremost victim. His death did not stop the fascinating gamble for empire. It only added one more move to the possible complexities of the game. The lesser players had their chance. They intrigued and they fought. Egypt, the last remaining civilized state outside of Rome, was drawn into the whirlpool also. Cleopatra and Antony acted their reckless parts, and at length, out of the worldwide tumult emerged young Octavius to assume his role as Augustus Caesar, acknowledged emperor of the world. Note, however, that the term world is still one of boast, not truth. Emperor over many men, Augustus was. But the powers of nature still shut many races safe beyond his mastery. The ocean, bounded his dominion on the west, the deserts to the south and east, the German forests to the north. These last he did essay to conquer, but they proved beyond him. The wild German tribes, having no cities, which they must defend at any cost, could afford to flee or hide. Choosing their own time and place when they rose suddenly, smote the legions of Augustus, and melted into the wilderness again. Rome was checked at last. No civilized nation had been able to stand against her, but the wild tribes of the Germans and the Parthians did. Barbarism had still by far the largest portion of the world wherein to live and develop, and gather brain and brawn. Rome could not conquer the wilderness. End of Section Zero Section 1 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Institution and Fall of the Decemvirate in Rome. B.C. 450 by Henry G. Liddell When wars and pestilence had laid a heavy burden upon the Roman people, there appeared to have been a period in which internal commotions and civil strife were stilled, and the quarrels of patricians and plebeians gave way to temporary truce. On the inevitable renewal of the old struggle, the College of Tribunes adopted a measure favorable to the plebeians, insofar as it provided means for checking the abuse of power on the part of consuls in punishing members of that class in connection with the prosecution of suits against them. The passage of this measure had the effect of reopening former conflicts, the patrician elements becoming greatly alarmed at what they regarded as a fresh encroachment upon their hereditary rights. The contest was long and bitter, each side either bringing forward or rejecting again and again the same measures or the same representatives. Finally, compromises were made, and in the year B.C. 452, a commission of ten men, called Decemvirs, constituting the Decemvirate, was chosen, consisting wholly of patricians who entered with great efficiency upon the discharge of legislative duties, which resulted in the production of a new code. This was approved by the Senate and by the popular representatives, and was published in the form of ten copper plates or tables, which were affixed to the Speaker's pulpit in the Forum. Among the new decemvirs appointed in the year B.C. 450 were several plebeians, the first official representatives of the entire people who were chosen from that class. The patrician burgesses endeavored to wrest independence from the plebs after the Battle of Lake Regillus, and the latter, ruined by constant wars with the neighboring nations, being compelled to make good their losses by borrowing money from patrician creditors, and liable to become bondsmen in default of payment, at length deserted the city, 
and only returned on condition of being protected by tribunes of their own. They then, by the firmness of Publilius Valero and Leatorius, obtained the right of electing these tribunes at their own assembly, the Comitia of the tribes. Finally, the great consul Spurius Cassius endeavored to relieve the commonalty by an agrarian law, so as to better their condition permanently. The execution of the agrarian law was constantly evaded, but on the conquest of Antium from the Volsians in the year B.C. 468, a colony was sent thither, and this was one of the first examples of a distribution of public land to poorer citizens, which answered two purposes, the improvement of their condition, and the defense of the place against the enemy. Nor did the tribunes, now made altogether independent of the patricians, fail to assert their power. One of the first persons who felt the force of their arm was the second Appius Claudius. This Sabine noble, following his father's example, had, after the departure of the Fabii, led the opposition to the Publilian law. When he took the field against the Volsians, his soldiers would not fight, and the stern commander put to death every tenth man in his legions. For the acts of his consulship he was brought to trial by the tribunes M. Duilius and C. Sicinius. Seeing that conviction was certain, the proud patrician avoided humiliation by suicide. Nevertheless, the border wars still continued, and the plebeians suffered much. To the evils of debt and want were added, about this time, the horrors of pestilential disease, which visited the Roman territory several times at that period. In one year, B.C. 464, the two consuls, two of the four augurs, and the curio Maximus, who was the head of all the patricians, were swept off, a fact which implies the death of a vast number of less distinguished persons. The government was administered by the Plebeian Ediles under the control of the senatorial Interregis. The Volsians and Aquians ravaged the country up to the walls of Rome, and the safety of the city must be attributed to the Latins and Hernici, not to the men of Rome. Meantime, the tribunes had in vain demanded a full execution of the agrarian law. But in the year B.C. 462, one of the sacred college, by name C. Terentilius Harsa, came forward with a bill, the object of which was to give the plebeians a sure footing in the state. This man perceived that as long as the consuls retained their almost despotic power, and were elected by the influence of the patricians, this order had in its power to thwart all measures, even after they were passed, which tended to advance the interests of the plebeians. He therefore no longer demanded the execution of the agrarian law, but proposed that a commission of ten men, decimbiri, should be appointed to draw up constitutional laws for regulating the future relations of the patricians and plebeians. The reform bill of Tarentilius was, as might be supposed, vehemently resisted by the patrician burgesses, but the plebeians supported their champion no less warmly. For five consecutive years, the same tribunes were re-elected, and in vain endeavored to carry the bill. This was the time which least fulfills the character which we have claimed for the Roman people. Patience and temperance combined with firmness in their demands. To prevent the tribunes from carrying their law, the younger patricians thronged to the assemblies and interfered with all proceedings. Tarentilius, they said, was endeavoring to confound all distinction between the orders. Some scenes occurred which seemed to show that both sides were prepared for civil war. In the year B.C. 460, the city was alarmed by hearing that the capital had been seized by a band of Sabines and exiled Romans, under the command of one Herdonius. Who these exiles were is uncertain, but we know, by the legend of Cincinnatus, that Queso Quinctius, the son of that old hero, was an exile. It has been inferred, therefore, that he was among them, that the tribunes had succeeded in banishing from the city the most violent of their opponents, and that these persons had not scrupled to associate themselves with Sabines to recover their homes. The consul Valerius, aided by the Latins of Tusculum, levied an army to attack the insurgents, on condition that after success the law should be fully considered. The exiles were driven out, and Herdonius was killed, but the consul fell in the assault, and the patricians, led by old Cincinnatus, refused to fulfill his promises. Then followed the danger of the Equian invasion, to which the legend of Cincinnatus, as given above, refers. The stern old man used his dictatorial power quite as much to crush the tribunes at home as to conquer the enemies abroad. 
One of the historians tells us that in this period of seditious violence, many of the leading plebeians were assassinated, as the tribune Genusius had been, and to this time only can be attributed the horrible story mentioned by more than one writer that nine tribunes were burned alive at the insistence of their colleague Musius. Society was utterly disorganized. The two orders were on the brink of civil war. It seemed as if Rome was to become the city of discord, not of law. Happily, there were moderate men in both orders. Now, as at the time of the succession, their voices prevailed and a compromise was arranged. In the eighth year after the first promulgation of the Tarentillian law, this compromise was made, B.C. 454. The law itself was no longer pressed by the tribunes. The patricians, on the other hand, so far gave way as to allow three men, triumviri, to be appointed, who were to travel into Greece and bring back a copy of the laws of Solon, as well as the laws and institutes of any other Greek states which they might deem good and useful. These were to be the groundwork of a new code of laws, such as should give fair and equal rights to both orders, and restrain the arbitrary power of the patrician magistrates. Another concession made by the patrician lords was a small installment of the agrarian law. L. Asilius, tribune of the plebs, proposed that all the Aventine Hill, being public land, should be made over to the plebs, to be their quarter forever, as the other hills were occupied by the patricians and their clients. This hill, it will be remembered, was consecrated to the goddess Diana, Jana, and though included in the walls of Servius, was not yet within the sacred limits, Pomerarium, of the patrician city. After some opposition, the patricians suffered this Isilian law to pass, in hopes of soothing the anger of the plebeians. The land was parceled out into building sites, but as there was not enough to give a separate plot to every plebeian householder that wished to live in the city, one allotment was assigned to several persons, who built a joint house, flats, or stories, each of which was inhabited, as in Edinburgh and in most foreign towns, by a separate family. The three men who had been sent into Greece returned in the third year, B.C. 452. They found the city free from domestic strife, partly from the concessions already made, partly from the expectation of what was now to follow, and partly from the effect of a pestilence which had broken out anew. So far did moderate councils now prevail among the patricians, that after some little delay they agreed to suspend the ordinary government by the consuls and other officers, and in their stead to appoint a council of ten, who were, during their existence, to be entrusted with all the functions of government. But they were to have a double duty. They were not only an administrative, but also a legislative council. On the one hand, they were to conduct the government, administer justice, and command the armies. On the other, they were to draw up a code of laws by which equal justice was to be dealt out to the whole Roman people, to patricians and plebeians alike and by which especially the authority to be exercised by the consuls or chief magistrates was to be clearly determined and settled. This Supreme Council of Ten, or Decemvirs, was first appointed in the year B.C. 450. They were all patricians. At their head stood Appius Claudius and T. Genusius, who had already been chosen consuls for this memorable year. This Appius Claudius, the third of his name, was son and grandson of those two patrician chiefs who had opposed the leaders of the plebeians so vehemently in the matter of the tribunate, but he affected a different conduct from his sires. He was the most popular man of the whole council, and became in fact the sovereign of Rome. At first he used his great power well, and the first year's government of the Decemvirs was famed for justice and moderation. They also applied themselves diligently to their great work of lawmaking, and before the end of the year had drawn up a code of ten tables, which were posted in the forum, that all citizens might examine them, and suggest amendments to the decemvirs. After due time thus spent, the ten tables were confirmed and made law at the Comitia of the Centuries. By this code, equal justice was to be administered to both orders, without distinction of persons. At the close of the year, the first decemvirs laid down their office, just as the consuls and other officers of state had been accustomed to do before. They were succeeded by a second set of ten, who for the next year at least were to conduct the government like their predecessors. The only one of the old decemvirs re-elected was Appius Claudius. The patricians, indeed, endeavored to prevent even this, and to this end he was himself appointed to preside at the new elections. 
for it was held impossible for a chief magistrate to return his own name when he was himself presiding. But Appius scorned precedence. He returned himself as elected, together with nine others, men of no name, while two of the great Quinctian gens who offered themselves were rejected. Of the new Dechimvirs, it is certain that three, and it is probable that five, were plebeians. Appius, with the plebeian Opius, held the judicial office and remained in the city, and these two seem to have been regarded as the chiefs. The other six commanded the armies and discharged the duties previously assigned to the quaestors and ediles. The first Dechimvirs had earned the respect and esteem of their fellow citizens. The new Council of Ten deserved the hatred which has ever since cloven to their name. Appius now threw off the mask which he had so long worn, and assumed his natural character, the same as had distinguished his sire and grandsire of unhappy memory. He became an absolute despot. His brethren in the council offered no hindrance to his will. Even the plebeian Dechimvirs, bribed by power, fell into his way of action, and supported his tyranny. They each had twelve lictors, who carried facies with the axes in them, the symbol of absolute power, as in the times of the kings, so that it was said Rome had now twelve Tarquins instead of one, and one hundred and twenty armed lictors instead of twelve. All freedom of speech ceased. The Senate was seldom called together. The leading men, patricians and plebeians, left the city. The outward aspect of things was that of perfect calm and peace, but an opportunity only was wanting for the discontent which was smoldering in all men's hearts to break out and show itself. By the end of the year the Dechimvirs had added two more tables to the code, so that there were now twelve tables, but these two last were of a most oppressive and arbitrary kind, devoted chiefly to restore the ancient privileges of the patrician caste. Of these tables it should be observed that they were made laws not by the vote of the people, but by the simple edict of the Dechimvirs. It was no doubt expected that the second Dechimvirs would also have held comitia for the election of successors, but Appius and his colleagues showed no such intention, and when the year came to a close they continued to hold office as if they had been re-elected. So firmly did their power seem to be established that we hear of no endeavor being made to induce them to resign. In the course of this next year, B.C. 449, the border wars were renewed. On the north the Sabines and the Equians in the northeast invaded the Roman country at the same time. The latter penetrated as far as Mount Algidus, as in B.C. 458, when they were routed by old Cincinnatus. The Dechimvirs probably, like the patrician burgesses in former times, regarded these inroads not without satisfaction, for they turned away the mind of the people from their sufferings at home. Yet from these very wars sprung the events which overturned their power and destroyed themselves. Two armies were levied, one to check the Sabines, the other to oppose the Equians, and these were commanded by the six military Dechimvirs. Appius and Opius remained to administer affairs at home, but there was no spirit in the armies. Both were defeated, and that which was opposed to the Equians was compelled to take refuge within the walls of Tusculum. Then followed two events which were preserved in well-known legends, and which give the popular narrative of the manner in which the power of the Dechimvirs was at last overthrown. Legend of Sixius Dentatus in the army sent against the Sabines, Sisius Dentatus was known as the bravest man. He was then serving as a centurion. He had fought in 120 battles. He had slain eight champions in single combat, had saved the lives of 14 citizens, had received 40 wounds all in front, had followed in nine triumphal processions, and had won crowns and decorations without number. This gallant veteran had taken an active part in the civil contests between the two orders, and was now suspected by the Dechimvirs commanding the Sabine army of plotting against them. Accordingly, they determined to get rid of him, and for this end they sent him out as if to reconnoiter, with a party of soldiers who were secretly instructed to murder him. Having discovered their design, he set his back against a rock and resolved to sell his life dearly. More than one of his assailants fell, and the rest stood at bay around him, not venturing to come within sword's length, when one wretch climbed up the rock behind and crushed the brave old man with a massive stone. But the manner of his death could not be hidden from the army, and the generals only prevented an outbreak by honoring him with a magnificent funeral. Such was the state of things in the Sabine army. 
Legend of Virginia. Footnote. Dionysius is the authority for this legend. End of footnote. The other army had a still grosser outrage to complain of. In this there was a notable centurion, Virginius by name, his daughter Virginia, just ripening into womanhood, beautiful as the day, was betrothed to L. Isilius, the tribune who had carried the law for allotting the Aventine Hill to the plebeians. Appius Claudius, the Dutch envir, saw her, and lusted to make her his own, and with this intent he ordered one of his clients, M. Claudius by name, to lay hands upon her as she was going to her school in the forum, and to claim her as his slave. The man did so, and when the cries of her nurse brought a crowd round them, M. Claudius insisted on taking her before the Dutch envir, in order, as he said, to have the case fairly tried. Her friends consented, and no sooner had Appius heard the matter than he gave judgment that the maiden should be delivered up to the claimant, who should be bound to produce her in case her alleged father appeared to gainsay the claim. Now this judgment was directly against one of the laws of the Twelve Tables, which Appius himself had framed. For therein it was provided that any person being at freedom should continue free till it was proved that such person was a slave. Isilius, therefore, with Numitorius, the uncle of the maiden, boldly argued against the legality of the judgment, and at length Appius, fearing a tumult, agreed to leave the girl in their hands on condition of their giving bail to bring her before him the next morning, and then, if Virginius did not appear, he would at once, he said, give her up to her pretended master. To this Isilius consented, but he delayed giving bail, pretending that he could not procure it readily. In the meantime he sent off a secret message to the camp on Algidus to inform Virginius of what had happened. As soon as the bail was given, Appius also sent a message to the Dutch Envirs in command of the army, ordering them to refuse leave of absence to Virginius. But when this last message arrived, Virginius was already halfway on his road to Rome, for the distance was not more than twenty miles, and he had started at nightfall. Next morning, early, Virginius entered the forum, leading his daughter by the hand, both clad in mean attire. A great number of friends and matrons attended him, and he went about among the people, entreating them to support him against the tyranny of Appius. So when Appius came to take his place on the judgment seat, he found the forum full of people, all friendly to Virginius and his cause but he inherited the boldness as well as the vices of his sires, and though he saw Virginius standing there ready to prove that he was the maiden's father, he at once gave judgment against his own law that Virginius should be given up to M. Claudius till it should be proved that she was free. The wretch came up to seize her, and the lictors kept the people from him. Virginius, now despairing of deliverance, begged Appius to allow him to ask the maiden whether she were indeed his daughter or not. If, said he, I find I am not her father, I shall bear her loss the lighter. Under this pretense he drew her aside to a spot upon the northern side of the forum, afterward called the Nova Tabernke, and here, snatching up a knife from a butcher's stall, he cried, In this way only can I keep thee free, and so saying stabbed her to the heart. Then he turned to the tribunal and said, On thee, Appius, and on thy head be this blood. Appius cried out to seize the murderer, but the crowd made way for Virginius, and he passed through them holding up the bloody knife, and went out at the gate, and made straight for the army. There, when the soldiers had heard his tale, they at once abandoned their decemviral generals, and marched to Rome. They were soon followed by the other army from the Sabine frontier, for to them Isilius had gone, and Numitorius, and they found willing ears among men who were already enraged by the murder of old Susius Dentatus. So the two armies joined their banners, elected new generals, and encamped upon the Aventine Hill, the quarter of the plebeians. Meantime, the people at home had risen against Appius, and after driving him from the forum, they joined their armed fellow citizens upon the Aventine. There, the whole body of the commons, armed and unarmed, hung like a dark cloud ready to burst upon the city. Whatever may be the truth of the legends of Sisius and Virginia, there can be no doubt that the conduct of the Dechemvirs had brought matters to the verge of civil war. At this juncture the Senate met, and the moderate party so far prevailed as to send their own leaders, M. Horatius Barbatus and L. Valerius Potidus, to negotiate with the insurgents. The plebeians were ready to listen to the voices of these men, for they remembered that the consuls of the first year of the Republic when the patrician burgesses were friends to the plebeians, were named Valerius and Horatius, 
and so they appointed M. Duilius, a former tribune, to be their spokesman. But no good came of it, and Duilius persuaded the plebeians to leave the city and once more to occupy the sacred mount. Then remembrances of the great secession came back upon the minds of the patricians, and the senate, observing the calm and resolute bearing of the plebeian leaders, compelled the decemvirs to resign, and sent back Valerius and Horatius to negotiate anew. The leaders of the plebeians demanded, first, that the tribuneship should be restored, and the comitia tributa recognized. Secondly, that a right of appeal to the people against the power of the supreme magistrate should be secured. Thirdly, that full indemnity should be granted to the movers and promoters of the late secession. Fourthly, that the decemvirs should be burnt alive. Of these demands, the deputies of the Senate agreed to the three first, but the fourth, they said, was unworthy of a free people. It was a piece of tyranny as bad as any of the worst acts of the late government, and it was needless, because any one who had reason of complaint against the late decemvirs might proceed against them according to law. The plebeians listened to these words of wisdom and withdrew their savage demand. The other three were confirmed by the fathers, and the plebeians returned to their quarters on the Aventine. Here they held an assembly according to their tribes, in which the Pontifex Maximus presided and they now for the first time elected ten tribunes, first Virginius, Numitorius, and Isilius, then Duilius, and six others. So full were their minds of the wrong done to the daughter of Virginius, so entirely was it the blood of young Virginia that overthrew the Dutch Empires, even as that of Lucretia had driven out the Tarquins. The plebeians now returned to the city, headed by their ten tribunes, a number which was never again altered so long as the tribunate continued in existence. It remained for the patricians to redeem the pledges given by their agents Valerius and Horatius on the other demands of the plebeian leaders. The first thing to settle was the election of the supreme magistrates. The decemvirs had fallen, and the state was without any executive government. It has been supposed, as we have said above, that the government of the decemvirs was intended to be perpetual. The patricians gave up their consuls and the plebeians their tribunes, on condition that each order was to be admitted to an equal share in the new decemviral college. But the tribunes were now restored in augmented number, and it was but natural that the patricians should insist on again occupying all places in the supreme magistracy. By common consent, as it would seem, the comitia of the centuries met and elected to the consulate the two patricians who had shown themselves the friends of both orders, L. Valerius Potidus and M. Horatius Barbatus. Thus ended the government of the decemvirate. End of section 1. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 2 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elsie Selwyn. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Pericles Rules in Athens, B.C. 444, by Plutarch, Part 1. Section 2. Pericles Rules in Athens, B.C. 444, by Plutarch, Part 1. Under the sway of Pericles, many changes occurred in the civil affairs of Athens affecting the constitution of the state and the character and administration of its laws. Events of magnitude marked the struggles of the Athenians with other powers. The development of art and learning was carried to an unprecedented height, and the age of Pericles is the most illustrious in ancient history. Pericles began his career by opposing the aristocratic party of Athens, led by Simon. In this policy, he was aided by complications arising with Sparta and Argos. Directing his attack particularly against the Areopagus, he succeeded in greatly modifying the composition of that body and diminishing its powers. The exile of Simon, the strengthening of Athens by new alliances, and the vigorous prosecution of wars against Persia and Corinth combined to establish his supremacy, 
which was still further confirmed by the building of the long walls connecting Athens with the sea, and by the acquisition of neighboring territory. A favorable convention was concluded with Persia, Athens resumed a state of general peace, and Pericles found himself at the head of a powerful empire formed out of a confederacy previously existing. The strength of this empire was indeed soon impaired by ill-judged military movements, against the advice of Pericles himself, but during six years of peace which followed, he succeeded in perfecting a state whose preeminence in intellectual, political, and artistic development has no rival. In the later wars of Athens, the renown of Pericles was still further enhanced, but his chief glory arose from the architectural adornment of the city, and especially from the building of the Parthenon and the splendid decoration of the Acropolis. While his work of judicial reform remains an added monument to his fame, and among the masters of eloquence his orations preserve for him a foremost place. Pericles was of the tribe Acamantus, and of the township of Cholargos, and was descended from the noblest families in Athens on both his father's and mother's side. His father, Xanthippus, defeated the Persian generals at Mycale, while his mother, Argaristi, was a descendant of Clisthenes, who drove the sons of Pisitratus out of Athens, put an end to their despotic rule, and established a new constitution admirably calculated to reconcile all parties and save the country. She dreamed that she had brought forth a lion, and a few days afterward was delivered of Pericles. His body was symmetrical, but his head was long, out of all proportion, for which reason, in nearly all his statues, he is represented wearing a helmet, as the sculptures did not wish, I suppose, to reproach him with this blemish. The Attic poets called him Squillhead, and the comic poet Cratinus, in his play Chirones, says... From Cronos old in faction is sprung a tyrant dread, and all Olympus calls him the man-compelling head. And again, in the play of Nemesis, Come hospitable Zeus with lofty head, Telecladies too speaks of him as sitting, Bow down with a dreadful frown, Because matters of state have gone wrong, Until at last from his head so vast His ideas burst forth in a throng. And Eupolis, in his play of Demoi, asking questions about each of the great orators as they come up from the other world one after the other, when at last Pericles ascends, says, The great headpiece of those below. Most writers tell us that his tutor in music was Damon, whose name they say should be pronounced with the first syllable short. Aristotle, however, says that he studied under Pythocleides. This Damon, it seems, was a sophist of the highest order, who used the name of music to conceal this accomplishment from the world, but who really trained Pericles for his political contests, just as a trainer prepares an athlete for the games. However, Damon's use of music as a pretext did not impose upon the Athenians, who banished him by ostracism, as a busybody and lover of despotism. Pericles greatly admired Anaxagoras, and became deeply interested in grand speculations, which gave him a haughty spirit and a lofty style of oratory far removed from vulgarity and low buffoonery, and also an imperturbable gravity of countenance and a calmness of demeanor and appearance, which no incident could disturb as he was speaking, while the tone of his voice never showed that he heeded any interruption. These advantages greatly impressed the people. The poet Ion, however, says that Pericles was overbearing and insolent in conversation, and that his pride had in it a great deal of contempt for others, while he praises Simon's civil, sensible, and polished address. But we may disregard Ion as a mere dramatic poet who always sees in great men something upon which to exercise his satiric vein, whereas Zeno used to invite those who called the haughtiness of Pericles a mere courting of popularity and affectation of grandeur to court popularity themselves in the same fashion, since the acting of such a part might insensibly mold their dispositions until they resembled that of their model. Pericles, when young, greatly feared the people. He had a certain personal likeness to the despot Pisistratus, and as his own voice was sweet and he was ready and fluent in speech, Old men who had known Pisitratus were struck by his resemblance to him. He was also rich of noble birth and had powerful friends, so that he feared he might be banished by ostracism and consequently held aloof from politics, but proved himself a brave and daring soldier in wars. 
but when Aristides was dead, Themistocles banished, and Simon generally absent on distant campaigns, Pericles engaged in public affairs, taking the popular side, that of the poor and many, against that of the rich and few, quite contrary to his own feelings, which were entirely aristocratic. He feared, it seems, that he might be suspected of a design to make himself despot, and seeing that Simon took the side of the nobility and was much beloved by them, he took himself to the people as a means of obtaining safety for himself, and a strong party to combat that of Simon. He immediately altered his mode of life, was never seen in any street except that which led to the marketplace and the national assembly, and declined all invitations to dinner and such like social gatherings. But Pericles feared to make himself too common even with the people, and only addressed them after long intervals, not speaking upon every subject and not constantly addressing them, but, as Critolaus says, keeping himself like the Salaminian Trireme for great crises, and allowing his friends and the other orators to manage matters of less moment. Wishing to adopt a style of speaking consonant with his haughty manner and lofty spirit, Pericles made free use of the instrument which Anaxagoras, as it were, put into his hand, and often tinged his oratory with natural philosophy. He far surpassed all others by using this lofty intelligence and power of universal consummation, as the divine Plato calls it, in addition to his natural advantages, adorning his oratory with apt illustrations drawn from physical science. For this reason, some think that he was nicknamed the Olympian, though some refer this to his improvement of the city by new and beautiful buildings, and others from his power both as a politician and general. It is not by any means unlikely that these causes all combine to produce the name. Pericles was very cautious about his words, and whenever he ascended the tribune to speak, used first to pray to the gods that nothing unfitted for the present occasion might fall from his lips. He left no writings except the measures which he brought forward, and very few of his sayings are recorded. Thucydides represents the constitution under Pericles as a democracy in name, but really an aristocracy because the government was all in the hands of one leading citizen. But as many other writers tell us that, during his administration, the people received grants of land abroad, and were indulged with dramatic entertainments, in payments for their services, in consequence of which they fell into bad habits, and became extravagant and licentious, instead of sober, hard-working people as they had been before, let us consider the history of this change, viewing it by the light of the facts themselves. First of all, Pericles had to measure himself with Simon, and to transfer the affections of the people from Simon to himself. As he was not so rich a man as Simon, who used from his own ample means to give a dinner daily to any poor Athenian who required it, clothe aged persons, and take away the fences round his property, so that any one might gather the fruit, Pericles, unable to vie with him in this, turned his attention to a distribution of the public funds among the people, at the suggestion, we are told by Aristotle, of Demonides of Oya by the money paid for public spectacles for citizens acting as jurymen and other paid offices and largesses he soon won over the people to his side so that he was able to use them in his attack upon the senate of the areopagus of which he himself was now to member never having been chosen archon or thesmothet or king archon or polymarch these offices had from ancient times been obtained by lot, and it was only through them that those who had approved themselves in the discharge of them were advanced to Areopagus. For this reason it was that Pericles, when he gained strength with the populace, destroyed this senate, making a fieltes, bring forward a bill which restricted its judicial powers, while he himself succeeded in getting Simon banished by ostracism, as a friend of Sparta and a hater of the people, although he was second to no Athenian in birth or fortune, and won most brilliant victories over the Persians, and had filled Athens with plunder and spoils of war. So great was the power of Pericles with the common people. One of the provisions of ostracism was that the person banished should remain in exile for ten years, but during this period the Lacedaemonians, with a great force, invaded the territory of Tanagra, and as the Athenians at once marched out to attack them, Simon came back from exile, took his place in full armor among the ranks of his own tribe, and hoped by distinguishing himself in the battle among his fellow citizens to prove the falsehood of the Laconian sympathies with which he had been charged. However, the friends of Pericles drove him away as an exile. 
On the other hand, Pericles fought more bravely in that battle than he had ever fought before, and surpassed everyone in reckless daring. The friends of Simon also, whom Pericles had accused of Laconian leanings, now that they had lost a great battle on the frontier and expected to be hard-pressed during the summer by the Lacedaemonians. Pericles, perceiving this, lost no time in gratifying the popular wish, but himself proposed a decree for his recall, and Simon on his return reconciled the two states, for he was on familiar terms with the Spartans, who were hated by Pericles and the other leaders of the common people. Some say that, before Simon's recall by Pericles, a secret compact was made by him by Elpiniki, Simon's sister, that Simon was to proceed on foreign service against the Persians with a fleet of two hundred ships, while Pericles was to retain his power in the city. It is also said that when Simon was being tried for his life, Elpinike softened the resentment of Pericles, who was one of those appointed to impeach him. When Elpinike came to beg her brother's life of him, he answered with a smile, Elpinike, you are too old to meddle in affairs of this sort. But for all that, he spoke only once, for form's sake, and pressed Simon less than any of his other prosecutors. How, then, can one put any faith in Idomeneus, when he accused Pericles of procuring the assassination of his friend and colleague Ephialtes, because he was jealous of his reputation? This seems an ignoble calumny, which Idomeneus has drawn from some obscure source to fling at a man who, no doubt, was not faultless, but of a generous spirit and noble mind, and capable of entertaining so savage and brutal a design." Ephialtes was disliked and feared by the nobles, and was inexorable in punishing those who wronged the people. Wherefore, his enemies had him assassinated by the means of Aristicus of Tanagra. This we are told by Aristotle. Simon died in Cyprus, while in command of the Athenian forces. The nobles now perceived that Pericles was the most important man in the state, and far more powerful than any other citizen. Wherefore, as they still hoped to check his authority, and not allow him to be omnipotent, they set up Thucydides of the township of Alopechai as his rival, a man of good sense and a relative of Simon, but less of a warrior and more of a politician, who, by watching his opportunities and opposing Pericles in debate, soon brought about a balance of power. He did not allow the nobles to mix themselves up with the people in the public assembly, as they had been wont to do, so that their dignity was lost among the masses. But he collected them into a separate body, and by thus concentrating their strength, was able to use it to counterbalance that of the other party. From the beginning, these two factions had been but imperfectly welded together, because their tendencies were different. But now the struggle for power between Pericles and Thucydides drew a sharp line of demarcation between them, and one was called the party of the many, the other that of the few. Pericles now courted the people in every way, constantly arranging public spectacles, festivals, and processions in the city, by which he educated the Athenians to take pleasure in refined amusements. And also he sent out sixty triremes to cruise every year, in which many of the people served for hire for eight months, learning and practicing seamanship. Besides this, he sent a thousand settlers to the Chersonesi, five hundred to Naxos, half as many to Andros, a thousand to dwell among the Thracian tribe of the Bisaltai, and the others to the new colony in Italy founded by the city of Sybaris, which was named Thuri. By this means, he relieved the state of numerous idle agitators, assisted the necessitous, and overawed the allies of Athens by placing his colonists near them to watch their behavior. The building of the temples by which Athens was adorned, the people delighted, and the rest of the world astonished, and which now alone proved that the tales of the ancient power and glory of Greece are no fables, was what particularly excited the spleen of the opposite faction, who inveighed against him in the public assembly, declaring that the Athenians had disgraced themselves by transferring the common treasury of the Greeks from the island of Delos to their own custody. Pericles himself, they urged, has taken away the only possible excuse for such an act, the fear that it might be exposed to the attacks of the Persians when at Delos, whereas it would be safe at Athens. Greece has been outraged and feels itself openly tyrannized over when it sees us using the funds which we exhorted from it for the war against the Persians, for gilding and beautifying our city as if it were a vain woman, and adorning it with precious marbles and statues and temples worth a thousand talents. To this Pericles replied that the allies had no right to consider how their money was spent, so long as Athens defended them from the Persians. 
while they supplied neither horses, ships, nor men, but merely money, which the Athenians had a right to spend as they pleased, provided they afforded him that security which it purchased, it was right, he argued, that after the city had provided all that was necessary for war, it should devote its surplus money to the erection of buildings which would be a glory to it for all ages, while these works would create plenty by leaving no man unemployed and encouraging all sorts of handicraft, so that nearly the whole city would earn wages and thus derive both its beauty and its profit from itself. For those who were in the flower of their age, military service offered a means of earning money from the common stock. Well, as he did not wish the mechanics and lower classes to be without their share, nor yet to see them receive it without doing work for it, he had laid the foundations of great edifices, which would require industries of every kind to complete them, and he had done this in the interests of the lower classes, who thus, although they remained at home, would have just as good a claim to their share of the public funds as those who were serving at sea, and garrison, or in the field." The different materials used, such as stone, brass, ivory, gold, ebony, cypress wood, and so forth, would require special artisans for each, such as carpenters, modelers, smiths, stone masons, dyers, melters, and molders of gold, and ivory painters, embroiderers, workers in relief, and also men to bring them to the city, such as sailors and captains of ships and pilots for such as came by sea, and for those who came by land, carriage builders, Horse breeders, drivers, rope makers, linen manufacturers, shoe makers, road menders, and miners. Each trade, moreover, employed a number of unskilled laborers, so that, in a word, there would be work for persons of every age and every class, and general prosperity would be the result. These buildings were of immense size and unequaled in beauty and grace, as the workmen endeavored to make the execution surpass the design and beauty. But what was most remarkable was the speed with which they were built. All these edifices, each of which one would have thought it would have taken many generations to complete, were all finished during the most brilliant period of one man's administration. In beauty, each of them at once appeared venerable as soon as it was built, but even at the present day the work looks as fresh as ever, for they bloom with an eternal freshness, which defies time and seems to make the work instinct with an unfading spirit of youth." The overseer and manager of the whole was Phidias, although there were other excellent architects and workmen, such as Callicrates and Ictinus, who built the Parthenon on the side of the old Hecatompedon, which had been destroyed by the Persians, and Coriobus, who built the Temple of Initiation at Eleusis, but who only lived to see the columns erected and the architraves placed upon them. On his death, Metagenes of Xipite added the frieze in the upper row of columns, and Xenocles of Cholargos crowned it with the domed roof over the shrine. As to the long wall, about which Socrates says that he heard Pericles bring forward a motion, Callicrates undertook to build it. The odium, which internally consisted of many rows of seats and many columns, and externally of a roof sloping on all sides from a central point, was said to have been built in imitation of the king of Persia's tent, and was built under Pericles' direction. The Propylaea, before the Acropolis, were finished in five years by Menisocles, the architect, and a miraculous incident during the work seemed to show that the goddess did not disapprove, but rather encouraged and assisted the building. The most energetic and active of the workmen fell from a great height and lay in a dangerous condition given over by his doctors. Pericles grieved much for him, but the goddess appeared to him in a dream, and suggested a course of treatment by which Pericles quickly healed the workmen. In consequence of this, he set up the brazen statue of Athene the healer, near the old altar in the Acropolis. The golden statue of the goddess was made by Theodias, and his name appears upon the basement in the inscription. Almost everything was in his hands, and he gave his orders to all the workmen, as has been said before, because of his friendship with Pericles. When the speakers of Thucydides' party complained that Pericles had wasted the public money and destroyed the revenue, he asked the people in the assembly whether they thought he had spent much, when they answered, Very much indeed. He said in reply, Do not then put it down to the public account, but to mine, and I will inscribe my name upon all the public buildings. When Pericles said this, the people, either in admiration of his magnificence of manner, or being eager to bear their share in the glory of the new buildings, shouted to him with one accord to take what money he pleased from the treasury and spend it as he pleased, without stint. 
and finally he underwent the trial of ostracism with Thucydides, and not only succeeded in driving him into exile, but broke up his party. As now there was no opposition to encounter in the city, and all parties had been blended into one, Pericles undertook the sole administration of the home and foreign affairs of Athens, dealing with the public revenue, the army, the navy, the islands, and maritime affairs, and the great sources of strength which Athens derived from her alliances, as well as with Greek as with foreign princes and states, henceforth he became quite a different man. He no longer gave way to the people, and ceased to watch the breath of the popular favor, but he changed the loose and licentious democracy which had hitherto existed, into a stricter aristocratic, or rather monarchical, form of government. This he used honorably and unswervingly for the public benefit, finding the people, as a rule, willing to second the measures which he explained to them to be necessary, into which he asked their consent, but occasionally having to use violence and to force them, much against their will, to do what was expedient. Like a physician dealing with some complicated disorder, who at one time allows his patient innocent recreation and at another inflicts upon him sharp pains and bitter though salutary draughts, Every possible kind of disorder was to be found among a people possessing so great an empire as the Athenians, and he alone was able to bring them into harmony by playing alternately upon their hopes and fears, checking them when overconfident and raising their spirits when they were cast down and disheartened. Thus, as Plato says, he was able to prove that oratory is the art of influencing men's minds, and to use it in its highest application when it deals with men's passions and characters, which, like certain strings of a musical instrument, require a skillful and delicate touch. The secret of his power is to be found, however, as Thucydides says, not so much in his mere oratory as in his pure and blameless life, because he was so well known to be incorruptible and indifferent to money, for though he made the city, which was a great one, into the greatest and richest city of Greece, and though he himself became more powerful than many independent sovereigns, who were able to leave their kingdoms to their sons, yet Pericles did not increase by one single drachma the estate which he received from his father. For forty years he held the first place among such men as Ephialtes, Leocrates, Meronides, Simon, Tonmides and Thucydides, and, after the fall and banishment of Thucydides by ostracism, he united in himself for five and twenty years all the various offices of state, which were supposed to last only for one year, and yet during the whole of that period proved himself incorruptible by bribes. End of section two. Section three of The Great Events by Famous Historians, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elsie Selwyn. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Section 3. Pericles Rules in Athens, B.C. 444, by Plutarch, Part 2. As the Lacedaemonians began to be jealous of the prosperity of the Athenians, Pericles, wishing to raise the spirit of the people, and to make them feel capable of immense operations, passed a decree inviting all the Greeks, whether inhabiting Europe or Asia, whether living in large cities or small ones, to send representatives to a meeting at Athens to deliberate about the restoration of the Greek temples which had been burned by the barbarians, about the sacrifices which were due in consequence of the vows which they had made to the gods on behalf of Greece before before joining the battle, and about the sea, that all men might be able to sail upon it in peace and without fear. To carry out this decree, twenty men, selected from the citizens over fifty years of age, were sent out, five of whom invited the Ionian and Dorian Greeks in Asia, and the islands as far as Lesbos and Rhodes, five went to the inhabitants of the Hellespont and Thrace as far as Byzantium, and five more proceeded to Boetia, Phocis, and Peloponnesus, passing from thence through Locris to the neighboring continent as far as, as far as Arcanania and Ambracia, while the remainder journeyed through Euboea to the Oetaeans and the Malian Gulf and to the Achaeans of Phytia and the Thessalians, urging them to join the assembly and take part in the deliberations concerning the peace and well-being of Greece. However, nothing was effected, and the cities never assembled, in consequence, it is said, of the covert hostility of the Lacedaemonians, and because the attempt was first made in Peloponnesus and failed there. 
yet i have inserted an account of it in order to show the lofty spirit and magnificent designs of pericles in his campaigns he was chiefly remarkable for caution for he would not if he could not help it begin a battle of which the issue was doubtful nor did he wish to emulate those generals who have won themselves a great reputation by running risks and trusting to good luck but he ever used to say to his countrymen that none of them should come by their deaths through any act of his observing that Ptolemides, the son of Ptolemaeus, elated by previous successes and by the credit which he had gained as a general was about to invade boeotia in a reckless manner and had persuaded a thousand young men to follow him without any support whatever he endeavoured to stop him and made that memorable saying in the public assembly that if Ptolemides would not take the advice of pericles he would at any rate do well to consult that of best advisers time this speech had but little success at the time, but when a few days afterward the news came that Ptolemides had fallen in action at Coronea, and many noble citizens with him, Pericles was greatly respected and admired as a wise and patriotic man. His most successful campaign was that in the Chersoneasus, which proved the salvation of the Greeks residing there, for he had not only settled a thousand colonists there and thus increased the available force of the cities, but built a continuous line of fortifications reaching across the isthmus from one sea to the other, by which he shut off the Thracians, who had previously ravaged the peninsula, and put an end to a constant and harassing border warfare to which the settlers were exposed, as they had for neighbors tribes of wild plundering barbarians. But that by which he obtained most glory and renown was when he started from Pegai to the Megarian territory, and sailed round the Peloponnesus with a fleet of hundred triremes, for he not only laid waste much of the country near the coast, as Ptolemides had previously done, but he proceeded far inland, away from his ships, leading the troops who were on board, and terrified the inhabitants so much that they shut themselves up in their strongholds. The men of Sicyon alone ventured to meet him at Nemea, and them he overthrew it in a pitched battle and erected a trophy. Next he took on board troops from the friendly district of Achaia, and crossing over to the opposite side of the Corinthian Gulf, coasted along past the mouth of the river Achelus, overran Acarnania, drove the people of Oenidae to the shelter of their city walls, and after ravaging the country returned home, having made himself a terror to his enemies, and done good service to Athens. But not the least casualty, even by accident, befell the troops under his command. When he sailed into the Black Sea with a great and splendidly equipped fleet, he assisted the Greek cities there and treated them with consideration, and showed the neighboring savage tribes and their chiefs the greatness of his force and his confidence in his power, by sailing where he pleased and taking complete control over that sea. He left at Sinope thirteen ships and a land force under the command of Lamachus to act against Temesilian, who had made himself despot of that city. When he and his party were driven out, Pericles passed a decree that six hundred Athenian volunteers should sail to Sinope and become citizens there, receiving the houses and lands which had formerly been in the possession of the despot and his party. But in other cases he would not agree to the impulsive proposals of the Athenians, and he opposed them when, elated by their power and good fortune, they talked of recovering Egypt and attacking the seaboard of the Persian Empire. Many, too, were inflamed with that ill-starred notion of an attempt on Sicily, which was afterward blown into a flame by Alcabiades and other orators. Some even dreamed of the conquest of Etruria and Carthage, in consequence of the greatness which the Athenian Empire had already reached and the full tide of success which seemed to attend it. Pericles, however, restrained these outbursts and would not allow the people to meddle with foreign states, but used the power of Athens chiefly to preserve and guard her already existing empire, thinking it to be of paramount importance to oppose the Lacedaemonians, a task to which he bent all his energies, as it proved by many of his acts, especially in connection with the sacred war. And this war the Lacedaemonians sent a force to Delphi, and made the Phocians who held it give it up to the people of Delphi, but as soon as they were gone, Pericles made an expedition into the country and restored the temple to the Phocians. And as the Lacedaemonians had scratched the oracle which the Delphians had given them, on the forehead of the brazen wolf there, Pericles got a response from the oracle for the Athenians and carved it on the right side of the same wolf. Events proved that Pericles was right in confining the Athenian empire to Greece. First of all, Euboea revolted, and he was obliged to lead an army to subdue that island, 
Shortly after this news came that the Megareans had become hostile and that an army under the command of Plistoanax, king of the Lacedaemonians, was menacing the frontier of Attica. Pericles now in all haste withdrew his troops from Euboea to meet the invader. He did not venture on engagement with the numerous and warlike forces of the enemy, although repeatedly invited by them to fight. But observing that Plistoanax was a very young man and entirely under the influence of Clenindrides, whom the Ephors had sent to act as his tutor and counselor because of his tender years, he opened secret negotiations with the latter, who at once, for a bribe, agreed to withdraw the Peloponnesians from Attica. When their army returned and dispersed, the Lacedaemonians were so incensed that they imposed a fine on their king and condemned Cleandrides, who fled the country to be put to death. This Cleandrides was the father of Gylippus, who caused the ruin of the Athenian expedition in Sicily. Avarice seems to have been hereditary in the city, for Gallippus himself, after brilliant exploits in war, was convicted of taking bribes and banished from Sparta in disgrace. When Pericles submitted the accounts of the campaign to the people, there was an item of ten talents, for a necessary purpose, which the people passed without any questioning or any curiosity to learn the secret. Some historians, among whom is Theophrastus, the philosopher, say that Pericles sent ten talents annually to Sparta, by means of which he bribed the chief magistrates to defer the war, thus not buying peace, but time to make preparations for a better defense. He immediately turned his attention to the insurgents and Euboea, and proceeded thither with a fleet of fifty sail and five thousand heavy armed troops. He reduced their cities to submission. He banished from Chalcis the equestrian order, as it was called, consisting of men of wealth and station, and he drove all the inhabitants of Hestiaia out of their country, replacing them by Athenian settlers. He treated these people with this pitiless severity because they had captured an Athenian ship and put its crew to the sword. After this, as the Athenians and Lacedaemonians made a truce for thirty years, Pericles decreed the expedition against Samos on the pretext that they had disregarded the commands of the Athenians to cease from their war with the Milicians. Pericles is accused of going to war with Samos to save the Milicians. These states were at war about the possession of the city of Pirene, and the Samians, who were victorious, would not lay down their arms and allow the Athenians to settle the matter by arbitration, as they ordered them to do. For this reason, Pericles proceeded to Samos, put an end to the oligarchical form of government there, and sent fifty hostages and as many children to Lemnos to ensure the good behavior of the leading men. It is said that each of these hostages offered him a talent for his own freedom, and that much more was offered by that party which was loath to see a democracy established in the city. Besides all this, Pesuthenes, the Persian, who had a liking for the Samians, sent and offered him ten thousand pieces of gold if he would spare the city. Pericles, however, took none of these bribes, but dealt with Samos as he had previously determined, and returned to Athens. The Samians now at once revolted as Pesuthenes managed to get them back their hostages and furnish them with the means of carrying on the war. Pericles now made a second expedition against them, and found them in no mind to submit quietly, but determined to dispute the empire of the seas with the Athenians. Pericles gained a signal victory over them in a sea fight off the Goats Island, beating a fleet of seventy ships with only forty-four, twenty of which were transports. Simultaneously with his victory and the flight of the enemy, he obtained command of the harbor of Samos, and besieged the Samians in their city. They, in spite of their defeat, still possessed courage enough to sally out and fight a battle under the walls, but soon a larger force arrived from Athens, and the Samians were completely blockaded. Pericles, now with sixty ships, sailed out of the archipelago into the Mediterranean, according to the most current report intending to meet the Phoenician fleet which was coming to help the Samians, but according to Hestes and Brotus, with the intent of attacking Cyprus, which seems improbable. Whatever his intention may have been, his expedition was a failure, for Melissus, the son of Iphigenes, a man of culture who was then in command of the Samian forces, conceiving a contempt for the small force of the Athenians and the want of experience of their leaders after Pericles' departure, persuaded his countrymen to attack them. In the battle, the Samians proved victorious, taking many Athenians prisoner and destroying many of their ships. By this victory they obtained command of the sea and were able to supply themselves with more warlike stores than they had possessed before. Aristotle even says that Pericles himself was before this beaten by Melissus in a sea fight. 
The Samians branded the figure of an owl on the foreheads of their Athenian prisoners to revenge themselves for the branding of their own prisoners by the Athenians with the figure of a Samina. This is a ship having a beak turned up like a swine's snout, but with a roomy hull so as both to carry a large cargo and sail fast. This class of vessel was called a Samina because it was first built at Samos by Polocrates, the despot of that island. When Pericles heard of the disaster which had befallen his army, he returned in all haste to assist them. He beat Melissus, who came out to meet him, and after putting the enemy to rout and at once built a wall round their city, preferring to reduce it by blockade to risking the lives of his countrymen in an assault. In the ninth month of the siege, the Samians surrendered. Pericles demolished their walls, confiscated their fleet, and imposed a heavy fine upon them, some part of which was paid at once by the Samians, who gave hostages for the payment of the remainder at fixed periods. Pericles, after the reduction of Samos, returned to Athens, where he buried those who had fallen in the war in a magnificent manner, and was much admired for the funeral oration which, as is customary, was spoken by him over the graves of his countrymen. Ion says that his victory of the Samians wonderfully flattered his vanity. Agamemnon, he was wont to say, took ten years to take a barbarian city, but he in nine months had made himself master of the first and most powerful city in Ionia. And the comparison was not an unjust one, for truly the war was a very great undertaking, and its issue quite uncertain, since, as Thucydides tells us, the Samians came very near to wresting the empire of the sea from the Athenians. After these events, as the clouds were gathering for the Peloponnesian War, Pericles persuaded the Athenians to send assistance to the people of Corsaira, who were at war with the Corinthians, and thus to attach on their own side an island with a powerful naval force, at a moment when the Peloponnesians had all but declared war against them. When the people passed this decree, Pericles sent only ten ships under the command of Lacedaemonius, the son of Simon, as if he designed a deliberate insult, for the house of Simon was on peculiarly friendly terms with the Lacedaemonians. His design in sending Lacedaemonius out, against his will and with so few ships, was that if he performed nothing brilliant, he might be accused, even more than he was already, of leaning to the side of the Spartans. Indeed, by all means in his power, he always threw obstacles in the way of the advancement of Simon's family, for representing that by their very names they were aliens, one son being named Lacedaemonius, another Thessalus, another Elias. Moreover, the mother of all three was an Arcadian. Now Pericles was much reproached for sending these ten ships, which were of little value to the Chorasirians, and gave a great handle to his enemies to use against him, and in consequence sent a larger force after them to Corsaira, which arrived there after the battle. The Corinthians, enraged at this, complained in the Congress of Sparta of the conduct of the Athenians, as did also the Megarinians, who said that they were excluded from every market and every harbor which were in the Athenian hands, contrary to the ancient rights and common privileges of the Hellenic race. The people of Aegina also considered themselves to be oppressed and ill-treated, and secretly bemoaned their grievances in the ears of the Spartans, for they dared not openly bring any charges against the Athenians. At this time, too, Potidaea, a city subject to Athens, but a colony of Corinth, revolted, and its siege materially hastened the outbreak of the war. Archidamus, indeed, the king of the Lacedaemonians, sent ambassadors to Athens, was willing to submit all disputed points to arbitration, and endeavored to moderate the excitement of his allies, so that war probably would not have broken out if the Athenians could have been persuaded to rescind their decree of exclusion against the Megarians, and to come to terms with them. And for this reason, Pericles, who was particularly opposed to this, and urged the people not to give way to the Megarians, alone bore the blame of having begun the war. Pericles passed a decree for a herald to be sent to the Megarians, and then to go on to the Lacedaemonians to complain of their conduct. This decree of Pericles is worded in a candid and reasonable manner, but the herald, Anthemocritus, was thought to have met his death at the hands of the Megarians, and Charnus passed a decree to the effect that Athenians should wage war against them to the death, without truce or armistice, that any Megarian found in Attica would be punished with death, and that the generals, when taking the usual oath for each year, should swear in addition that they would invade the Megarian territory twice every year, and that Anthemocritus should be buried near the city gate leading into the Thracian plain, which is now called the Double Gate. 
How the dispute originated, it is hard to say, but all writers agree in throwing on Pericles the blame of refusing to reverse the decree. Now, as the Lacedaemonians knew that if he could be removed from power, they would find the Athenians much more easy to deal with, they bade them drive forth the accursed thing, alluding to Pericles' descent from the Alcamionidae by his mother's side, as we are told by Thucydides the historian. But this attempt had just the contrary effect to that which they intended, for instead of suspicion and dislike, Pericles met with much greater honor and respect from his countrymen than before, because they saw that he was an object of especial dislike to the enemy. For this reason, before the Peloponnesians under Archidamus invaded Attica, he warned the Athenians that if Archidamus, when he laid waste everything else, spared his own private estate because of the friendly private relations existing between them, or in order to give his personal enemies a ground for impeaching him, he should give both the land and the farm buildings upon it to the state. The Lacedaemonians invaded Attica with a great host of their own troops and those of their allies, led by Archidamus, their king. They proceeded, ravaging the country as they went as far as Acarnae, close to Athens, where they encamped, imagining that the Athenians would never endure to see them there, but would be driven by pride and shame to come out and fight them. However, Pericles thought that it would be a very serious matter to fight for the very existence of Athens against 60,000 Peloponnesian and Boeotian heavy-armed troops, and so he pacified those who were dissatisfied at his inactivity by pointing out that trees, when cut down, quickly grow again, but that when the men of a state are lost, it is hard to raise up others to take their place. He would not call an assembly of the people because he feared that they would force him to act against his better judgment. But just as the captain of a ship, when a storm comes on at sea, places everything in the best trim to meet it, and trusting to his own skill and seamanship, disregarding the tears and entreaties of the seasick and terrified passengers, so did Pericles shut the gates of Athens, place sufficient forces to ensure the safety of the city at all points, and calmly carry out his policy, taking little heed of the noisy grumblings of the discontented. Many of his friends besought him to attack, many of his enemies threatened him and abused him, and many songs and offensive jests were written about him, speaking of him as a coward, and one who was betraying the city to his enemies. Cleon, too, attacked him, using the anger which the citizens felt against him to advance his own personal popularity. Pericles was unmoved by any of these attacks, but quietly endured all this storm of obloquy. He sent a fleet of a hundred ships to attack Peloponnesus, but did not sail with it himself, remaining at home to keep a tight hand over Athens until the Peloponnesians drew off their forces. He regained his popularity with the common people, who suffered much from the war, by giving them allowances of money from the public revenue and grants of land, for he drove out the entire population of the island of Agina and divided the land by lot among the Athenians. A certain amount of relief also was experienced by reflecting upon the injuries which they were inflicting on the enemy, for the fleet as it sailed round Peloponnesus destroyed many small villages and cities, and ravaged a great extent of country, while Pericles himself led an expedition into the territory of Megara and laid it all waste. By this it is clear that the allies, although they did much damage to the Athenians, yet suffered equally themselves, and never could have protracted the war for such a length of time as it really lasted, but as Pericles foretold, must soon have desisted had not providence interfered and confounded human counsels. For now the pestilence fell among the Athenians and cut off the flower of their youth. Suffering both in body and mind, they raved against Pericles, just as people when delirious with disease attack their fathers or their physicians. They endeavored to ruin him, urged on his personal enemies, who assured them that he was the author of the plague, because he had brought all the country people into the city, where they were compelled to live during the heat of the summer, crowded together in small rooms and stifling tents, living an idle life, too, and breathing foul air instead of the pure country breeze to which they were accustomed. The cause of this, they said, was the man who, when the war began, admitted the masses of the country people into the city, and then made no use of them, but allowed them to be penned up together like cattle, and transmit the contagion from one to another, without devising any remedy or alleviation of their sufferings. Hoping to relieve them somewhat, and also to annoy the enemy, Pericles manned a hundred and fifty ships, placed on board, besides the sailors, many brave infantry and cavalry soldiers, and was about to put to sea. The Athenians conceived great hopes, and the enemy no less terror from so large an armament. When all was ready, and Pericles himself had just embarked in his own trireme, an eclipse of the sun took place producing total darkness, and all men were terrified at so great a portent. 
Pericles sailed with the fleet, but did nothing worthy of so great a force. He besieged the sacred city of Epidaurus, but, although he had great hopes of taking it, he failed on account of the plague, which destroyed not only his own men, but everyone who came in contact with them. After this, he again endeavored to encourage the Athenians, to whom he had become an object of dislike. However, he did not succeed in pacifying them, but they condemned him by a public vote to be general no more, and to pay a fine which is stated at the lowest estimate to have been fifteen talents, and at the highest, fifty. This was carried, according to Idomeneus, by Cleon, but according to Theophrastus, by Simeas, while Heraclides of Pontus says that it was effected by Lacertides. He soon regained his public position, for the people's outburst of anger was quenched by the blow they had dealt him, just as the bee leaves its sting in the wound. But his private affairs were in great distress and disorder, as he had lost many of his relatives during the plague, while others were estranged from him on political grounds. Yet he would not yield nor abate his firmness and constancy of spirit because of these afflictions, but was not observed to weep or to moan, or to attend the funeral of any of his relations, until he lost Paralus, the last of his legitimate offspring. Crushed by this blow, he tried in vain to keep up his grand air of indifference, and when carrying a garland to lay upon the corpse, he was overwhelmed by his feelings, so as to burst into a passion of tears and sobs, which he had never done before in his whole life. Athens made trial of her other generals and public men to conduct her affairs, but none appeared to be of sufficient weight or reputation to have such a charge entrusted to him. The city longed for Pericles and invited him again to lead its councils and direct its armies, and he, although dejected in spirits and living in seclusion in his own house, was yet persuaded by Alcibiades and his other friends to resume the direction of affairs. After this, it appears that Pericles was attacked by the plague, not acutely or continuously as in most cases, but in a slow, wasting fashion, exhibiting many varieties of symptoms and gradually undermining his strength. As he was now on his deathbed, the most distinguished of the citizens and his surviving friends collected round him and spoke admiringly of his nobleness and immense power, enumerating also the number of his exploits and the trophies which he had set up for victories gained. For while in chief command he had won no less than nine victories for Athens. Events soon made the loss of Pericles felt and regretted by the Athenians. Those who during his lifetime had complained that his power completely threw them into the shade, when after his death they made trial for other orators and statesmen, were obliged to confess that with all his arrogance no man ever was really more moderate, and that his real mildness in dealing with people was as remarkable as his apparent pride and assumption. His power, which had been so grudged and envied and called monarchy and despotism, now was proved to have been the saving of the state. Such an amount of corrupt dealing and wickedness suddenly broke out in public affairs, which he before had crushed and forced to hide itself, and so prevented its becoming incurable through impunity and license. End of section 3 Section 4 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elsie Selwyn. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Great Plague at Athens, B.C. 430. Almost at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, when the prosperity of Athens had placed her at the height of her power and given her unquestioned supremacy among the Grecian states, her strength was greatly impaired by a visitation against which there was nothing in military prowess or patriotic pride and devotion that could prevail. It is one of the tragic contrasts of history, the picture of Athens in her full triumph and glory, smitten at a moment when she needed to put forth her full strength, by a deadly foe against whose might mortal arms were vain. Her citizens were rejoicing in her social, no less than her military preeminence, and they had already been trained in the hardships necessary to have endured in defense of an invaded country. Again they were prepared to undergo whatever service might be laid upon them in her behalf. They could foresee the arduous tasks and inevitable sufferings of a great war, but had no warning of an impending calamity far worse than those which even war though always attended with horrors, usually entails. Pericles had lately delivered his great funeral oration at the public internment of soldiers who had fallen for Athens. The bright colors and tone of cheerful confidence, says Grote, whose account of the plague follows, 
which pervaded the discourse of Pericles, appear the more striking for being an immediate antecedent to the awful description of this distemper. The death of Pericles himself, who directly or indirectly fell a victim to the prevailing pestilence, marked a grievous crisis for Athens in what was already become a measureless public woe. During the autumn of the year B.C. 427, the epidemic again broke out, after a considerable intermission, and for one year continued, to the sad ruin both of the strength and the comfort of the city. At the close of one year after the attempted surprise of Plataea by the Thebans, the belligerent parties in Greece remained in an unaltered position as to relative strength. Nothing decisive had been accomplished on either side, either by the invasion of Attica or by the flying descents round the coast of Peloponnesus. In spite of mutual damage inflicted, doubtless in the greatest measure upon Attica, no progress was yet made toward the fulfillment of those objects which had induced the Peloponnesians to go to war. Especially the most pressing among all their wishes, the relief of Potidaea, was in no way advanced, for the Athenians had not found it necessary to relax the blockade of that city. The result of the first year's operations had thus been to disappoint the hopes of the Corinthians and the other ardent instigators of war, while it justified the anticipations both of Pericles and of Archidamus. A second devastation of Attica was resolved upon for the commencement of spring, and measures were taken for carrying it all over that territory, since the settled policy of Athens, not to hazard a battle with the invaders, was now ascertained. About the end of March, or beginning of April, the entire Peloponnesian force, two-thirds from each confederate city as before, was assembled under the command of Archidamus and marched into Attica. This time they carried the work of systematic destruction not merely over the Thriasian plain and the plain immediately near to Athens as before, but also to the more southerly portions of Attica, down even as far as the mines of Laurium. They traversed and ravaged both the eastern and western coast, remaining not less than forty days in the country. They found the territory deserted as before, all the population having retired within the walls. In regard to the second invasion, Pericles recommended the same defensive policy as he had applied to the first, and apparently the citizens had now come to acquiesce in it, if not willingly, at least with a full conviction of its necessity. But a new visitation had now occurred, diverting their attention from the invader, though enormously aggravating their sufferings. A few days after Archidamus entered Attica, a pestilence or epidemic sickness broke out unexpectedly at Athens. It appears that this terrific disorder had been raging for some time throughout the region round the Mediterranean, having begun, as was believed, in Ethiopia, thence passing into Egypt and Libya, and overrunning a considerable portion of Asia under the Persian government. About sixteen years before, there had been a similar calamity in Rome and in various parts of Italy. Recently had been felt in Lemnos and some other islands of the Aegean yet seemingly not with such intensity as to excite much notice generally in the Grecian world. At length it passed to Athens and first showed itself in the Piraeus. The progress of the disease was as rapid and destructive as its appearance had been sudden. While the extraordinary accumulation of people within the city and long walls, in consequence of the presence of the invaders in the country, was but too favorable to every form of contagion, families crowded together in close cabins in places of temporary shelter, Throughout a city constructed, like most of those in Greece, with little regard to the conditions of salubrity and in a state of mental chagrin, from the forced abandonment and sacrifice of their properties in the country, transmitted the disorder with fatal facility from one to the other. Beginning as it did about the middle of April, the increasing heat of summer further aided the disorder, the symptoms of which, alike violent and sudden, made themselves the more remarked because the year was particularly exempt from maladies of every other description. Of this plague, or more properly, eruptive typhoid fever, distinctive from, yet analogous to, the smallpox, a description no less clear than impressive has been left by the historian Thucydides himself not only a spectator, but a sufferer. It is not one of the least of his merits that his notice of the symptoms given at so early a stage of medical science and observation is such as to instruct the medical reader of the present age, and to enable the malady to be understood and identified. The observations with which that notice is ushered in deserve particular attention. In respect to this distemper, he says, let every man, physician or not, say what he thinks respecting the source from whence it may probably have arisen, and respecting the causes which he deems sufficiently powerful to have produced so great a revolution. 
But I, having myself had the distemper and having seen others suffering under it, will state what it actually was, and will indicate in addition such other matters as will furnish any man who lays them to heart with knowledge and the means of calculation beforehand in case of the same misfortune should ever occur again. To record past facts as a basis for rational provision in regard to the future, the same sentiment which Thucydides mentions in his preface, as having animated him to the composition of his history, was at that time a duty so little understood that we have reason to admire not less the manner in which he performs it in practice than the distinctness with which he conceives it in theory. We infer from his language that speculation in his day was active respecting the causes of this plague according to the vague and fanciful physics and scanty stock of ascertained facts, which was all that could then be consulted. By resisting the itch of theorizing from one of these loose hypotheses, which then appeared plausibly to explain everything, he probably renounced the point of view from which most credit and interest would be derivable at the time, but his simple and precise summary of observed facts carries with it an imperishable value, and even affords grounds for imagining that he was no stranger to the habits and training of his contemporary Hippocrates and the other Asclepiads of Cos. It is hardly within the province of a historian of Greece to repeat after Thucydides the painful enumeration of symptoms, violent in the extreme and pervading every portion of the bodily system, which marked this fearful disorder. Beginning in Piraeus, it quickly passed into the city, and both the one and the other was speedily filled with sickness and suffering, the like of which had never before been known. The seizures were sudden, and a large proportion of the sufferers perished after deplorable agonies on the seventh or on the ninth day. Others, whose strength of constitution carried them over this period, found themselves the victims of exhausting and incurable diarrhea afterward. With others again, after traversing both these stages, the distemper fixed itself in some particular member, the eyes, the genitals, the hands, or the feet, which were rendered permanently useless, or in some cases amputated, even where the patient himself recovered. There were also some whose recovery was attended with a total loss of memory, so that they no more knew themselves or recognized their friends. No treatment or remedy appearing, except in accidental cases, to produce any beneficial effect, the physicians or surgeon whose aid was invoked became completely at fault. While trying their accustomed means without avail, they soon ended by catching the malady themselves and perishing. The charms and incantations to which the unhappy patient resorted were not likely to be more efficacious. While some asserted that the Peloponnesians had poisoned the cisterns of water, Others referred the visitation to the wrath of the gods, and especially to Apollo, known by hearers of the Iliad as author of pestilence in the Greek host before Troy. It was remembered that this Delphian god had promised the Lacedaemonians, in reply to their application immediately before the war, that he would assist them whether invoked or uninvoked, and the disorder now raging was ascribed to the intervention of their irresistible ally, while the elderly men further called to mind an oracular voice sung in the time of their youth. The Dorian War will come, and pestilence along with it. Under the distress which suggested, and was reciprocally aggravated by these gloomy ideas, prophets were consulted, and supplications with solemn procession were held at the temples to appease the divine wrath. When it was found that neither the priest nor the physician could retard the spread or mitigate the intensity of the disorder, Athenians abandoned themselves to despair, and the space within the walls became a scene of desolating misery. Every man attacked with the malady at once lost his courage, a state of depression itself among the worst features of the case, which made him lie down and die without any attempt to seek for preservatives. And although at first friends and relatives lent their aid to tend the sick with the usual family sympathies, yet so terrible was the number of these attendants who perished, like sheep, from such contact, that at length no man would thus expose himself, while the most generous spirits who persisted longest in the discharge of their duty were carried off in the greatest numbers. The patient was thus left to die alone and unheeded. Sometimes all the inmates of a house were swept away one after the other, no man being willing to go near it. Desertion on the one hand, attendance on the other, both tended to aggravate the calamity. There remained only those who, having had the disorder and recovered, were willing to tend the sufferers. 
These men formed the single exception to the all-pervading misery of the time, for the disorder seldom attacked anyone twice, and when it did, the second attack was never fatal. Elate with their own escape, they deemed themselves out of the reach of all disease, and were full of compassionate kindness for those whose sufferings were just beginning. It was from them, too, that the principal attention to the bodies of deceased victims proceeded, for such was the state of dismay and sorrow that even the nearest relatives neglected the sepulchral duties, sacred beyond all others in the eyes of a Greek. Nor is there any circumstance which conveys to us so vivid an idea of the prevalent agony and despair as when we read, in the words of an eyewitness, that the deaths took place among this close-packed crowd without the smallest decencies of attention, that the dead and dying lay piled upon one another, not merely in the public roads, but even in the temples, in spite of the understood defilement of the sacred building, that half-dead sufferers were seen lying round all the springs, from insupportable thirst, that the numerous corpses thus unburied and exposed were in such a condition that the dogs which meddled with them died in consequence, while no vultures or other birds of the like habits ever came near. Those bodies which escaped entire neglect were burnt or buried without the customary mourning, and with unseemly carelessness, in some cases the bearers of a body, passing by a funeral pyre on which another body was burning, would put their own there to be burnt also, or perhaps if the pile was prepared ready for a body not yet arrived, would deposit their own upon it, set fire to the pile, and then depart. Such indecent confusion would have been intolerable to the feelings of the Athenians in any ordinary time. To all these scenes of physical suffering, death, and reckless despair was superadded another evil, which affected those who were fortunate enough to escape the rest. The bonds both of law and morality became relaxed amid such total uncertainty of every man both for his own life and that of others. Men cared not to abstain themselves from wrong, under circumstances in which punishment was not likely to overtake them, nor to put a check upon their passions, and endure privations in obedience even to their strongest conviction. When the chance was so small of their living to reap reward or enjoy any future esteem, an interval, short and sweet, before their doom was realized, before they became plunged in the widespread misery which they witnessed around and which affected indiscriminately the virtuous and the profligate, was all that they looked to enjoy, embracing with avidity the immediate pleasures of sense, as well as such positive gains, however ill-gotten, as could be made the means of procuring them and throwing aside all thought both of honor and of long-sighted advantage. Life and property being alike ephemeral, there was no hope left but to snatch a moment of enjoyment before the outstretched hand of destiny should fall upon its victims. The picture of a society under the pressure of a murderous epidemic, with its train of physical torments, wretchedness, and demoralization, has been drawn by more than one eminent author, but by none with more impressive fidelity and conciseness than by Thucydides, who had no predecessor, nor anything but the reality to copy from. We may remark that amid all the melancholy accompaniments of the time, there are no human sacrifices, such as those offered up at Carthage during pestilence to appease the anger of the gods. There are no cruel persecutions against imaginary authors of the disease, such as those against the Unturi, anointers of doors, in the plague of Milan in 1630. Three years altogether did this calamity desolate Athens continuously during the entire second and third years of the war, after which followed a period of marked abatement for a year and a half, but it then revived again and lasted for another year with the same fury as at first. The public loss over and above the private misery which this unexpected enemy inflicted upon Athens was incalculable. Out of 1,200 horsemen, all among the rich men of the state, 300 died of the epidemic, besides 4,400 hoplites out of the roll formerly kept, and a number of the poorer population so great as to defy computation. No efforts of the Peloponnesians could have done so much to ruin Athens, or to bring the war to a termination such as they desired, and the distemper told the more in their favor, as it never spread at all into Peloponnesus, though it passed from Athens to some of the more populous islands. The Lacedaemonian army was withdrawn from Attica somewhat earlier than it would have otherwise been, for fear of taking the contagion. 
But it was while the Lacedaemonians were yet in Attica, and during the first freshness of the terrible malady, that Pericles equipped and conducted from Piraeus an armament of one hundred triremes and four thousand hoplites to attack the coasts of Peloponnesus. Three hundred horsemen were also carried in some horse transports, prepared for the occasion out of old triremes. To diminish the crowd accumulated in the city was doubtless a beneficial tendency, and perhaps those who went aboard might consider it as a chance of escape to quit an infected home. But unhappily they carried the infection along with them, which desolated the fleet not less than the city, and crippled all its efforts. Reinforced by fifty ships of war from Chios and Lesbos, the Athenians first landed near Epidaurus in Peloponnesus, ravaging the territory and making an unavailing attempt upon the city. Next, they made like incursions on the most southerly portions of the Argolic Peninsula, Troizen, Haliasis, and Hermione, and lastly attacked and captured Prasiae on the eastern coast of Laconia. On returning to Athens, the same armament was immediately conducted under Agnon and Cleopompus to press the siege of Potidaea, the blockade of which still continued without any visible progress. On arriving there, an attack was made on the walls by battering engines and by the other aggressive methods then practiced. But nothing whatever was achieved. In fact, the armament became incompetent for all serious effort, for the aggravated character which the distemper here assumed, communicated by the soldiers fresh from Athens, even to those who had before been free from it at Potidaea. So frightful was the mortality that out of the 40,000 hoplites under Agnon, no fewer than 1,050 died in the short space of 40 days. The armament was brought back in this distressed condition to Athens, while the reduction of Potidaea was left as before to the slow course of blockade. On returning from the expedition against Peloponnesus, Pericles found his countrymen almost distracted with their manifold sufferings. Over and above the raging epidemic, they had just gone over Attica and ascertained the devastations committed by the invaders throughout all the territory, except the Marathonian Tetropolis and Decliclea, districts spared, as we are told, through indulgence founded on an ancient legendary sympathy, during their long stay of forty days. The rich had found their comfortable mansions and farms, the poor their modest cottages and the various deems, torn down and ruined. Death, sickness, loss of property, and despair of the future now rendered the Athenians angry and intractable to the last degree. They vented their feelings against Pericles as the cause not merely of the war, but also of all that they were now enduring. Either with or without his consent, they sent envoys to Sparta to open negotiations for peace, but the Spartans turned a deaf ear to the proposition. This new disappointment rendered them still more furious against Pericles, whose long-standing political enemies now doubtless found strong sympathy in their denunciations of his character and policy. That unshaken and majestic firmness, which ranked first among his many eminent qualities, was never more imperiously required and never more effectively manifested. In his capacity of strategus, or general, Pericles convoked a formal assembly of the people, for the purpose of vindicating himself publicly against the prevailing sentiment and recommending perseverance in his line of policy. The speeches made by his opponents, assuredly very bitter, are not given by Thucydides, but that of Pericles himself is set down at considerable length, and a memorable discourse it is. It strikingly brings into relief both the character of the man and the impress of actual circumstances, an impregnable mind conscious not only of right purposes, but of just and reasonable anticipations, and bearing up with manliness, or even defiance, against the natural difficulty of the case, heightened by an extreme of incalculable misfortune. He had foreseen, while advising the war originally, the probable impatience of his countrymen under its first hardships, but he could not foresee the epidemic by which that impatience had been exasperated into madness, and he now addressed them not merely with unabated adherence to his own deliberate convictions, but also in a tone of reproachful remonstrance against their unmerited case of sentiment toward him, seeking at the same time to combat that uncontrolled despair which for the moment overlaid both their pride and their patriotism. Far from humbling himself before the present sentiment, it is at this time that he sets forth his titles to their esteem in the most direct and unqualified manner, and claims the continuance of that which they had so long accorded as something belonging to him by acquired right. 
His main object through this discourse is to fill the minds of his audience with patriotic sympathy for the weal of the entire city, so as to counterbalance the absorbing sense of private woe. If the collective city flourishes, he argues, private misfortunes may at least be borne, but no amount of private prosperity will avail if the collective city falls, a proposition literally true in ancient times and under the circumstances of ancient warfare, though less true at present. Distracted by domestic calamity, ye are now angry both with me who advised you to go to war, and with yourselves who followed the advice. Ye listened to me, considering me superior to others in judgment, and speech, and patriotism, and incorruptible probity. Nor ought I now to be treated as culpable for giving such advice, when in point of fact the war was unavoidable, and there would have been still greater danger in shrinking from it. I am the same man, still unchanged, but ye and your misfortunes cannot stand to the convictions which ye adopted when yet unhurt. Extreme and unforeseen indeed are the sorrows which have fallen upon you. Yet, inhabiting as ye do a great city, and brought up in dispositions suitable to it, ye must also resolve to bear up against the utmost pressure of adversity, and never to surrender your dignity. I have often explained to you that ye have no reason to doubt of eventual success in the war, but I will now remind you, more emphatically than before, and even with a degree of ostentation suitable as a stimulus to your present unnatural depression, that your naval force makes you masters not only of your allies, but of the entire sea, one half of the visible field for action and employment. Compared with so vast a power as this, the temporary use of your houses and territory is a mere trifle, an ornamental accessory not worth considering. And this, too, if ye preserve your freedom, ye will quickly recover. It was your fathers who first gained this empire, without any of the advantages which ye now enjoy. Ye must not disgrace yourselves by losing what they acquired. Delighting as ye all do in the honor and empire enjoyed by the city, ye must not shrink from the toils whereby alone that honor is sustained. Moreover, ye now fight not merely for freedom instead of slavery, but for empire against loss of empire, with all the perils arising out of imperial unpopularity. It is not safe for you now to abdicate, even if ye choose to do so, for ye hold your empire like a despotism, unjust perhaps in the original acquisition, but ruinous to part with when once acquired. Be not angry with me, whose advice ye followed in going to war, because the enemy have done such damage as might be expected from them. Still less on account of this unforeseen distemper, I know that this makes me an object of your special present hatred, though very unjustly, unless ye will consent to give me credit also for any unexpected good luck which may occur. Our city derives its particular glory from unshaken bearing up against misfortune. Her power, her name, her empire of Greeks over Greeks, are such as have never before been seen, and if we choose to be great, we must take the consequence of that temporary envy and hatred which is the necessary price of permanent renown. Behave ye now in a manner worthy of that glory. Display that courage which is essential to protect you against disgrace at present, as well as to guarantee your honor for the future. Send no further embassy to Sparta, and bear your misfortunes without showing symptoms of distress. The irresistible reason, as well as the proud and resolute bearing of this discourse, set forth with an eloquence which was not possible for Thucydides to reproduce, together with the age and character of Pericles, carried the assent of the assembled people, who went in the Pnyx and engaged according to the habit on public matters, would for a moment forget their private sufferings in considerations of the safety and grandeur of Athens. Possibly, indeed, those suffering, though still continuing, might become somewhat alleviated when the invaders quitted Attica, and when it was no longer indispensable for all the population to confine itself within the walls. Accordingly, the assembly resolved that no further propositions should be made for peace, and that the war should be prosecuted with vigor. But though the public resolution thus adopted shows the ancient habit of deference to the authority of Pericles, the sentiments of individuals taken separately were still those of anger against him as the author of that system which had brought them into so much distress. His political opponents, Cleon, Simus, or Lacratidas, perhaps all three in conjunction, took care to provide an opportunity for this prevalent irritation to manifest itself in act by bringing an accusation against him before the dicastery. The accusation is said to have been preferred on the ground of pecuniary malversation, 
and ended by his being sentenced to pay a considerable fine, the amount of which is differently reported, 15, 50, or 80 talents by different authors. The accusing party thus appeared to have carried their point, and to have disgraced as well as excluded from re-election the veteran statesman. The event, however, disappointed their expectations. The imposition of the fine not only satiated all the irritation of the people against him, but even occasioned a serious reaction in his favor, and brought back as strongly as ever the ancient sentiment of esteem and admiration. It was quickly found that those who had succeeded Pericles' generals neither possessed nor deserved in any equal degree the public confidence. He was accordingly soon re-elected with as much power and influence as he had ever in his life enjoyed. But that life, long, honorable, and useful, had already been prolonged considerably beyond the sixtieth year, and there were but too many circumstances, besides the recent fine, which tended to hasten as well as to embitter its close. At the very moment when Pericles was preaching to his countrymen in a tone almost reproachful, the necessity of manful and unabated devotion to the common country in the midst of private suffering, he was himself among the greatest of sufferers, and most hardly pressed to set the example of observing his own precepts. The epidemic carried off not merely his two sons, the only two legitimate, Xanthippus and Perilous, but also his sister, several other relatives, and his best and most useful political friends. Amid this train of domestic calamities, and in the funeral obsequies of so many of his dearest friends, he remained master of his grief, and maintained his habitual self-command until the last misfortune, the death of his favorite son, Perilous, which left his house without any legitimate representative to maintain the family and the hereditary sacred rights. On this final blow, though he strove to command himself as before, yet at the obsequies of the young man, when it became his duty to place a wreath on the dead body, his grief became uncontrollable, and he burst out for the first time in his life into profuse tears and sobbing. In the midst of these several personal trials, he received the intimation, through Alcibiades and some other friends, of the restored confidence of the people toward him and of his re-election to the office of Strategus. But it was not without difficulty that he was persuaded to present himself again at the public assembly and resume the direction of affairs. The regret of the people was formally expressed to him for the recent sentence. Perhaps, indeed, the fine may have been repaid to him, or some evasion of it permitted saving the forms of law, and the present temper of the city, which was further displayed toward him by the grant of a remarkable exemption from the law of his own original proposition. He had himself, some years before, been the author of that law whereby citizenship of Athens was restricted to persons born both of Athenian fathers and Athenian mothers, under which restriction several thousand persons, illegitimate on the mother's side, are said to have been deprived of the citizenship on occasion of a public distribution of corn. Invidious as it appeared to grant, to Pericles singly, an exemption from a law which had been strictly enforced against so many others, the people were now moved not less by compassion than by anxiety to redress their own previous severity. Without a legitimate heir, the house of Pericles, one branch of the great Alcimonid gens by his mother's side, would be left deserted, and the continuity of the family's sacred rights would be broken, a misfortune painfully felt by every Athenian family, as calculated to wrong all the deceased members and provoke their posthumous displeasure toward the city. Accordingly, permission was granted to Pericles to legitimize and to inscribe in his own gens and fatri his natural son by Aspasia, who bore his own name. It was thus that Pericles was reinstated in his post of strategus, as well as in his ascendancy over the public councils, seemingly about August or September B.C. 430. He lived about one year longer, and seems to have maintained his influence as long as his health permitted. Yet we hear nothing of him after this moment, and he fell a victim, not to the violent symptoms of the epidemic, but to a slow and wearing fever, which undermined his strength as well as his capacity. To a friend who came to ask after him when in this disease, Pericles replied by showing a charm or amulet which his female relations had hung about his neck, a proof how low he was reduced, and how completely he had become a passive subject in the hands of others. And according to another anecdote which we read, yet more interesting and equally illustrative of his character, it was during his last moments, when he was lying apparently unconscious and insensible, that the friends around his bed were passing in review the acts of his life, and the nine trophies which he had erected at different times for so many victories. He heard what they said, though they fancied that he was past hearing, and interrupted them by remarking, 
what you praise in my life belongs partly to good fortune, and is, at best, common to me with many other generals, but the peculiarity of which I am most proud you have not noticed. No Athenian has ever put on mourning through any action of mine. End of section four. Recording by Elsie Selwyn. Section five of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botes, June 2019. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Defeat of the Athenians at Syracuse, B.C. 413, by Sir Edward S. Creasy, Part 1. That great writer of the history of the Romans, Thomas Arnold, says of the defeat of Athenian fleet at Syracuse, The Romans knew not and could not know how deeply the greatness of their own posterity and the fate of the whole Western world were involved in the destruction of the fleet of Athens in the harbor of Syracuse. Had that great expedition proved victorious, the energies of Greece during the next eventful century would have found their field in the West no less than in the East. Greece, and not Rome, might have conquered Carthage. Greek instead of Latin might have been at this day the principal element of the language of Spain, of France, and of Italy and the laws of Athens, rather than of Rome, might be the foundation of the law of the civilized world. The foregoing, the author's own selection, really sums up all that needs be said as to the importance of the great event so finally treated by Creasy. Few cities have undergone more memorable sieges during ancient and medieval times then has the city of Syracuse, Athenian, Carthaginian, Roman, Vandal, Byzantine, Saracen, and Norman, have in turns beleaguered her walls, and the resistance which she successfully opposed to some of her early assailants was of the deepest importance, not only to the fortunes of the generations then in being, but to all the subsequent current of human events. To adopt the eloquent expressions of Arnold respecting the check which she gave to the Carthaginian arms, Syracuse was a breakwater which God's providence raised up to protect the yet immature strength of Rome. In her triumphant repulse of the great Athenian expedition against her, was of even more widespread and enduring importance. It forms a decisive epoch in the strife for a universal empire, in which all the great states of antiquity successfully engaged and failed. The present city of Syracuse is a place of little or no military strength, as the fire of artillery from the neighboring heights would almost completely command it but in ancient warfare its position and the care bestowed on its walls rendered it formidably strong against the means of offense which were employed by the besieging armies. The ancient city, in its most prosperous times, was chiefly built on the knob of land which projects into the sea on the eastern coast of Sicily, between two bays one of which to the north was called the Bay of Thapsus, while the southern one formed the great harbor of the city of Syracuse itself. A small island or peninsula, for such it soon was rendered, 
lies at the southeastern extremity of this knob of land, stretching almost entirely across the mouth of the Great Harbor and rendering it nearly landlocked. This island comprised the original settlement of the first Greek colonists from Corinth, who founded Syracuse 2,500 years ago, and the modern city has shrunk again into these primary limits. But in the 5th century before our era, the growing wealth and population of the Syracusans had led them to occupy and include within their city walls portion after portion of the mainland, lying next to the little isle, so that at the time of the Athenian expedition, the seaward part of the land between the two bays already spoken of was built over and fortified from bay to bay, and constituted the larger part of Syracuse. The landward wall, therefore, of this district of the city, traversed this knob of land, which continues to slope upward from the sea, and which, to the west of the old fortifications, that is, toward the interior of Sicily, rises rapidly for a mile or two, but diminishes in width, and finally terminates in a long narrow ridge, between which and Mount Hibla, a succession of chasms and uneven low ground extends. On each flank of this ridge, the descent is steep and precipitous. From its summits to the strips of level land that lie immediately below it, both to the southwest and northwest. The usual mode of assailing fortified towns in the time of the Peloponnesian War was to build a double wall round them sufficiently strong to check any sally of the garrison from within or any attack of a relieving force from without. The interval within the two walls of the circumvallation was roofed over and formed barracks in which the besiegers posted themselves and awaited the effects of wanton treachery among the besieged in producing a surrender. And in every Greek city of those days, as in every Italian republic of the Middle Ages, the rage of domestic sedition between aristocrats and democrats ran high. Rancorous refugees swarmed in the camp of every invading enemy, and every blockaded city was sure to contain within its walls a body of intriguing malcontents who were eager to purchase a party triumph at the expense of a national disaster. Famine and faction were the allies on whom besiegers relied. The generals of that time trusted to the operation of these sure confederates as soon as they could establish a complete blockade. They rarely ventured on the attempt to storm any fortified post, for the military engines of antiquity were feeble in breaching masonry, which the first Dionysius effected in the mechanics of destruction, and the lives of spearmen, the boldest and most high-trained would, of course, have been idly spent in charges against unshattered walls. A city built close to the sea, like Syracuse, was impregnable, save by the combined operations of a superior hostile fleet and a superior hostile army. And Syracuse, from her size, her population, and her military and naval resources, not unnaturally thought herself secure from finding in another Greek city a foe capable of sending a sufficient armament to menace her with capture and subjection. But in the spring of B.C. 414, the Athenian navy was mistress of her harbor and the adjacent seas. An Athenian army had defeated her troops and cooped them within the town. And from bay to bay, a blockading wall was being rapidly carried across the strips of level ground, and the high ridge outside the city, then termed Epipole, which, if completed, would have cut the Syracusans off from all succor 
from the interior of Sicily, and have left them at the mercy of the Athenian generals. The besiegers' work were indeed unfinished, but every day the unfortified interval in their lines grew narrower, and with it diminished all apparent hope of safety for the beleaguered town. Athens was now staking the flower of her forces and the accumulated fruits of seventy years of glory on one bold throw for the dominion of the Western world. As Napoleon, from Mont Coeur de Lyon, pointed to Saint Jean d'Acre and told his staff that the capture of that town would decide his destiny and would change the face of the world. So the Athenian officers from the heights of Epistole must have looked on Syracuse and felt that with its fall all the known powers of the earth would fall beneath them. They must have felt also that Athens, if repulsed there, must pause forever from her career of conquest and sink from an imperial republic into a ruined and subservient community. At Marathon, the first in date of the great battles of the world, we beheld Athens struggling for self-preservation against the invading armies of the East. At Syracuse, she appears as the ambitious and oppressive invader of others. In her, as in other republics of old and of modern times, the same energy that had inspired the most heroic efforts in defense of the national independence soon learned to employ itself in daring and unscrupulous schemes of self-aggrandizement at the expense of neighboring nations. In the interval between the Persian and the Peloponnesian wars, she had rapidly grown into a conquering and dominant state, the chief of a thousand tributary cities and the mistress of the largest and best manned navy that the Mediterranean had yet beheld. The occupation of her territory by Cerces and Mardonius in the Second Persian War had forced their whole population to become marines, and the glorious results of that struggle confirmed them in their zeal for their country's service at sea. The voluntary suffrage of the Greek cities of the coasts and islands of the Aegean first placed Athens at the head of the confederation, formed for the further prosecution of the war against Persia. But this titular ascendancy was soon converted by her into practical and arbitrary dominion. She protected them from piracy and the Persian power, which soon fell into decrepitude and decay. But she exacted in return implicit obedience to herself. She claimed and enforced a prerogative of taxing them at her discretion, and proudly refused to be accountable for her mode of expanding their supplies. Remonstrance against her assessments was treated as factious disloyalty, and refusal to pay was promptly punished as revolt permitting and encouraging her subject allies to furnish all their contingents in money, instead of part consisting of ships and men, the sovereign republic gained the double object of training her own citizens by a constant and well-paid service in her fleets, and of seeing her confederates lose their skill and discipline by inaction and become more and more passive and powerless under her yoke. Their towns were generally dismantled, while the imperial city herself was fortified with the greatest care and sumptuousness. The accumulated revenues from her tributaries, serving to strengthen and adorn to the utmost her havens, her docks, her arsenals, her theatres, and her shrines, and to array her in that plenitude of architectural magnificence, the ruins of which still attest 
the intellectual grandeur of the age and people which produced a Pericles to plan and a Phidias to execute. All republics that acquire supremacy over other nations rule them selfishly and oppressively. There is no exception to this in either ancient or modern times. Carthage, Rome, Venice, Genoa, Florence, Pisa, Holland, and Republican France, all tyrannized over every province and subject state where they gained authority. But none of them openly avowed their system of doing so upon principle, with a candor which the Athenian Republicans displayed when any remonstrance was made against the severe exactions which they imposed upon their vassal allies. They avowed that their empire was a tyranny, and frankly stated that they solely trusted to force and terror to uphold it. They appealed to what they called the eternal law of nature, that the weak should be coerced by the strong. Sometimes they stated, and not without some truth, that the unjust hatred of Sparta against themselves forced them to be unjust to others in self-defense. To be safe, they must be powerful, and to be powerful, they must plunder and coerce their neighbors. They never dreamed of communicating any franchise or share in office to their dependents, but jealously monopolized every post of command and all political and judicial power, exposing themselves to every risk with unflinching gallantry, embarking readily in every ambitious scheme, and never suffering difficulty or disaster to shake their tenacity of purpose in the hope of acquiring unbounded empire for their country and the means of maintaining each of the 30,000 citizens who made up the sovereign republic in exclusive devotion to military occupations and to those brilliant sciences and arts in which Athens already had reached the meridian of intellectual splendor. Her great political dramatist speaks of the Athenian Empire as comprehending a thousand states. The language of the stage must not be taken too literally, but the number of dependencies of Athens at the time when the Peloponnesian Confederacy attacked her was undoubtedly very great. With a few trifling exceptions, all the islands of the Aegean and all the Greek cities which in that age fringed the coast of Asia Minor, the Hellespont and Thrace paid tribute to Athens and implicitly obeyed her orders. The Aegean Sea was an Attic lake. Westward of Greece, her influence, though strong, was not equally predominant. She had colonies and allies among the wealthy and populous Greek settlements in Sicily and South Italy, but she had no organized system of confederates in those regions, and her galleys brought her no tribute from the western seas. The extension of her empire over Sicily was the favorite project of her ambitious orators and generals. While her great statesman Pericles lived, his commanding genius kept his countrymen under control and forbade them to risk the fortunes of Athens in distant enterprises, while they had unsubdued and powerful enemies at their own doors. He taught Athens this maxim, but he also taught her to know and to use her own strength, and when Pericles had departed, the bold spirit which he had fostered overleaped the salutary limits which he had prescribed. When her bitter enemies, the Corinthians, succeeded, B.C. 431, in inducing Sparta to attack her, and a confederacy was formed of five-sixths of the continental Greeks, all animated by anxious jealousy and bitter hatred of Athens, 
when armies far superior in numbers and equipment to those which had marched against the Persians were poured into the Athenian territory and laid it to waste to the city walls, the general opinion was that Athens would be reduced in two or three years at the furthest to submit to the requisitions of her invaders. But her strong fortifications, by which she was girt and linked to her principal haven, gave her, in those ages, almost all the advantages of an insular position. Pericles had made her trust to her empire of the seas. Every Athenian in those days was a practiced seaman, a state, indeed, whose members of an age fit for service at no time exceeded 30,000, could only have acquired such a naval dominion as Athens once held by devoting and zealously training all its sons to service in its fleets. In order to man the numerous galleys which she sent out, she necessarily employed large numbers of hired mariners and slaves at the oar. But the staple of her crews was Athenian, and all posts of command were held by native citizens. It was by reminding them of this, of their long practice in seamanship, and the certain superiority which their discipline gave them over the enemy's marine, that their great minister mainly encouraged them to resist the combined power of Lacedaemon and her allies. He taught them that Athens might thus reap the fruit of her zealous devotion to maritime affairs ever since the invasion of the Medes. She had not, indeed, perfected herself, but the reward of her superior training was the rule of the sea, a mighty dominion, for it gave her the rule of much fair land beyond its waves, safe from the idle ravages with which the Lacedaemonians might harass Attica, but never could subdue Athens. Athens accepted the war with which her enemies threatened her, rather than descend from her pride of place. And though the awful visitation of the plague came upon her and swept away more of her citizens than the Dorian spear lay low, she held her own gallantly against her enemies. If the Peloponnesian armies, in irresistible strength, wasted every spring of her cornlands, her vineyards, and her olive groves with fire and sword, she retaliated on their coasts with her fleets, which, if resisted, were only resisted to display the preeminent skill and bravery of her seamen. Some of her subject allies revolted, but the revolts were in general sternly and promptly quelled. The genius of one enemy had indeed inflicted blows on her power in Thrace, which she was unable to remedy, but he fell in battle in the tenth year of the war. And with the loss of Brasidas, the Lacedaemonians seemed to have lost all energy and judgment. Both sides, at length, grew weary of the war, and in 421 a truce for fifty years was concluded, which, though ill-kept, and though many of the confederates of Sparta refused to recognize it, and hostilities still continued in many parts of Greece, protected the Athenian territory from the ravages of enemies, and enabled Athens to accumulate large sums out of the proceeds of her annual revenues. So also, as a few years passed by, the havoc which the pestilence and the sword had made in her population was repaired, and in 415 Athens was full of bold and restless spirits, who longed for some field of distant enterprise, wherein they might signalize themselves and aggrandize the state, and who looked to the alarm of Spartan hostility as a mere old woman's tale. When Sparta had wasted their territory, she had done her worst, and the fact of its always being in her power to do so 
seemed a strong reason for seeking to increase the transmarine dominion of Athens. The West was now the quarter toward which the thoughts of every aspiring Athenian were directed. From the very beginning of the war, Athens had kept up an interest in Sicily, and her squadron had, from time to time, appeared on its coasts and taken part in the dissensions in which the Sicilian Greeks were universally engaged, one against the other. There were plausible grounds for a direct quarrel and an open attack by the Athenians upon Syracuse. With the capture of Syracuse, all Sicily, it was hoped, would be secured. Carthage and Italy were next to be attacked. With large levies of Iberian mercenaries, she then meant to overwhelm her Peloponnesian enemies. The Persian monarchy lay in hopeless imbecility, inviting Greek invasion. Nor did the known world contain the power that seemed capable of checking the growing might of Athens if Syracuse once should be hers. The national historian of Rome has left us an episode of his great work, a disquisition on the probable effects that would have followed if Alexander the Great had invaded Italy. Posterity has generally regarded that disquisition as proving Livy's patriotism more strongly than his impartiality or acuteness. Yet, right or wrong, the speculations of the Roman writer were directed to the consideration of a very remote possibility. To whatever age Alexander's life might have been prolonged, the East would have furnished full occupation for his martial ambition, as well as for those schemes of commercial grandeur and imperial amalgamation of nations, in which the truly great qualities of his mind loved to display themselves. With his death, the dismemberment of his empire among his generals was certain, even as the dismemberment of Napoleon's empire among his marshals would certainly have ensued if he had been cut off in the zenith of his power. Rome also was far weaker when the Athenians were in Sicily than she was a century afterward in Alexander's time. There can be little doubt but that Rome would have been bloated out from the independent powers of the West had she been attacked at the end of the 5th century BC by an Athenian army, largely aided by Spanish mercenaries and flushed with triumphs over Sicily and Africa instead of the collision between her and Greece having been deferred until the latter had sunk into decrepitude and the Roman Mars had grown into full vigor. The armament which the Athenians equipped against Syracuse was in every way worthy of the state which formed such projects of universal empire, and it has been truly termed the noblest that ever yet had been sent forth by a free and civilized commonwealth. The fleet consisted of 134 war galleys, with a multitude of store ships, a powerful force of the best heavy armed infantry that Athens and her allies could furnish, was sent on board it, together with a smaller number of slingers and bowmen. The quality of the forces was even more remarkable than the number. The zeal of individuals vied with that of the Republic in giving every galley the best possible crew and every troop the most perfect accoutrements. And with private as well as public wealth eagerly lavished on all that could give splendor, as well as efficiency to the expedition, the fated fleet began its voyage for the Sicilian shores in the summer of 415. 
the Syracusans themselves at the time of the Peloponnesian War were a bold and turbulent democracy, tyrannizing over the weaker Greek cities in Sicily and trying to gain in that island the same arbitrary supremacy which Athens maintained along the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. In numbers and in spirit they were fully equal to the Athenians, but far inferior to them in military and naval discipline. When the probability of an Athenian invasion was first publicly discussed at Syracuse, and efforts were made by some of the wiser citizens to improve the state of the national defenses and prepare for the impeding danger, the rumors of coming war and the proposal for preparation were received by the mass of the Syracusans with scornful incredulity. The speech of one of their popular orators is preserved to us in Thucydides. The Syracusan orator told his countrymen to dismiss with scorn the visionary terrors which a set of designing men among themselves strove to excite in order to get power and influence thrown into their own hands. He told them that Athens knew her own interest too well to think of wantonly provoking their hostility. Even if the enemies were to come, said he, so distant from their resources and opposed to such a power as ours, their destruction would be easy and inevitable. Their ships will have enough to do to get to our island at all and to carry such stores of all sorts as will be needed. They cannot, therefore, carry, besides, an army large enough to cope with such a population as ours. They will have no fortified place from which to commence their operations, but must rest them on no better base than a set of wretched tents, and such means as the necessities of the moment will allow them. But, in truth, I do not believe that they would even be able to effect a disembarkation. Let us, therefore, set at naught these reports as altogether of home manufacture, and be sure that if any enemy does come, the state will know how to defend itself in a manner worthy of national honor. Such assertions pleased the Syracusan assembly. But the invaders of Syracuse came, made good their landing in Sicily, and if they had promptly attacked the city itself, instead of wasting nearly a year in desultory operations in other parts of Sicily, the Syracusans must have paid the penalty of their self-sufficient carelessness in submission to the Athenian yoke. But of the three generals who led the Athenian expedition, two only were men of ability, and one was most weak and incompetent. Fortunately for Syracuse, Alcibiades, the most skillful of the three, was soon deposed from his command by a factious and fanatic vote of his fellow countrymen, and the other competent one, Lamachus, fell early in a skirmish, while, more fortunately still for her, the feeble and vacillating Nicias remained unrecalled and unheard. To assume the undivided leadership of the Athenian army and fleet, and to mar by alternate over-caution and over-carelessness, every chance of success which the early part of the operations offered. Still, even under him, the Athenians nearly won the town. They defeated the raw levies of the Syracusans, cooped them within the walls, and, as before mentioned, almost effected a continuous fortification from bay to bay, over Epipole, the completion of which would certainly have been followed by a capitulation. End of section 5. Recording by Mike Botez.
Section 6 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. June 2019. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Defeat of the Athenians at Syracuse, B.C. 413, by Sir Edward S. Creasy. Part 2. Alcibiades, the most complete example of genius without principle that history produces, the Bolingbroke of antiquity but with high military talents superadded to diplomatic and oratorical powers. On being summoned home from his command in Sicily to take his trial before the Athenian tribunal, had escaped to Sparta and had exerted himself there with all the selfish rancor of a renegade to renew the war with Athens and to send instant assistance to Syracuse. When we read his words in the pages of Thucydides, who was himself an exile from Athens at this period, and may probably have been at Sparta, and heard Alcibiades speak, we are at a loss whether most to admire or abhor his subtle counsels. After an artful exordium, in which he tried to disarm the suspicions which he felt must be entertained of him, and to point out to the Spartans how completely his interests and theirs were identified through hatred of the Athenian democracy, he thus proceeded. Hear me, at any rate, on the matters which require your grave attention, and which I from the personal knowledge that I have of them, can and ought to bring before you. We Athenians sailed to Sicily with the design of subduing first the Greek cities there and next those in Italy. Then we intended to make an attempt on the dominions of Carthage and on Carthage itself. If all these projects succeeded, nor did we limit ourselves to them in these quarters, we intended to increase our fleet with the inexhaustible supplies of ship timber which Italy affords, to put in requisition the whole military force of the conquered Greek states, and also to hire large armies of the barbarians, of the Iberians, and others in those regions who are allowed to make the best possible soldiers. Then, when we had done all this, we intended to assail Peloponnesus with our collected force. Our fleets would blockade you by sea and desolate your coasts. Our armies would be landed at different points and assail your cities. Some of these we expected to storm and others we meant to take by surrounding them with fortified lines. We thought that it would thus be an easier matter thoroughly to wear you down, and then we should become the masters of the whole Greek race. As for expense, we reckoned that each conquered state would give us supplies of money and provisions sufficient to pay for its own conquest and furnish the means for the conquest of its neighbors. Such are the designs of the present Athenian expedition to Sicily, and you have heard them from the lips of the man who, of all men living, is most accurately acquainted with them. The other Athenian generals who remain with the expedition will endeavor to carry out these plans. And be sure that without your speedy interference, 
they will all be accomplished. The Sicilian Greeks are deficient in military training, but still, if they could at once be brought to combine in an organized resistance to Athens, they might even now be saved. But as for the Syracusans resisting Athens by themselves, they have already, with the whole strength of their population, fought a battle and been beaten. They cannot face the Athenians at sea, and it is quite impossible for them to hold out against the force of their invaders. And if this city falls into the hands of the Athenians, all Sicily is theirs, and presently Italy also. And the danger which I warned you of from that quarter will soon fall upon yourselves. You must, therefore, in Sicily, fight for the safety of Peloponnesus. Send some galleys thither instantly. Put men on board who can work their own way over, and who, as soon as they land, can do duty as regular troops. But above all, let one of yourselves, let a man of Sparta, go over to take the chief command to bring into order and effective discipline the forces that are in Syracuse, and urge those who at present hang back to come forward and aid the Syracusans. The presence of a Spartan general at this crisis will do more to save the city than a whole army. The renegade then proceeded to urge on them the necessity of encouraging their friends in Sicily by showing that they themselves were in earnest in hostility to Athens. He exhorted them not only to march their armies into Attica again, but to take up permanent fortified position in the country, and he gave them in detail information of all that the Athenians most dreaded, and how his country might receive the most distressing and enduring injury at their hands. The Spartans resolved to act on his advice, and appointed Gylippus to the Sicilian command. Gylippus was a man who, to the national bravery and military skill, of a Spartan united political sagacity that was worthy of his great fellow countryman, Brasidas, but his merits were debased by mean and sordid vices, and his is one of the cases in which history has been austerely just, and where little or no fame has been accorded to the successful but venal soldier. But for the purpose for which he was required in Sicily, an abler man could not have been found in Lacedaemon. His country gave him neither men nor money, but she gave him her authority, and the influence of her name and of his own talents was speedily seen in the zeal with which the Corinthians and other Peloponnesian Greeks began to equip a squadron to act under him for the rescue of Sicily. As soon as four galleys were ready, he hurried over with them to the southern coast of Italy, and there, though he received such evil tidings of the state of Syracuse that he abandoned all hope of saving that city, he determined to remain on the coast and do what he could in preserving the Italian cities from the Athenians. So nearly, indeed, had Nicias completed his beleaguering lines, and so utterly desperate had the state of Syracuse seemingly become, that an assembly of the Syracusans was actually convened, and they were discussing the terms on which they should offer to capitulate, when a galley was seen dashing into the great harbor, and making her way toward the town, with all the speed which her rowers could supply. From her shunning the part of the harbor where the Athenian fleet lay, and making straight for the Syracusan side, it was clear that she was a friend. 
the enemy's cruisers, careless through confidence of success, made no attempt to cut her off. She touched the beach and a Corinthian captain, springing on shore from her, was eagerly conducted to the assembly of the Syracusan people, just in time to prevent the fatal vote being put for a surrender. Providentially for Syracuse, Gongylus, the commander of the galley, had been prevented by an Athenian squadron from following Gylippus to South Italy, and he had been obliged to push direct for Syracuse from Greece. The sight of actual succor and the promise of more revived the drooping spirits of the Syracusans. They felt that they were not left desolate to perish, and the tidings that a Spartan was coming to command them confirmed their resolution to continue their resistance. Gylippus was already near the city. He had learned at Locri that the first report which had reached him of the state of Syracuse was exaggerated, and that there was unfinished space in the besiegers' lines through which it was barely possible to introduce reinforcements into the town. Crossing the Straits of Messina, which the culpable negligence of Nicias had left unguarded, Gylippus landed on the northern coast of Sicily, and there began to collect from the Greek cities an army, of which the regular troops that he brought from Peloponnesus formed the nucleus. Such was the influence of the name of Sparta, and such were his own abilities and activity, that he succeeded in raising a force of about 2,000 fully armed infantry with a larger number of irregular troops. Nicias, as if infatuated, made no attempt to counteract his operation, nor, when Gylippus marched his little army toward Syracuse, did the Athenian commander endeavor to check him. The Syracusans marched out to meet him, and while the Athenians were solely intent on completing their fortifications on the southern side toward the harbor, Gylippus turned their position by occupying the high ground in the extreme rear of Epipole. He then marched through the unfortified interval of Nicaea's lines into the besieged town, and joining his troops with the Syracusan forces, after some engagements with varying success, gained the mastery over Nicias, drove the Athenians from Epipole, and hemmed them into a disadvantageous position in the low grounds near the great harbor. The attention of all Greece was now fixed on Syracuse, and every enemy of Athens felt the importance of the opportunity now offered of checking her ambition, and perhaps of striking a deadly blow at her power. Larger reinforcements from Corinth, Thebes, and other cities now reached the Syracusans, while the baffled and dispirited Athenian general earnestly besought his countrymen to recall him, and represented the further prosecution of the siege as hopeless. But Athens had made it a maxim never to let difficulty or disaster drive her back from any enterprise once undertaken, so long as she possessed the means of making any effort, however desperate, for its accomplishment. With indomitable pertinacity, she now decreed, instead of recalling her first armament from before Syracuse, to send out a second, though her enemies near home had now renewed open warfare against her, and by occupying a permanent fortification in her territory, had severely distressed her population, and were pressing her with almost all the hardship of an actual siege. She still was the mistress of the sea, and she sent forth another fleet of seventy galleys, and another army, which seemed to drain almost 
the last reserves of her military population, to try if Syracuse could not yet be won, and the honor of the Athenian arms be preserved from the stigma of a retreat. Here was, indeed, a spirit that might be broken, but never would bend. At the head of this second expedition, she wisely placed her best general, Demosthenes, one of the most distinguished officers that the Long Peloponnesian War had produced, and who, if he had originally held the Sicilian command, would soon have brought Syracuse to submission. The fame of Demosthenes the general has been dimmed by the superior luster of his great countryman, Demosthenes the orator. When the name Demosthenes is mentioned, it is the latter alone that is thought of. The soldier has found no biographer. Yet out of the long list of great men whom the Athenian Republic produced, there are few that deserve to stand higher than this brave, though finally unsuccessful leader of her fleets and armies in the first half of the Peloponnesian War. In his first campaign in Aetolia, he had shown some of the rashness of youth and had received a lesson of caution by which he profited throughout the rest of his career. But without losing any of his natural energy in enterprise or in execution, he had performed the distinguished service of rescuing Naupactus from a powerful hostile armament in the seventh year of the war. He had then, at the request of the Acarnanian republics, taken on himself the office of commander-in-chief of all their forces, and at their head he had gained some important advantages over the enemies of Athens in western Greece. His most celebrated exploits had been the occupation of Pylos on the Messenian coast, the successful defense of that place against the fleet and armies of Lacedaemon, and the subsequent capture of the Spartan forces on the Isle of Sphacteria, which was the severest blow dealt to Sparta throughout the war, and which had mainly caused her to humble herself to make the truce with Athens. Demosthenes was as honorably unknown in the war of party politics at Athens as he was eminent in the war against the foreign enemy. We read of no intrigues of his on either the aristocratic or democratic side. He was neither in the interest of Nicias nor of Cleon. His private character was free from any of the stains which polluted that of Alcibiades. On all these points, the silence of the comic dramatist is decisive evidence in his favor. He had also the moral courage, not always combined with physical, of seeking to do his duty to his country irrespective of any odium that he himself might incur, and unhampered by any petty jealousy of those who were associated with him in command. There are a few men named in ancient history of whom posterity would gladly know more, or whom we sympathize with more deeply in the calamities that befell them than Demosthenes, the son of Alcisthenes, who, in the spring of the year 413, left Piraeus at the head of the second Athenian expedition against Sicily. His arrival was critically timed, for Gylippus had encouraged the Syracusans to attack the Athenians under Nicias by sea, as well as by land and by one able stratagem of Ariston, one of the admirals of the Corinthian auxiliary squadron, the Syracusans and their confederates had inflicted on the fleet of Nicias the first defeat that the Athenian navy had ever sustained 
from a numerically inferior enemy. Gillipus was preparing to follow up his advantage by fresh attacks on the Athenians on both elements, when the arrival of the Mosthenes completely changed the aspect of affairs and restored the superiority to the invaders. With 73 war galleys in the highest state of efficiency and brilliantly equipped with a force of 5,000 picked men of the regular infantry of Athens and her allies and a still larger number of bowmen, javelin men and slingers on board, the Mosthenes rode round the great harbor with loud cheers and martial music as if in defiance of the Syracusans and their confederates. His arrival had indeed changed their newly born hopes into the deepest consternation. The resources of Athens seemed inexhaustible, and resistance to her hopeless. They had been told that she was reduced to the last extremities, and that her territory was occupied by an enemy, and yet here they saw her sending forth as if in prodigality of power, a second armament to make foreign conquests not inferior to that with which Nicias had first landed on the Sicilian shores. With the intuitive decision of a great commander, Demosthenes at once saw that the possession of Epipole was the key to the possession of Syracuse, and he resolved to make a prompt and vigorous attempt to recover that position while his force was unimpaired and the consternation which its arrival had produced among the besieged remained unabated. The Syracusans and their allies had run out an outwork along the Epipole from the city walls intersecting the fortified lines of circumvallation which Nicias had commenced, but from which he had been driven by Gylippus. Could Demosthenes succeed in storming this outwork and re-establishing the Athenian troops on the high ground, he might fairly hope to be able to resume the circumvallation of the city and become the conqueror of Syracuse. For, when once the besiegers' lines were completed, the number of the troops with which Gylippus had garrisoned the place would only tend to exhaust the stores of provisions and accelerate its downfall. An easily repelled attack was first made on the outwork in the daytime, probably more with a view of blinding the besieged to the nature of the operations than with any expectations of succeeding in an open assault, with every disadvantage of the ground to contend against. But when the darkness had set in, Demosthenes formed his men in columns, each soldier taking with him five days' provisions, and the engineers and workmen of the camp, following the troops with their tools and all portable implements of fortification so as at once to secure any advantage of ground that the army might gain. Thus equipped and prepared, he led his men along by the foot of the southern flank of Epipole, in a direction toward the interior of the island, till he came immediately below the narrow ridge that forms the extremity of the high ground, looking westward. He then wheeled, his vanguard to the right, send them rapidly up the paths that wind along the face of the cliff, and succeeded in completely surprising the Syracusan outposts, and in placing his troops fairly on the extreme summit of the all-important Epipole. Thence the Athenians marched eagerly down the slope toward the town, routing some Syracusan detachments that were quartered in their way, and vigorously assailing the unprotected side of the outwork. All at first favored them. The outwork was abandoned by its garrison, and the Athenian engineers 
began to dismantle it. In vain, Gylippus brought up fresh troops to check the assault. The Athenians broke and drove them back, and continued to press hotly forward, in the full confidence of victory. But amid the general consternation of the Syracusans and their confederates, one body of infantry stood firm. This was a brigade of their Boeotian allies, which was posted low down the slope of Epipole, outside the city walls. Coolly and steadily, the Boeotian infantry formed their line, and, undismayed by the current of flight around them, advanced against the advancing Athenians. This was the crisis of the battle. But the Athenian van was disorganized by its own previous successes, and, yielding to the unexpected charge thus made on it by the troops in perfect order and of the most obstinate courage, it was driven back in confusion upon the other divisions of the army that still continued to press forward. When once the tide was thus turned, the Syracusan passed rapidly from the extreme of panic to the extreme of vengeful daring, and with all their forces they now fiercely assailed the embarrassed and receding Athenians. In vain did the officers of the latter strive to reform their line. Amid the din and the shouting of the fight, and the confusion inseparable upon a night engagement, especially one where many thousand combatants were pent and whirled together in a narrow and uneven area, the necessary maneuvers were impracticable, and though many companies still fought on desperately, wherever the moonlight showed them the semblance of a foe, they fought without concert or subordination, and not infrequently, amid the deadly chaos, Athenian troops assailed each other. Keeping their ranks close, the Syracusans and their allies pressed on against the disorganized masses of the besiegers, and at length drove them with heavy slaughter over the cliffs which an hour or two before they had scaled full of hope and apparently certain of success. This defeat was decisive of the event of the siege. The Athenians afterwards struggled only to protect themselves from the vengeance which the Syracusans sought to wreak in the complete destruction of their invaders. Never, however, was vengeance more complete and terrible. A series of sea fights followed, in which the Athenian galleys were utterly destroyed or captured. The mariners and soldiers who escaped death in disastrous engagements and a vain attempt to force a retreat into the interior of the island became prisoners of war. Nicias and Demosthenes were put to death in cold blood, and their men either perished miserably in the Syracusan dungeons, or were sold into slavery to the very persons whom, in their pride of power, they had crossed the seas to enslave. All dangers from Athens to the independent nations of the West was now forever at an end. She, indeed, continued to struggle against her combined enemies and revolted allies with unparalleled gallantry, and many more years of varying warfare passed away before she surrendered to their arms. But no success in subsequent contests could ever have restored her to the preeminence in enterprise, resources, and maritime skill which she had acquired before her fatal reverses in Sicily, nor among the rival Greek republics, whom her own rashness aided to crush her, was there any capable of reorganizing her empire, or resuming her schemes of conquest. The dominion of Western Europe 
was left for Rome and Carthage to dispute two centuries later in conflicts still more terrible and with even higher displays of military daring and genius than Athens had witnessed either in her rise, her meridian, or her fall. End of section 6 Recording by Mike Botez Section 7 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rosita Johnson, and John Roth. Retreat of the 10,000 Greeks, 401-399 B.C., Xenophon. The expedition of the Greeks, generally known as the Retreat of the Ten Thousand, was conducted by Xenophon, a Greek historian, essayist, and military commander. Xenophon was a pupil of Socrates, of whom he left a famous memoir. In 401 BC, he accepted the invitation of his friend Roxenes of Boetia, a general of Greek mercenaries, to take service under Cyrus the Younger, brother of Artaxerxes Menemen, king of Persia. Cyrus had considered himself as deeply wronged by his older brother, who had thrown him into prison on the death of their father, Darius. Escaping from prison, he formed a design to wrest the throne from Artaxerxes. For this purpose, he engaged the forces of Proxenus, and to this army Xenophon attached himself. The rendezvous was Sardis, from which the army marched east under the pretext of chastising the revolting mountaineers of Sidia. Instead of attacking the Sidians, the followers of Cyrus proceeded east through Asia and Babylonia till they met the forces of Antaxerxes at Cunexa. A furious battle took place, and the rout of the king's army had begun when Cyrus, elated with a victory that seemed just within his grasp, challenged his brother to single combat. In the duel that ensued, Cyrus was slain. Roxenes had already fallen, and the virtual command of the Greek army soon devolved upon Xenophon, who thereupon began the famous retreat. A vivid account of battles and of hardships endured from the cold in the struggle through mountain snows, through almost impassable forests and across bridgeless rivers is given in Xenophon's Anabasis, the celebrated work in seven books, which forms the classical narrative of the campaign and the retreat. Soon after the death of Cyrus in September B.C. 401, the seizure and the murder of the leading Greek generals by the treacherous Persian satrap Tisophernes, placed the Greek army in great peril. Xenophon, who now took practical command, counseled and exhorted the surviving leaders, and on the next day the Greeks formed in a hollow square, the baggage in the center, and began their retreat, which led them along the Tigris to the territory of the Kardachi, Kurds, through Armenia, and across Georgia, the enemy often harassing them. At the point where the climax of the story, which is presented here, may be said to begin, the Greeks have entered Armenia, passed the sources of the Tigris, and reached the Telebas, having made a treaty with Tiribasis, governor of the province, and discovered his insincerity and that he was ready to attack them in their passage over the mountains, they resolved upon a quick resumption of their march. When in the fifth month of the retreat, the Greeks at last from the hilltop beheld the Oixine, they set up a cry, the sea, the sea, which has echoed through succeeding ages as one of the great historic jubilations of humanity. At the end of the retreat, their numbers were reduced to about 6,000, and from the starting point at Kunaxa to the middle of the southern coasts of the Black Sea, they had traveled as much as 2,000 miles. From Ephesus to Conexa and thence to the Black Sea region, they had marched in 15 months, February 401 BC to June 400, and nine months more passed before they joined the Spartan army in Asia Minor, and their task was fully accomplished. 
Their great performance is regarded as having prepared the way for Alexander's triumphant advances in the east. The young conqueror on the eve of the Battle of Isis declared that he owed inspiration to the feet of the Ten Thousand. It was thought necessary to march away as fast as possible before the enemy's force should be reassembled and get possession of the pass. Collecting their baggage at once, therefore, they set forward through a deep snow, taking with them several guides, and having the same day passed the height on which Tiribatius had intended to attack them, they encamped. Hence they proceeded three days' journey through a desert tract of country, a distance of fifteen parasangs, to the river Euphrates, and passed it without being wet higher than the middle. The sources of the river were said not to be far off. From hence they advanced three days' march through much snow and a level plain, a distance of fifteen parasangs. The third day's march was extremely troublesome, as the north wind blew full in their faces, completely parching up everything and benumbing the men. One of the ogres, in consequence, advised that they should sacrifice to the wind, and a sacrifice was accordingly offered when the vehemence of the wind appeared to everyone manifestly to abate. The depth of the snow was a fathom, so that many of the baggage cattle and the slaves perished with about thirty of the soldiers. They continued to burn fires through the whole night, for there was plenty of wood at the place of encampment. But those who came up late could get no wood. Those, therefore, who had arrived before and had kindled fires would not admit the late comers to the fire unless they gave them a share of the corn or other provisions that they had brought. Thus they shared with each other what they respectively had. In the places where the fires were made, as the snow melted, there were formed large pits that reached down to the ground, and here there was accordingly opportunity to measure the depth of the snow. From hence they marched through the snow the whole of the following day, and many of the men contracted the bulimia. Xenophon, who commanded in the rear, finding in his way such of the men as had fallen down with it, knew not what disease it was. But as one of these acquainted with it told him that they were evidently affected with bulimia, and that they would get up if they had something to eat, he went round among the baggage, and wherever he saw anything eatable he gave it out, and sent such as were able to run to distribute it among those diseased, who as soon as they had eaten, rose up and continued their march. As they proceeded, Chrysophis came, just as it grew dark, to a village, and found at a spring in front of the rampart some women and girls belonging to the place fetching water. The women asked them who they were, and the interpreter answered in the Persian language that they were people going from the king to the satrap. They replied that he was not there, but about a parasang off. However, as it was late, they went with the water carriers within the rampart to the headman of the village, and here Chrysophis, and as many of the troops as could come up encamped, but of the rest such as were unable to get to the end of the journey, spent the night on the way without food or fire, and some of the soldiers lost their lives on that occasion. Some of the enemy, too, who had collected themselves into a body, pursued our rear, and seized any of the baggage cattle that were unable to proceed, fighting with one another for the possession of them. Such of the soldiers also, as had lost their sight from the effect of the snow, or had their toes modified by the cold, were left behind. It was found to be a relief to the eyes against the snow if the soldiers kept something black before them on the march, and to the feet if they kept constantly in motion, and allowed themselves no rest, and if they took off their shoes in the night, but as to such as slept with their shoes on, the straps worked into their feet, and the soles were frozen about them, for when their old shoes had failed them, Shoes of raw hides had been made by the men themselves from the newly skinned oxen. 
from such unavoidable sufferings some of the soldiers were left behind who seeing a piece of ground of a black appearance from the snow having disappeared there conjectured that it must have melted and it had in fact melted in a spot from the effect of the fountain which was sending up vapor in a wooded hollow close at hand turning aside thither they sat down and refused to proceed farther xenophon who was with the rear guard as soon as he heard this tried to prevail on them by every art and means not to be left behind telling them at the same time that the enemy were collected and pursuing them in great numbers at last he grew angry and they told him to kill them as they were quite unable to go forward he then thought it the best course to strike a terror if possible into the enemy that were behind lest they should fall upon the exhausted soldiers it was now dark and the enemy were advancing with a great noise quarreling about the booty that they had taken when such of the rear guard as were not disabled started up and rushed toward them while the tired men shouting as loud as they could clashed their spears against their shield the enemy struck with alarm threw themselves among the snow into the hollow and no one of them afterward made himself heard from any quarter xenophon and those with him telling the sick men that the party should come to their relief next day proceeded on their march but before they had gone from astadia they found other soldiers resting by the way in the snow and covered up with it no guard being stationed over them they roused them up but they said that the head of the army was not moving forward xenophon going past them and sending on some of the ablest of the peltasts ordered them to ascertain what it was that hindered their progress they brought word that the whole army was in that manner taking rest xenophon and his men therefore stationing such a guard as they could took up their quarters there without fire or supper when it was near day he sent the youngest of his men to the sick telling them to rouse them and oblige them to proceed at this juncture Christopher sent some of his people from the village to see how the rear were faring the young men were rejoiced to see them and gave them the sick to conduct to the camp while they themselves went forward and before they had gone twenty stadia found themselves at the village in which Christopher was quartered when they came together it was thought safe enough to lodge the troops up and down in the village Christophus accordingly remained where he was, and the other officers, appropriating by lots the several villages that they had in sight, went to their respective quarters with their men. Here Polycrates, an Athenian captain, requested leave of absence, and taking with him the most active of his men, and hastening to the village to which Xenophon had been allotted, surprised all the villagers and their headmen in their houses together with seventeen cults that were bred as a tribute for the king and the headman's daughter who had been but nine days married her husband was gone out to hunt hares and was not found in any of the villages their houses were underground the entrance like a mouth of a well but spacious below there were passages dug into them for the cattle but the people descended by ladders in the houses were goats, sheep, cows, and fowls with their young. All the cattle were kept on fodder within the walls. There were also wheat, barley, leguminous, vegetables, and barley wine in large bowels. The grains of barley floated in it even with the brim of the vessels, and reeds also lay in it, some large and some smaller without joints and these when any one was thirsty he was to take in his mouth and suck the liquor was very strong unless one mixed water with it and a very pleasant drink to those accustomed to it xenophon made the chief man of his village sup with him and told him to be of good courage assuring him that he should not be deprived of his children and that they would not go away without filling his house with provisions in return for what they took if he would but prove himself the author of some service to the army till they should reach another tribe this he promised and to show his goodwill pointed out where some wine was buried this night therefore the soldiers rested in their several quarters in the midst of great abundance setting a guard over the chief and keeping his children at the same time under their eye 
The following day, Xenophon took the headman and went with him to Chrysippus, and wherever he passed by a village, he turned aside to visit those who were quartered in it, and found them in all parts feasting and enjoying themselves, nor would they anywhere let them go till they had set refreshment before them. And they placed everywhere upon the same table lamb, kid, pork, veal, and fowl, with plenty of bread, both of wheat and barley. Whenever any person, to pay a compliment, wished to drink to another, he took him to the large bowl where he had to stoop down and drink, sucking like an ox. The chief they allowed to take whatever he pleased, but he accepted nothing from them. Where he found any of his relatives, however, he took them with him. When they came to Chrysippus, they found his men also feasting in their quarters, crowned with wreaths made of hay, and Armenian boys in their barbarian dress waiting upon them, to whom they made signs what they were to do as if they had been deaf and dumb. When Chrysippus and Xenophon had saluted one another, they both asked the chief man, through the interpreter who spoke the Persian language, what country it was. He replied that it was Armenia. They then asked him for whom the horses were bred, and he said that they were a tribute for the king, and added that the neighboring country was that of Calabes, and told them in what direction the road lay. Xenophon then went away, conducting the chief back to his family, giving him the horse that he had taken, which was rather old, to fatten and offer in sacrifice, for he had heard that it had been consecrated to the sun, being afraid indeed that it might die, as it had been injured by the journey. He then took some of the young horses, and gave one of them to each of the other generals and captains. The horses in this country were smaller than those of Persia, but far more spirited. The chief instructed the man to tie little bags round the feet of the horses and other cattle when they drove them through the snow, for without such bags they sunk up to their bellies. When the eighth day was come, Xenophon committed the guy to Chrysippus. He left the chief all the members of his family except his son, a youth just coming to mature age. Him he gave in charge to Epistenes of Amphipolis, in order that if the father should conduct them properly, he might return home with him. At the same time they carried to his house as many provisions as they could, and then broke up their camp and resumed their march. The chief conducted them through the snow, walking at liberty. When he came to the end of the third day's march, Christophus was angry at him for not guiding them to some villages. He said that there was none in the part of the country. Christophus then struck him but did not confine him, and in consequence he ran off in the night, leaving his son behind him. This affair, the ill-treatment and neglect of the guide, was the only cause of dissension between Christophus and Xenophon during the march. Epistenes conceived an affection for the youth, and taking him home found him extremely attached to him. After this occurrence, they proceeded seven days' journey, five parasangs each day, till they came to the river Phasis, the breadth of which is a plethrum. Hence they advanced two days' journey, ten parasangs, when on the pass that led over the mountains into the plain, the Chalabis, Tauki, and Phesians were drawn up to oppose their progress. Christophus, seeing these enemies in possession of the height, came to a halt at the distance of about thirty stadia, that he might not approach them while leading the army in a column. He accordingly ordered the other officers to bring up their companies, that the whole force might be formed in line. End of section 7 Section 8 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rosita Johnson, and John Rod. When the rear guide was come up, 
he called together the generals and captains and spoke to them as follows the enemy as you see is in possession of the pass over the mountains and it is proper for us to consider how we may encounter them to the best advantage it is my opinion therefore that we should direct the troops to get their dinner and that we ourselves should hold the council in the meantime whether it is advisable to cross the mountain today or tomorrow it seems best to me exclaimed cleaner to march at once as soon as we have dined and resumed our arms against the enemy for if we waste the present day in inaction the enemy who are now looking down upon us will grow bolder and it is likely that as their confidence is increased others will join them in greater numbers after him xenophon said i am of opinion that if it be necessary to fight we ought to make our arrangements so as to fight with the greatest advantage but that if we propose to pass the mountains as easily as possible we ought to consider how we may incur the fewest wounds and lose the fewest men the range of fields as far as we see extends more than sixty stadia in length but the people nowhere seem to be watching us except along the line of road and it is therefore better i think to endeavor to try to seize unobserved some parts of the unguarded range and to get possession of it if we can beforehand than to attack a strong post and men prepared to resist us for it is far less difficult to march up a steep ascent without fighting then a longer level road with enemies on each side and in the night if men are not obliged to fight they can see better what is before them than by day if engaged with enemies while a rough road is easier to defeat to those who are marching without molestation than a smooth one to those who are pelted on the head with missiles nor do i think it at all impracticable for us to steal away for ourselves as we can march by night so as not to be seen and can keep at such a distance from the enemy as to allow no possibility of being heard we seem likely too in my opinion if we make a pretended attack on this point to find the rest of the range still escorted for the enemy will so much the more probably stay where they are but why should i speak doubtfully about stealing for i hear that you lacedaemonians o Christophus, such of you at least as are of the better class practice stealing from your boyhood and it is not a disgrace but an honor to steal whatever the law does not forbid while in order that you may steal with the utmost dexterity and strive to escape discovery it is appointed by law that if you are caught stealing you are scourged it is now high time for you therefore to give proof of your education and to take care that we may not receive many stripes but i hear that you athenians also rejoined chrysippus are very clever at stealing the public money though great danger threatens him that steals it and that your best men steal it most if indeed your best men are thought worthy to be your magistrates so that it is time for you likewise to give proof of your education i am then ready exclaimed xenophon to march with the rear guard as soon as we have supped to take possession of the hills i have guides too for our light armed men captured some of the marauders following us by lying in ambush and from them i learned that the mountains are not impassable but are grazed over by goats and oxen so that if we once gain possession of any part of the range there will be tracks also for our baggage cattle i expect also that the enemy will no longer keep their ground when they see us upon a level with them on the heights for they will not now come down to be upon a level with us christophus then said but why should you go and leave the charge of the rear rather send others unless some volunteers present themselves upon this aristonemis of methadria came forward with his heavy armed men and aristias of chios and nicomachus of oetia with their light arms and they made an arrangement that as soon as they should reach the top they should light a number of fires having settled these points they went to dinner and after dinner chrysippus led forward the whole army ten stadia towards the enemy that he might appear to be fully resolved to march against them on that quarter when they had taken their supper and night came on 
Those appointed for the service went forward and got possession of the hills. The other troops rested where they were. The enemy, when they saw the heights occupied, kept watching burns and number of fires all night. As soon as it was day, Christophus, after having offered sacrifice, marched forward along the road, while those who had gained the height advanced by the ridge. Most of the enemy, meanwhile, stayed at the pass, but a part went to meet the troops coming along the heights. But before the main bodies came together, those on the ridge closed with one another, and the Greeks had the advantage, and put the enemy to flight. At the same time, the Grecian Peltus ran up from the plain to attack the enemy, drawn up to receive them, and Christophus followed at a quick pace with the heavy armed men. The enemy at the pass, however, when they saw those above defeated, took to flight. Not many of them were killed, but a great number of shields were taken, which the Greeks, by hacking them with their swords, rendered useless. As soon as they had gained the ascent, and had sacrificed and erected a trophy, they went down into the plain before them, and arrived at a number of villages stored with the bundles of excellent provisions. From hence they marched five days' journey, thirty parasangs, to the country of the Toki, where provisions began to fail them, for the Toki inhabited the strong fastnesses, in which they had laid up all their supplies. Having at length, however, arrived at one place, which had no city or houses attached to it, but in which men and women and a great number of cattle were assembled, Christophus, as soon as he came before it, made it the object of an attack. And when the first division that assailed it began to be tired, another succeeded, and then another, for it was not possible for them to surround it in a body, as there was a river about it. When Xenophon came up with his rear guard poultists and heavy armed men, Christophus exclaimed, You come seasonably, for we must take this place, as there are no provisions for the army unless we take it. They then deliberated together, and Xenophon asking what hindered them from taking the place, Christophus replied, The only approach to it is the one which you see, but when any of our men attempt to pass along it, the enemy roll down stones over yonder impending rock, and whoever is struck is treated as you behold, and he pointed at the same moment to some of the men who had had their legs and ribs broken. But if they expand all their stones, rejoined Xenophon, is there anything else to prevent us from advancing? For we see in front of us only a few men, and but two or three of them armed. The space, too, through which we have to pass under exposure to the stones is, as you see, only about a hundred and fifty feet in length, and of this about a hundred feet is covered with large pine trees in groups against which, if the men place themselves, what would they suffer either from the flying stones or the rolling ones? The remaining part of the space is not above fifty feet over which, when the stones cease, we must pass at a running pace. But, said Christophus, the instant we offer to go to the part covered with trees, the stones fly in great numbers. That, cried Xenophon, would be the very thing we want, for thus they will exhaust their stones the sooner. Let us then advance, if we can, to the point whence we shall have but a short way to run, and from which we may, if we please, easily retreat. Christophus and Xenophon, with Callimachus of Parhesia, one of the captains who had that day the lead of all the other captains of the rear guard, then went forward, all the rest of the captains remaining out of danger. Next, about seventy of the men advanced under the trees, not in a body, but one by one, each sheltering himself as he could. Agagius of Stymphalus and Aristonymus of Methydria, who were also captains of the rear guard, which some others were at the same time standing behind, without the trees, for it was not safe for more than one company to stand under them. Callimachus then adopted the following stratagem. He ran forward two or three paces from the tree under which he was sheltered, and when the stones began to be hurled, hastily drew back, and at each of his sallies, more than ten cartloads of stones were spent. 
Agassius, observing what Callimachus was doing, and that the eyes of the whole army were upon him, and fearing that he himself might not be the first to enter the place, began to advance alone, neither calling to Aristonomus, who was next him, nor to Aurelicus of Lugia, both of whom were his intimate friends, nor to any other person, and passed by all the rest. Callimachus, seeing him rushing by, caught hold of the rim of his shield, and at that moment Aristonomus of Methydria ran past them both, and after him Eurylochus of Lucia. For all these sought distinction for valor, and were rivals to one another. And thus, in mutual emulation, they got possession of the place, for when they had once rushed in, not a stone was hurled from above. But a dreadful spectacle was then to be seen, for the women flinging their children over the precipices threw themselves after them, and the men followed their example. Aeneas of Stymphalus, a captain seeing one of them who had on a rich garment running to throw himself over, caught hold of it with intent to stop him. But the man dragged him forward, and they both went rolling down the rocks together and were killed. Thus very few prisoners were taken, but a great number of oxen, asses, and sheep. Hence they advanced seven days' journey, a distance of fifty parasangs, through the country of the Calabes. These were the most warlike people of all that they passed through, and came to close combat with them. They had linen cuirasses, reaching down to the groin, and instead of a skirt, thick cords twisted. They had also greaves and helmets, and at their girdles a short falchion, as large as a Spartan crooked dagger, with which they cut the throats of all whom they could master, and then cutting off their heads, carried them away with them. They sang and danced when the enemy were likely to see them. They carried also a spear of about fifteen cubits in length. Having one spike, they stayed in their villages till the Greeks had passed by, when they pursued and perpetually harassed them. They had their dwellings in strong places in which they had also laid up their provisions, so that the Greeks could get nothing from that country, but lived upon the cattle which they had taken from the Taoki. The Greeks next arrived at the river Harpasus, the breadth of which was four plethra. Hence they proceeded through the territory of the Scythini, four days journey making twenty parasangs over a level tract until they came to some villages in which they halted three days and collected provisions. From this place they advanced four days journey, twenty parasangs, to a large, rich and populous city called Gymnias, from which the governor of the country sent the Greeks a guide to conduct them through a region at war with his own people. The guide, when he came, said that he would take them in five days to a place whence they should see the sea. If not, he would consent to be put to death. When, as he proceeded, he entered the country of their enemy, he exhorted them to burn and lay west the land, whence it was evident that he had come for this very purpose, and not from any good will to the Greeks. On the fifth day they came to the mountain and the name of it was Tachys. When the men who were in the front had mounted the height, and looked down upon the sea, a great shout proceeded from them, and Xenophon and the rear guard, on hearing it, thought that some new enemies were assailing the front, for in the rear, two, the people from the country that they had burnt, were following them, and the rear guard, by placing an ambuscade, had killed some, and taken other prisoners, and had captured about twenty shields made of raw ox hides, with the hair on. But the noise still increased, and drew nearer, and as those who came up from time to time kept running at full speed to join those who were continually shouting, the cries becoming louder as the men became more numerous, it appeared to Xenophon that it must be something of very great moment. Mounting his horse, therefore, and taking with him Lysias and the cavalry, he hastened forward to give aid. When presently they heard the soldiers shouting, The sea, the sea, and cheering on one another, they then all began to run. The rear guard as well as the rest, and the baggage cattle and horses were put to their speed, and when they had all arrived at the top, the men embraced one another and their generals and captains with tears in their eyes. 
Suddenly, whoever it was that suggested it, the soldiers brought a stone and raised a large mound on which they laid a number of raw oxides, staves, and shields taken from the enemy. The shields the guide himself hacked in pieces and exhorted the rest to do the same. Soon after, the Greeks sent away the guide, giving him presents from the common stock, a horse, a silver cup, a Persian robe, and ten, and ten darics. But he showed most desire for the rings on their fingers and obtained many of them from the soldiers. Having then pointed out to them a village where they might take up their quarters and the road by which they were to proceed to the Macrons, when the evening came on the departed, pursuing his way during the night. Hence the Greeks advanced three days' journey, a distance of ten parasangs, through the country of the Macrons. On the first day, they came to a river which divides the territories of the Macronis from those of the Sithini. On their right, they had an eminence extremely difficult of access, and on their left, another river into which the boundary river which they had to cross empties itself. This stream was thicker. This stream was thickly edged with trees, not indeed large, but growing closely together. These the Greeks, as soon as they came to the spot, cut down, being in haste to get out of the country as soon as possible. The Macronis, however, equipped with wicker shields and spears and hair tunics, were drawn up on the opposite side of the crossing place. They were animating one another and throwing stones into the river. They did not hit our men or cause them any inconvenience. At this juncture, one of the Peltas came up to Xenophon, saying that he had been a slave of Athens, and adding that he knew the language of these men. I think indeed, said he, that this is my country, and if there is nothing to prevent, I should wish to speak to the people. There is nothing to prevent, replied Xenophon, so speak to them, and first to certain what people they are. When he asked them, they said that they were the Macronese. Inquire them, said Xenophon, why they are drawn up to oppose us and wish to be our enemies. They replied, because you come against our country. The generals then told him to acquaint them that we were not come with any wish to do them injury, but that we were returning to Greece after having been engaged in war with the king, and that we were desirous to reach the sea. They asked if the Greeks would give pledges to this effect and the Greeks replied that they were willing both to give and receive them. The Macronis accordingly presented the Greeks with a barbarian lance, and the Greeks gave them a Grecian one, for they said that such were their usual pledges. Both parties called the gods to witness. After these mutual assurances, the Macronis immediately assisted them in cutting away the trees and made a passage for them as if to bring them over. Mingling freely among the Greeks, they also gave such facilities as they could for buying provisions and conducted them through their country for three days until they brought them to the confines of the Colchians. Here was a range of hills, high but accessible, and upon them the Colchians were drawn up in array. The Greeks at first drew up against them in a line, with the intention of marching up the hill in this disposition, but afterward the generals thought proper to assemble and deliberate how they might engage with the best effect. Xenophon then said it appeared to him that they ought to relinquish the arrangement in line and to dispose the troops in column. For a line pursued he will be broken at once, as we shall find the hills in some parts impassable though in others easy of access, and this disruption will immediately produce despondency in the man, when after being ranged in a regular line, they find it dispersed. Again, if we advance drawn up very many deep, the enemy will stretch beyond us on both sides, and will employ the parts that outreach us in any way they may think proper. And if we advance only a few deep, it would not be at all surprising if our line be broken through by showers of missiles and men falling upon us in large bodies. If this happen in any part, it will be ill for the whole extent of the line. I think then that having formed our companies in columns, we should keep them so far apart from each other, as that the last companies on each side may be beyond the enemy's wings. Thus our extreme companies will both outflank the line of the enemy, and as we march in five, 
The bravest of our men will close with the enemy first, and wherever the ascent is easiest, there each division will direct its course, nor will it be easy for the enemy to penetrate into the intervening spaces when there are companies on each side, nor will it be easy to break through a column as it advances. While if any one of the companies be hard-pressed, the neighboring one will support it, and if but one of the companies can be can by any path attain the summit, the enemy will no longer stand their ground. This plan was approved, and they threw the companies into columns. Xenophon, riding along from the right wing to the left, said, Soldiers, the enemy whom you see before you is now the only obstacle to hinder us from being where we have long been eager to be. These, if we can, we must eat up alive. When the men were all in their places and they had formed the companies into columns, there were about 80 companies of heavy armed men, and each company consisted of about 80 men. The peltasts and archers they divided into three bodies, each about 600 men, one of which they placed beyond the left wing, another beyond the right, and the third in the center. The generals then desired the soldiers to make their vows to the gods, and having made them and sung the paean, they moved forward. Christophus and Xenophon and the Peltasts that they had with them, who were beyond the enemy's flanks, pushed on, and the enemy, observing their motions and hurrying forward to receive them, was drawn off, some to the right and others to the left, and left a great void in the center of the line, when the Peltasts in the Arcadian division, whom Oschenes the Acarnanian commanded, seeing the Colchian separate ran forward in all haste, thinking that they were taking to flight. And these were the first that reached the summit. The Arcadian heavy-armed troop, of which Clerner, the Archimenean, was captain, followed them. But the enemy, when once the Greeks began to run, no longer stood its ground, but went off in flight, some one way and some another. Having passed the summit, the Greeks encamped in a number of villages, containing abundance of provisions. As to other things here, there was nothing at which they were, they were surprised. But the number of beehives was extraordinary, and, and all the soldiers that ate of the combs lost their senses, vomited, and were affected with purging. And not any of them was able to stand upright, such as had eaten a little were like men greatly intoxicated, and such as had eaten much were like madmen, and some like persons at the point of death. They lay upon the ground in consequence in great numbers as if there had been a defeat, and there was general dejection. The next day no one of them was found dead, and they recovered their senses about the same hour that they had lost them on the preceding day. And on the third and fourth days, they got up as if after having taken physic. From hence they proceeded two days' march, seven parasangs, and arrived at Terapizond, a Greek city of large population, on the Oxine Sea, a colony of Sinope, but lying in the territory of the Colchians. Here they stayed about thirty days, encamping in the villages of the Colchians, Whence they made excursions and plundered the country of Colchis. The people of Terapizond provided a market for the Greeks in the camp and entertained them in the city and made them presents of oxen, barley meal, and wine. They negotiated with them also on behalf of the neighboring Colchians, those especially who dwelt in the plain, and from them too were brought presents of oxen. Soon after, they prepared to perform the sacrifice which they had vowed. Oxen enough had been brought them to offer to Jupiter the Preserver and to Hercules for their safe conduct, and whatever they had vowed to the other gods, they also celebrated gymnastic games upon the hill where they were encamped, and chose Dracontius, a Spartan who had become an exile from his country when quite a boy, for having involuntarily killed a child by striking him with a dagger, to prepare the course and preside the contests. When the sacrifice was ended, they gave the hides to Dracontius, and desired him to conduct them to the place where he had made the course. Dracontius, pointing to the place where they were standing, said, this hill is an excellent place for running, in whatever direction the man may wish. 
But how will they be able, said they, to wrestle on ground so rough and bushy? He that falls, said he, will suffer the more. Boys, most of them from among the prisoners, contented in the short course, and in the long course above sixty cretins ran, while others were mashed in wrestling, boxing, and to pancratium. It was a fine sight for many entered the lists, and as their friends were spectators, there was great emulation. Horses also ran, and they had to gallop down the steep and turning round in the sea, to come up against the altar. In the descent many rolled down, but in the ascent against exceedingly steep ground, the horses could scarcely get up at a walking pace. There was consequently great shouting and laughter and cheering from the people. End of section 8 Section 9 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. The Condemnation and Death of Socrates. B.C. 399, by Plato, Part 1. The death of Socrates was brought about under the restored democracy by three of his enemies, Lycon, Meletus, and Anitus, the last a man of high rank and reputation in the state. Socrates was accused by them of despising the ancient gods of the state, introducing new divinities and corrupting the youth of Athens. He was charged with having taught his followers, young men of the first Athenian families, to despise the established government, to be turbulent and seditious, and his accusers pointed to Alcibiades and Critias, notorious for their lawlessness, as examples of the fruits of his teaching. It is quite certain that Socrates disliked the Athenian government and considered democracy as tyrannical as despotism. But there was no law at Athens by which he could be put to death for his words and actions, and the vague charge could never have been made unless the whole trial of the philosopher had been a party movement headed by men like Lycon and Anitus, whose support of the unjust measure made the condemnation of Socrates a foregone conclusion. Xenophon, the pupil and admirer of the philosopher, expresses in his memorabilia of Socrates his surprise that the Athenians should have condemned to death a man of such exalted character and transparent innocence. But the influence of the teacher with his pupils, most of them sons of the wealthiest citizens, might well have been dreaded by those in office and engaged in the conduct of public business. By them, the common politicians of the day, Socrates, with his keen and witty criticism of political corruption and demagogism, must have been considered a formidable adversary. Accordingly, by the decision of the Athenian court, the philosopher was sentenced to death by drinking a cup of hemlock. Although it was usual for criminals to be executed the day following their condemnation, he enjoyed a respite of thirty days, during which time his friends had access to his prison cell. It was the time when the ceremonial galley was crowned and sent on her pilgrimage to the Holy Isle of Delos, and no criminal could be executed until her return. Socrates exhibited heroic constancy and cheerfulness during this interval, and repudiated the offers of his friends to aid in his escape, though they had chartered the ship to carry him to Thessaly. 
With calm composure, he reasoned on the immortality of the soul, and cheered his visitors with words of hope. The literary portraits of Socrates, furnished by himself, and the writings of Plato, are among the most precious monuments of antiquity, and the life and death of such a man form a memorable era in the moral and intellectual history of mankind. Plato, in his Phaedo, or The Immortality of the Soul, gives the following dialogue between Echecrates and Phaedo. Two friends and disciples of the late philosopher, evidently with no other purpose in view, then to lend to the account of the great teacher's last hours, and the last words his followers were to hear from his lips, the additional force and dramatic value of a personal narrative in the mouth of a loving pupil and an actual eyewitness of his death. Echecrates Were you personally present, Phaedo, with Socrates on that day when he drank the poison in prison, or did you hear an account of it from someone else? Phaedo I was there myself, Echecrates. Echecrates, what then did he say before his death, and how did he die? For I should be glad to hear, for scarcely any citizen of Phlius ever visits Athens now, nor has any stranger for a long time come from thence, who was able to give us a clear account of the particulars, except that he died from drinking poison, but he was unable to tell us anything more. Phaedo And did you not hear about the trial, how it went off? Echecrates Yes, someone told me this, and I wondered that it took place so long ago, he appears to have died long afterward. What was the reason of this, Phaedo? Phaedo. An accidental circumstance happened in his favor, Echecrates. For the poop of the ship, which the Athenians sent to Delos, chanced to be crowned on the day before the trial. Echecrates. But what is this ship? Phaedo. It is the ship, as the Athenians say, in which Theseus formerly conveyed the fourteen boys and girls to Crete, and saved both them and himself. They, therefore, made a vow to Apollo on that occasion, as it is said, that if they were saved, they would every year dispatch a solemn embassy to Delos, which from that time to the present they send yearly to the god. When they begin the preparations for this solemn embassy, they have a law that the city shall be purified during this period, and that no public executions shall take place until the ship has reached Delos and returned to Athens. And this occasionally takes a long time, when the winds happen to impede their passage. The commencement of the embassy is when the priest of Apollo has crowned the poop of the ship. And this was done, as I said, on the day before the trial. On this account, Socrates had a long interval in prison between the trial and his death. Echecrates And what, Phaedo, were the circumstances of his death, what was said and done, and who of his friends were with him? Or would not the magistrates allow them to be present? But did he die destitute of friends? Phaedo, by no means, but some, indeed several, were present. Echecrates, take the trouble, then, to relate to me all the particulars, as clearly as you can, unless you have any pressing business. Phaedo, I am at leisure and will endeavor to give you a full account, for to call Socrates to mind, whether speaking myself or listening to someone else, is always most delightful to me. Echecrates And indeed, Phaedo, you have others to listen to you, 
who are of the same mind. However, endeavor to relate everything as accurately as you can. Phaedo I was indeed wonderfully affected by being present, for I was not impressed with a feeling of pity, like one present at the death of a friend. For the man appeared to me to be happy, Echecrates, both from his manner and discourse, so fearlessly and nobly did he meet his death, so much so that it occurred to me that in going to Hades he was not going without a divine destiny, but that when he arrived there he would be happy, if anyone ever was. For this reason I was entirely uninfluenced by any feeling of pity, as would seem likely to be the case with one present on so mournful an occasion. Nor was I affected by pleasure from being engaged in philosophical discussions, as was our custom, for our conversation was of that kind. But an altogether unaccountable feeling possessed me, a kind of unusual mixture compounded of pleasure and pain together, when I considered that he was immediately about to die. And all of us who were present were affected in much the same manner, at one time laughing, at another weeping, one of us especially, Apollodorus, for you know the man and his manner. Echecrates, how should I not? Phaedo, he then was entirely overcome by these emotions, and I too was troubled, as well as the others. Echecrates, but who were present, Phaedo? Phaedo, of his fellow countrymen, this Apollodorus was present, and Critobulus and his father Crito. Moreover, Hermogenes, Epigenes, Eschines, and Antisthenes, Ctesippus the Pianian, Menexenus, and some other of his countrymen were also there. Plato, I think, was sick. Echecrates, were any strangers present? Phaedo, yes, Simias the Theban, Sebes, and Phedondes and from Megara, Euclides, and Terpsion. Echecrates, but what, were not Aristippus and Cleombrotus present? Phaedo, no, for they were said to be at Aegina. Echecrates, was anyone else there? Phaedo, I think that these were nearly all who were present. Echecrates, well now, what do you say was the subject of conversation? Phaedo, I will endeavor to relate the whole to you from the beginning. On the preceding days, I and the others were constantly in the habit of visiting Socrates, meeting early in the morning at the courthouse where the trial took place, for it was near the prison. Here, then, we waited every day till the prison was opened conversing with each other, for it was not opened very early. But as soon as it was opened, we went in to Socrates, and usually spent a day with him. On that occasion, however, we met earlier than usual, for on the preceding day, when we left the prison in the evening, we heard that the ship had arrived from Delos. We therefore urged each other to come as early as possible to the accustomed place. Accordingly we came, and the porter, who used to admit us coming out, told us to wait, and not to enter until he called us. For he said, The eleven are now freeing Socrates from his bonds, and announcing to him that he must die today. But in no long time he returned and bade us enter, when we entered, we found Socrates just freed from his bonds, and Santipe, you know her, holding his little boy and sitting by him. As soon as Santipe saw us, 
She wept aloud and said such things as women usually do on such occasions, as, Socrates, your friends will now converse with you for the last time, and you with them. But Socrates, looking toward Crito, said, Crito, let someone take her home. Upon which some of Crito's attendants led her away, wailing and beating herself. But Socrates, sitting up in bed, drew up his leg and rubbed it with his hand, and as he rubbed it said, What an unaccountable thing, my friends, that seems to be which men call pleasure, and how wonderfully is it related toward that which appears to be its contrary, pain, in that they will not both be present to a man at the same time. Yet, if any one pursues and attains the one, he is almost always compelled to receive the other, as if they were both united together from one head. And it seems to me, he said, that if Aesop had observed this, he would have made a fable from it, how the deity, wishing to reconcile these warring principles, when he could not do so, united their heads together, and from hence whomsoever the one visits, the other attends immediately after, as appears to be the case with me, since I suffered pain in my leg before from the chain, but now pleasure seems to have succeeded. Hereupon Sebes, interrupting him, said, By Jupiter, Socrates, you have done well in reminding me. With respect to the poems which you made, by putting into meter those fables of Aesop and the hymn to Apollo, several other persons asked me, and especially Avenus recently, with what design you made them after you came here, whereas before you had never made any. If, therefore, you care at all that I should be able to answer Avenus when he asks me again, for I am sure he will do so, Tell me what I must say to him. Tell him the truth then, Sebes, he replied, that I did not make them from a wish to compete with him or his poems, for I knew that this would be no easy matter, but that I might discover the meaning of certain dreams and discharge my conscience. If this should happen to be the music which they have often ordered me to apply myself to, for they were to the following purport. Often in my past life the same dream visited me, appearing at different times in different forms, yet always saying the same thing. Socrates, it said, apply yourself to and practice music. And I formerly supposed that it exhorted and encouraged me to continue the pursuit I was engaged in, as those who cheer on racers, so that the dream encouraged me to continue the pursuit I was engaged in, namely to apply myself to music, since philosophy is the highest music, and I was devoted to it. But now, since my trial took place, and the festival of God retarded my death, it appeared to me that, if by any chance the dream so frequently enjoined me to apply myself to popular music, I ought not to disobey it, but do so, for that it would be safer for me not to depart hence before I had discharged my conscience by making some poems in obedience to the dream. Thus, then I first of all composed a hymn, to the god whose festival was present, and after the god, considering that a poet, if he means to be a poet, ought to make fables and not discourses, and knowing that I was not skilled in making fables, I therefore put into verse those fables of Aesop, which were at hand and were known to me, and which first occurred to me. Tell this then to Evanus, Sebes, and bid him farewell, and, if he is wise, to follow me as soon as he can. 
but I depart as it seems today, for so the Athenians order. To this Simeas said, What is this, Socrates, which you exhort Evanus to do? For I often meet with him, and from what I know of him, I am pretty certain that he will not at all be willing to comply with your advice. What, then, said he, is not Evanus a philosopher? To me he seems to be so, said Simeas. Then he will be willing, rejoined Socrates, and so will every one who worthily engages in this study. Perhaps, indeed, he will not commit violence on himself, for that, they say, is not allowable. And as he said this, he let down his leg from the bed on the ground, and in this posture continued during the remainder of the discussion. Sebes then asked him, What do you mean, Socrates, by saying that it is not lawful to commit violence on one's self, but that a philosopher should be willing to follow one who is dying? What Sebes have not you and Simeas, who have conversed familiarly with Philolaus on this subject, heard? Nothing very clearly, Socrates. I, however, speak only from hearsay. What then I have heard, I have no scruple in telling. And perhaps it is most becoming for one who is about to travel there, to inquire and speculate about the journey thither, what kind we think it is. What else can one do in the interval before sunset? Why, then, Socrates, do they say that it is not allowable to kill oneself? For I, as you as just now, have heard both Philolaus, when he lived with us, and several others say that it was not right to do this. But I never heard anything clear upon the subject from anyone. Then you should consider it attentively, said Socrates. For perhaps you may hear. Probably, however, it will appear wonderful to you, if this alone, of all other things, is an universal truth, and it never happens to a man, as is the case in all other things, that at some times, and to some persons only, it is better to die than to live, yet that these men for whom it is better to die, this probably will appear wonderful to you, may not without impiety do this good to themselves, but must await another benefactor. Then Serbes, gently smiling, said, speaking in his own dialect, Jove be witness. And indeed, said Socrates, it would appear to be unreasonable, yet still perhaps it has some reason on its side. The maxim, indeed, given on this subject in the mystical doctrines, that we, men, are in a kind of prison, and that we ought not to free ourselves from it and escape, appears to me difficult to be understood, and not easy to penetrate. This, however, appears to me, Sebes, to be well said, that the gods take care of us, and that we, men, are one of their possessions. Does it not seem so to you? It does, replied Sebes. Therefore, said he, if one of your slaves were to kill himself without your having intimated that you wished him to die, should you not be angry with him, and should you not punish him if you could? Certainly, he replied. Perhaps then, in this point of view, it is not unreasonable to assert that a man ought not to kill himself before the deity lays him under a necessity of doing so, such as that now laid on me. This, indeed, said Sebes, appears to be probable. But what you said just now, Socrates, that philosophers should be very willing to die, appears to be an absurdity, 
if what we said just now is agreeable to reason, that it is God who takes care of us, and that we are his property. For that the wisest man should not be grieved at leaving that service in which they govern them, who are the best of all masters, namely the gods, is not consistent with reason. For surely he cannot think that he will take better care of himself when he has become free, but a foolish man might perhaps think thus, that he should fly from his master, and would not reflect that he ought not to fly from a good one, but should cling to him as much as possible, therefore he would fly against all reason. But a man of sense would desire to be constantly with one better than himself. Thus, Socrates, the contrary of what you just now said, is likely to be the case. For it becomes the wise to be grieved at dying, but the foolish to rejoice. Socrates, on hearing this, appeared to me to be pleased with the pertinacity of Sebes, and looking toward us, said, Sebes, you see, always searches out arguments, and is not at all willing to admit at once anything one has said. Whereupon Simeas replied, But indeed, Socrates, Sebes appears to me now to say something to the purpose. For with what design should men really wise fly from masters who are better than themselves, and so readily leave them. And Sebes appears to me to direct his argument against you, because you so easily endure to abandon both us and those good rulers, as you yourself confess, the gods. You speak justly, said Socrates, for I think you mean that I ought to make my defense to this charge, as if I were in a court of justice. Certainly, replied Simeas. Come then, said he, I will endeavor to defend myself more successfully before you than before the judges. For, he proceeded, Simeas and Sebes, if I did not think that I should go first of all, among other deities, who are both wise and good, and next among men who have departed this life better than any here, I should be wrong in not grieving at death. But now be assured, I hope to go among good men, though I would not positively assert it, that, however, I shall go among gods who are perfectly good masters, be assured, I can positively assert this, if I can, anything of this kind. So that, on this account, I am not so much troubled. But I entertain a good hope that something awaits those who die. And that, as was said long since, it will be far better for the good than the evil. What then, Socrates, said Simeas, would you go away keeping this persuasion to yourself, or would you impart it with us? For this good appears to me to be also common to us, and at the same time it will be an apology for you, if you can persuade us to believe what you say. I will endeavor to do so, he said. But first let us attend to Crito here and see what it is he seems to have for some time wished to say. What else, Socrates, said Crito, but what he who is to give you the poison told me some time ago that I should tell you to speak as little as possible, for he says that men become too much heated by speaking, and that nothing of this kind ought to interfere with the poison, and that... Otherwise, those who did so were sometimes compelled to drink two or three times. To which Socrates replied, Let him alone, and let him attend to his own business, and prepare to give it me twice, 
or if occasion requires even thrice. I was almost certain what you would say, answered Crito, but he has been some time pestering me. Never mind him, he rejoined. But now I wish to render an account to you, my judges, of the reason why a man who has really devoted his life to philosophy, when he is about to die, appears to me, on good grounds, to have confidence and to entertain a firm hope that the greatest good will befall him in the other world when he has departed this life. How, then, this comes to pass, Simias and Sebes, I will endeavor to explain. For as many as rightly apply themselves to philosophy seem to have left all others in ignorance, that they aim at nothing else than to die and be dead. If this, then, is true, it would surely be absurd to be anxious about nothing else than this during their whole life. But when it arrives, to be grieved at what they have been long anxious about and aimed at. End of Section 9 Recording by Mike Botez Section 10 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Mike Botez the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2 Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd The Condemnation and Death of Socrates, B.C. 399 By Plato, Part 2 Upon this, Simia smiling said, By Jupiter, Socrates, Though I am not now at all inclined to smile, you have made me do so, for I think that the multitude, if they heard this, would think it was very well said in reference to philosophers, and that our countrymen particularly would agree with you, that true philosophers do desire death, and that they are by no means ignorant that they deserve to suffer it. And indeed, Simias, they would speak the truth, except in asserting that they are not ignorant. For they are ignorant of the sense in which true philosophers desire to die, and in what sense they deserve death, and what kind of death. But, he said, let us take leave of them, and speak to one another. Do we think that death is anything? Certainly, replied Simias. Is it anything else than the separation of the soul from the body? And is not this to die, for the body to be a part by itself, separated from the soul, and for the soul to subsist a part by itself, separated from the body? Is death anything else than this? No, but this, he replied. Consider then, my good friend, whether you are of the same opinion as me. For thus I think we shall understand better the subject we are considering. Does it appear to you to be becoming in a philosopher to be anxious about pleasures as they are called, such as meats and drinks? By no means, Socrates, said Simias. But what about the pleasure of love? Not at all. What, then, does such a man appear to you to think other bodily indulgences of value? For instance, does he seem to you to value or despise the possession of magnificent garments and sandals and other ornaments of the body, except so far as necessity compels him to use them? The true philosopher, he answered, appears to me to despise them. Does not, then, he continued, the whole employment of such a man 
appeared to you to be not about the body, but to separate himself from it as much as possible and be occupied about his soul. It does. First of all, then, in such matters, does not the philosopher, above all other men, evidently free his soul as much as he can from communion with the body? It appears so. And it appears, Simeas, to the generality of man, that he who takes no pleasure in such things, and who does not use them, does not deserve to live, but that he nearly approaches to death, who cares nothing for the pleasures that subsist through the body. You speak very truly, but what with respect to the acquisition of wisdom? Is the body an impediment or not, if anyone takes it with him as a partner in the search? What I mean is this. Do sight and hearing convey any truth in men, or are they such as the poets constantly sing, who say that we neither hear nor see anything with accuracy? If, however... These bodily senses are neither accurate nor clear, much less can the others be so, for they are all far inferior to these. Do they not seem so to you? Certainly, he replied. When then, said he, does the soul light on the truth? For when it attempts to consider anything in conjunction with the body... It is plain that it is then led astray by it. You say truly. Must it not then be by reasoning, if at all, that any of the things that really are become known to it? Yes. And surely the soul then reasons best when none of these things disturbs it, neither hearing nor sight nor pain, nor pleasure of any kind, but it retires as much as possible within itself, taking leave of the body, and as far as it can, not communicating or being in contact with it, it aims at the discovery of that which is. Such is the case. Does not, then, the soul of the philosopher in these cases, despise the body, and flee from it, and seek to retire within itself. It appears so. But what as to such things as this, Simeas? Do we say that justice itself is something or nothing? We say it is something, by Jupiter. And that beauty and goodness are something? How not? Now then, have you ever seen anything of this kind with your eyes? By no means, he replied. Did you ever lay hold of them by any other bodily sense? But I speak generally as of magnitude, health, strength, and, in a word, of the essence of everything, that is to say, what each is, is then the exact truth of these perceived by means of the body, or is it thus? Whoever among us habituates himself to reflect most deeply and accurately on each several thing about which he is considering, he will make the nearest approach to the knowledge of it. Certainly. Would not he, then, do this with the utmost purity, who should, in the highest degree, approach each subject by means of the mere mental faculties, neither employing the sight in conjunction with the reflective faculty, nor introducing any other sense together with reasoning, but who using pure reflection by itself, should attempt to search out each essence purely by itself, freed as much as possible from the eyes and ears, and, in a word, 
from the whole body, as disturbing the soul and not suffering it to acquire truth and wisdom when it is in communion with it. Is not he the person, Simeas, if anyone can, who will arrive at the knowledge of that which is? You speak with wonderful truth, Socrates, replied Simeas. Wherefore, he said, it necessarily follows from all this that some such opinion as this should be entertained by genuine philosophers, so that they should speak among themselves as follows. A bypath, as it were, seems to lead us on in our researches undertaken by reason, because as long as we are encumbered with the body, and our soul is contaminated with such an evil, we can never fully attain to what we desire. And this, we say, is truth. For the body subjects us to innumerable hindrances on account of its necessary support. And, moreover, if any diseases befall us, they impede us in our search after that which is. And it fills us with longings, desires, fears, all kinds of fancies, and a multitude of absurdities, so that, as it is said in real truth, by reason of the body, it is never possible for us to make any advances in wisdom. For nothing else but the body and its desires occasions wars, seditions, and contests. For all wars among us arise on account of our desire to acquire wealth, and we are compelled to acquire wealth on account of the body, being enslaved to its service, and consequently on all these accounts we are hindered in the pursuit of philosophy. But the worst of all is that if it leaves us any leisure, and we apply ourselves to the consideration of any subject, it constantly obtrudes itself in the midst of our researches and occasions trouble and disturbance and confounds us so that we are not able by reason of it to discern the truth. It has then in reality been demonstrated to us that if we are ever to know anything purely, we must be separated from the body and contemplate the things themselves by the mere soul. And then, as it seems, we shall obtain that which we desire, and which we profess ourselves to be the lovers of wisdom, when we are dead, as reason shows, but not while we are alive. For, if it is not possible to know anything purely in conjunction with a body, one of these two things must follow, either that we can never acquire knowledge, or only after we are dead. For then the soul will subsist apart by itself, separate from the body, but not before. And while we live, we shall thus, as it seems, approach nearest to knowledge, if we hold no intercourse or communion at all with the body except what absolute necessity requires, nor suffer ourselves to be polluted by its nature, but purify ourselves from it until God himself shall release us. And thus being pure and freed from the folly of body, we shall in all likelihood be with others like ourselves, and shall of ourselves know the whole real essence and that, probably, is truth. For it is not allowable for the impure to attain to the pure. Such things, I think, Simeas, all true lovers of wisdom, must both think and say to one another, Does it not seem so to you? Most assuredly, Socrates, if this, then, said Socrates, 
is true, my friend. There is great hope for one who arrives where I am going, there, if anywhere, to acquire that perfection for the sake of which we have taken so much pains during our past life, so that the journey now appointed me is set out upon with good hope, and will be so by any other man who thinks that his mind has been, as it were, purified. This earth and the whole region here are decayed and corroded, as things in the sea by the saltness, for nothing of any value grows in the sea, nor, in a word, does it contain anything perfect, but there are caverns and sand and mud in abundance and filth in whatever parts of the sea there is earth, nor are they at all worthy to be compared with the beautiful things with us. But, on the other hand, those things in the upper regions of the earth would appear far more to excel the things with us. For, if we may tell a beautiful fable, it is well worth hearing, Simeas, what kind the things are on the earth beneath the heavens. Indeed, Socrates, said Simeas, we should be very glad to hear that fable. First of all, then, my friend, he continued, this earth, if anyone should survey it from above, is said to have the appearance of balls covered with twelve different pieces of leather, variegated and distinguished with colors, of which the colors found here and which painters use are, as it were, copies. But there the whole earth is composed of such, and far more brilliant and pure than these, for one part of it is purple and of wonderful beauty, part of a golden color and part of white, more white than chalk or snow, and in like manner composed of other colors, and those more in number and more beautiful than any we have ever beheld, and those very hollow parts of the earth, though filled with water and air, exhibit a certain species of color, shining among the variety of other colors, so that one continually variegated aspect presents itself to the view. In this earth, being such, all things that grow, grow in a manner proportioned to its nature, trees, flowers, and fruits. And again, in like manner, its mountains and stones possesses, in the same proportion, smoothness and transparency, and more beautiful colors, of which the well-known stones here, that are so highly prized, are but fragments, such as sardine stones, jaspers, and emeralds, and all of that kind. But there... There is nothing subsists that is not of this character, and even more beautiful than these. But the reason of this is, because the stones there are pure, and not eaten up and decayed, like those here, by rottenness and saltness, which flow down hither together, and which produce deformity and disease in the stones and the earth and in other things, even animals and plants. But that earth is adorned with all these, and moreover with gold and silver, and other things of the kind. For they are naturally conspicuous, being numerous and large, and in all parts of the earth, so that to behold it is a sight for the blessed, there are also many animals and men upon it, some dwelling in mid-earth, others about the air, as we do about the sea, and others in islands which the air flows round, and which are near the continent, and in one word 
what water and the sea are to us for our necessities, the air is to them, and what air is to us, that ether is to them. But their seasons are of such a temperament that they are free from disease, and live for a much longer time than those here, and surpass us in sight, hearing, and smelling, and everything of this kind, as much as air excels water, and ether air in purity. Moreover, they have abodes and temples of the gods, in which gods really dwell, and voices and oracles, and sensible visions of the gods, and such like intercourse with them. The sun, too, and moon and stars are seen by them, such as they really are, and their felicity in other respects is correspondent with these things. And such, indeed, is the nature of the whole earth and the parts about the earth. But there are many places all round it, throughout its cavities, some deeper and more open than that in which we dwell, but others that are deeper have less chasm than in our region, and other are shallower in depth than they are here and broader. But all these are in many places perforated one into another under the earth, some with narrower and some with wider channels, and have passages through, by which a great quantity of water flows from one into another, as into basins, and there are immense bulks of ever-flowing rivers under the earth, both of hot and cold water, and a great quantity of fire, and mighty rivers of fire, and many of liquid mire, some purer and some more miry, as in Sicily there are rivers of mud that flow before the lava, and the lava itself, and from these the several places are filled, according as the overflow from time to time happens to come to each of them. But all these move up and down, as it were by a certain oscillation existing in the earth. And this oscillation proceeds from such natural cause as this. One of the cousins of the earth is exceedingly large, and perforated through the entire earth, and is that which Homer speaks of, very far off, where is the most profound abyss beneath the earth, which elsewhere both he and many other poets have called Tartarus. For into this chasm all rivers flow together, and from it flow out again, but they severally derive their character from the earth through which they flow. And the reason why all streams flow out from thence and flow into it is because this liquid has neither bottom nor base. Therefore it oscillates and fluctuates up and down, and the air and the wind around it do the same. For they accompany it, both when it rushes to those parts of the earth and when to these. And as in respiration, the flowing breath is continually breathed out and drawn in. So there the wind, oscillating with the liquid, causes certain vehement and irresistible winds, both as it enters and goes out. When, therefore, the water rushing in descends to the place which we call the lower region, it flows through the earth into the streams there and fills them just as men pump up water. But when again it leaves those regions and rushes hither, it again fills the rivers here, and these, when filled, flow through channels and through the earth, and having severally reached the several places to which they are journeying, they make seas, lakes, rivers and fountains, then, sinking again from thence beneath the earth, 
some of them having gone round longer and more numerous places, and others round fewer and shorter, they again discharged themselves into Tartarus, some much lower than they were drawn up, others only a little so, but all of them flow in again beneath the point at which they flowed out and some issue out directly opposite the place by which they flow in, others on the same side. There are also some, which having gone round altogether in a circle, fold in themselves once or several times round the earth like serpents, when they had descended as low as possible, discharge themselves again. And it is possible for them to descend on either side as far as the middle, but not beyond. For in each direction there is an acclivity to the streams both ways. Now there are many other large and various streams, and among this great number there are four certain streams, of which the largest, and that which flows most outwardly round the earth, is called ocean but directly opposite this, and flowing in a contrary direction, is Acheron, which flows through other desert places, and, moreover, passing under the earth, reaches the Acherusian lake, where the souls of most who die arrive, and, having remained there for certain destined periods, some longer and some shorter, are again sent forth into the generations of animals. A third river issues midway between these, and near its source falls into a vast region, burning with abundance of fire, and forms a lake larger than our sea, boiling with water and mud. From hence it proceeds in a circle, turbulent and muddy, and folding itself round it, reaches both other places and the extremity of the Acherusian lake, but does not mingle with its water, but folding itself oftentimes beneath the earth, it discharges itself into the lower parts of Tartarus, and this is the river which they call Pyriflegaton, whose burning streams emit dissevered fragments in whatever part of the earth they happen to be. Opposite to this, again, the fourth river first falls into a place dreadful and savage, as it is said, having its whole color like Cyanus. This they call Stygian, and the lake, which the river forms by its discharge, Styx. This river, having fallen in here, and received awful power in the water, sinking beneath the earth, proceeds folding itself round, in an opposite course, to Pyriflegathon, and meets it in the Acherusian lake from a contrary direction. Neither does the water of this river mingle with any other, but it, too, having gone round in a circle, discharges itself into Tartarus opposite to Pyriflegathon. Its name, as the poets say, is Cossetus. These things, being thus constituted, when the dead arrive at the place to which their demon leads them severally, first of all they are judged, as well those who have lived well and piously, as those who have not. And those who appear to have passed a middle kind of life, proceeding to Acheron, and embarking in the vessels they have, on these arrive at the lake, and there dwell. And when they are purified, and have suffered punishment for the iniquities they may have committed, they are set free, and each receives the reward of his good deeds according to his deserts. But those who appear to be incurable, through the magnitude of their offenses, either from having committed many and great sacrileges, or many unjust and lawless murders, or other similar crimes, these a suitable destiny hurls into Tartarus, 
whence they never come forth. But those who appear to have been guilty of curable yet great offenses, such as those who through anger have committed any violence against father or mother, and have lived the remainder of their life in a state of penitence, or they who have committed homicides in a similar manner, these must of necessity fall into Tartarus. But after they have fallen, and have been there for a year, the wave casts them forth, the homicides into Cossitus, but the patricides and matricides into Pariflegathon. But when, being borne along, they arrive at the Acherusian lake, there they cry out to and invoke, some, those whom they slew, others, those whom they injured, and invoking them, they entreat and implore them to suffer them, to go out into the lake and to receive them, and if they persuade them, they go out and are freed from their suffering, but if not, they are borne back to Tartarus, and thence again to the rivers, and they do not cease from suffering this until they have persuaded those whom they have injured, for this sentence was imposed on them by the judges. But those who are found to have lived an eminently holy life, these are they who, being freed and set at large from these regions in the earth, as from a prison, arrive at the pure abode above, and dwell on the upper parts of the earth. And among these, they who have sufficiently purified themselves by philosophy, shall live without bodies throughout all future time, and shall arrive at habitations yet more beautiful than these, which it is neither easy to describe, nor at present is there sufficient time for the purpose. But for the sake of these things which we have described, we should use every endeavor, Simeas, so as to acquire virtue and wisdom in this life, for the reward is noble and the hope great. To affirm positively, indeed, that these things are exactly as I have described them, does not become a man of sense. That, however, either this or something of the kind takes place with respect to our souls and their habitations, since our soul is certainly immortal. This appears to me most fitting to be believed, and worthy the hazard for one who trusts in its reality. For the hazard is noble, and it is right to allure ourselves with such things as with enchantments, for which reason I have prolonged my story to such a length. On account of these things, then, a man ought to be confident about his soul, who during this life has disregarded all the pleasures and ornaments of the body as foreign from his nature, and who, having thought that they do more harm than good, has zealously applied himself to the acquirement of knowledge, and who, having adorned his soul, not with a foreign, but its own proper ornament, temperance, justice, fortitude, freedom, and truth, thus waits for his passage to Hades, as one who is ready to depart whenever destiny shall summon him. You then, he continued, Simeas and Sebes, and the rest, will each of you depart at some future time, but now destiny summons me, as a tragic writer would say, and it is nearly time for me to betake myself to the bath, for it appears to me to be better to drink the poison after I have bathed myself, and not to trouble the women with washing my dead body. End of section 10 Recording by Mike Botez
Section 11 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn. Rossiter Johnson and John Rudd The Condemnation and Death of Socrates B.C. 399 By Plato Part 3 When he had thus spoken, Crito said, So be it, Socrates, but what commands have you to give to these or to me, either respecting your children or any other matter, in attending to which we can most oblige you. What I always say, Crito, he replied, nothing new, that by taking care of yourselves you will oblige both me and mine and yourselves. Whatever you do, though, you should not now promise it. But if you neglect yourselves and will not live as it were, in the footsteps of what has been now and formerly said, even though you should promise much at present, and that earnestly, you will do no good at all. We will endeavor then so to do, he said. But how shall we bury you? Just as you please, he said. If only you can catch me, and I do not escape from you and at the same time smiling gently and looking round on us, he said, I cannot persuade Crito, my friends, that I am that Socrates who is now conversing with you, and who methodizes each part of the discourse, but he thinks that I am he whom he will shortly behold dead, and asks how he should bury me, but that which I sometimes since argued at length, that when I have drunk the poison I shall no longer remain with you, but shall depart to some happy state of the blessed. This I have seemed to have urged to him in vain, though I meant at the same time to console both you and myself. Be ye then my sureties to Crito, he said in an obligation contrary to that which he made to the judges, for he undertook that I should remain. But do you be sure it is that when I die I shall not remain, but shall depart, that Crito may more easily bear it, and when he sees my body either burnt or buried, may not be afflicted for me, nor say at my interment that Socrates is laid out, or is carried out, or is buried. For be well assured, he said, most excellent Crito, that to speak improperly is not only culpable as to the thing itself, but likewise occasions some injury to our souls. You must have a good courage, then, and say that you bury my body and bury it in such a manner as is pleasing to you, and as you think is most agreeable to our laws. When he had said thus, he rose, and went into a chamber to bathe, and Crito followed him, but he directed us to wait for him. We waited, therefore, conversing among ourselves about what had been said, and considering it again, and sometimes speaking about our calamity, how severe it would be to us, sincerely thinking that, like those who are deprived of a father, we should pass the rest of our life as orphans. When he had bathed and his children were brought to him, for he had two little sons, and one grown up, and the women belonging to his family were come, having conversed with them in the presence of Crito, and given them such injunctions as he wished, he directed the women and children to go away, and then returned to us. 
and it was now near sunset, for he spent a considerable time within. But when he came from bathing, he sat down, and did not speak much afterward. Then the officer of the eleven came in, and standing near him said, Socrates, I shall not have to find that fault with you that I do with others, that they are angry with me and curse me, when, by order of the archons, I bid them drink the poison. But you, on all other occasions during the time you have been here, I have found to be the most noble, meek, and excellent man of all that ever came into this place. And therefore I am now well convinced that you will not be angry with me, for you know who are to blame, but with them. Now then, for you know what I came to announce to you, farewell, and endeavor to bear what is inevitable as easy as possible. And at the same time, bursting into tears, he turned away and withdrew. And Socrates, looking after him, said, And though too, farewell, we will do as you direct. At the same time, turning to us, he said, How courteous the man is! During the whole time I have been here, he has visited me and conversed with me sometimes, and proved the worthiest of men, and now how generously he weeps for me. But come, Crito, let us obey him, and let someone bring the poison, if it is ready pounded, but if not, let the man pound it. Then Crito said, But I think, Socrates, that the sun is still on the mountains and has not yet set. Besides, I know that others have drunk the poison very late, after it had been announced to them, and have supped and drunk freely and some even have enjoyed the object of their love. Do not hasten, then, for there is yet time. Upon this, Socrates replied, These men, whom you mention, Crito, do these things with good reason, for they think they shall gain by so doing, and I, too, with good reason, shall not do so, for I think I shall gain nothing by drinking a little later except to become ridiculous to myself, in being so fond of life and sparing of it when none any longer remains. Go then, he said, obey, and do not resist. Crito, having heard this, nodded to the boy that stood near, and the boy, having gone out and stayed for some time, came bringing with him the man that was to administer the poison, who brought it ready pounded in a cup. And Socrates, on seeing the man, said, Well, my good friend, as you are skilled in these matters, what must I do? Nothing else, he replied. Then, when you have drunk it, walk about until there is a heaviness in your legs, then lie down. Thus it will do its purpose. And at the same time he held out the cup to Socrates. And he, having received it very cheerfully, Echecrates, neither trembling nor changing at all in color or countenance, but, as he was wont, looking steadfastly at the man, said, What say you of this potion, with respect to making libation to anyone? Is it lawful or not? We only pound so much, Socrates, he said, as we think sufficient to drink. I understand you, he said, but it is certainly both lawful and right to pray to the gods that my departure hence thither may be happy, which therefore I pray, and so may it be. And as he said this, he drank it off readily and calmly. Thus far... Most of us were with difficulty able to restrain ourselves from weeping. But when we saw him drinking, and having finished the draught, we could do so no longer. But in spite of myself, the tears came in full torrent, 
so that, covering my face, I wept for myself. For I did not weep for him, but for my own fortune, in being deprived of such a friend. But Crito, even before me, when he could not restrain his tears, had risen up. But Apollodorus, even before this, had not ceased weeping, and, then bursting into an agony of grief, weeping and lamenting, he pierced the heart of everyone present, except Socrates himself. But he said, What are you doing, my admirable friends? I indeed, for this reason chiefly, sent away the women, that they might not commit any folly of this kind. For I have heard that it is right to die with good omens. Be quiet, therefore, and bear up. When we have heard this, we were ashamed and restrained our tears. But he, having walked about, when he said that his legs were growing heavy, lay down on his back, for the man so directed him. And at the same time, he who gave him the poison, taking hold of him after a short interval, examined his feet and legs, and then, having pressed his foot hard, he asked if he felt it. He said that he did not. And after this he pressed his thighs, and thus going higher, he showed us that he was growing cold and stiff. Then Socrates touched himself and said that when the poison reached his heart, he should then depart. But now the parts around the lower belly were almost cold. When uncovering himself, for he had been covered over, he said, and they were his last words, Crito, we owe cock to Esculapius, pay it, therefore, and do not neglect it. It shall be done, said Crito, but consider whether you have anything else to say. To this question he gave no reply, but shortly after he gave a convulsive movement, and the man covered him, and his eyes were fixed, and Crito perceiving it, closed his mouth and eyes. This, Echecrates, was the end of our friend, a man, as we may say, the best of all his time that we have known, and, moreover, the most wise and just. End of Section 11 Recording by Mike Botez Section 12 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn. Rossiter Johnson and John Rudd Brennus Burns Rome B.C. 388 Bartold Georg Nibur Part 1 Julius Caesar is the first writer who gives us an authentic and enlightening account on the Gauls, whom he divided in three groups. The Gauls were the chief branch of the great original stock of Celts, they were nomadic people, and from their home in Western Europe, they spread to Britain, invaded Spain, and swarmed over the Alps into Italy. And it is from the latter event that this tall, fair, and fighting nation first came into the region of history. Before the Gauls had come within the borders of Italy, Camillus, the dictator, had dealt the death blow to the Etruscan League through his capture and destruction of his stronghold, Vei. But at the very summit of his triumph he lost the grace of his countrymen by demanding a tenth of their spoil taken at Vei, and which he claimed to have vowed to Apollo. It was popularly considered a ruse to increase his private fortune. 
Furthermore, a counterclaim was brought against him for appropriating bronze gates, which in Rome at that time were nothing less than actual money, bronze being the medium of currency. Camillus went into exile in consequence of the accusation. His parting prayer was that his country might feel his need and call him back. His desire was fulfilled, for soon after the goal was of the gates, under the leadership of the haughty Brennus, who had come upon the Romans at a most opportune moment. This event of the overthrow of the Romans on the Aelia has been the occasion for the well-known tale of the cackling of the geese in the temple of Juno, which alarmed the garrison. The episode also gave rise to the saying of the conqueror, Brennus, who, when reproached by his antagonists with using false weights, cast his sword into the scale, crying, Woe to the conquered! At that time, no Roman foresaw the calamity which was threatening the empire. Rome had become great because the country which she had conquered was weak through its oligarchical institutions. The subjects of the other states gladly joined the Romans because under them their lot was more favorable and probably because they were kindred nations. But matters went with the Romans as they did with Basilius who subdued the Armenians when they were threatened by the Turks, and who soon after attacked the whole Greek Empire and took away far more than had been gained before. The expedition of the Gauls into Italy must be regarded as a migration, and not as an invasion for the purpose of conquest. As for the historical account of it, we must adhere to Polybius and Diodorus who place it shortly before the taking of Rome by the Gauls. We can attach no importance to the statement of Livy, that they had come into Italy as early as the time of Tarquinius Priscus, having been driven from their country by a famine. It undoubtedly arose from the fact that some Greek writer, perhaps Timaeus, connected this migration with the settlement of the Phocians at Massilia. It is possible that Livy even here made use of Dionysius, and that the latter followed Timaeus. For, as Livy made use of Dionysius in the eighth book, why not also in the fifth? He himself knew very little of Greek history but Justin's account is here evidently opposed to Livy. Trogus Pompeius was born in the neighborhood of Massilia, and in writing his 43rd book, he obviously made use of native chronicles, for, from no other source, could he derive the account of the Decreta Honorifica of the Romans to Massilians for the friendship which the latter has shown to the Romans during the Gallic War, and from the same source must he have obtained his information about the maritime wars of Massilia against Carthage. Trogus knows nothing of the story that the Gauls assisted the Phocians on their arrival, but according to him they met with a kind of reception among the Ligurians who continued to inhabit those parts for a long time after. Even the story of the Lucumo, who is said to have invited the Gauls, is opposed to him, and if it were referred to Clusium alone, it would be absurd. Polybius places the passage of the Gauls across the Alps about ten or twenty years before the taking of Rome, and Diodorus describes them as advancing toward Rome, by an uninterrupted march. It is further stated that Melpum, in the country of the Insubrians, was destroyed on the same day as Vei. Without admitting this coincidence, we have no reason to doubt that the statement is substantially true, and it is made by Cornelius Nepos, who, as a native of Gallia Transpadana, might possess accurate information 
and whose chronological accounts were highly esteemed by the Romans. There was no other passage for the Gauls, except either across the Little Saint Bernard or across the Simplon. It is not probable that they took the former road, because their country extended only as far as the Ticinus, and if they had come across the Little Saint Bernard, they would naturally have occupied also all the country between that mountain and the Ticinus. The Salasi may indeed have been a Gaelic people, but it is by no means certain. Moreover, between them and the Gauls who had come across the Alps, the Levi also lived, and there can be no doubt that at that time Ligurians still continued to dwell on the Ticinus. Melpum must have been situated in the district of Milan. The latter place has an uncommonly happy situation. Often as it has been destroyed, it has always been restored, so that it is not impossible that Melpum may have been situated on the very spot afterward occupied by Milan. The Gaelic migration undoubtedly passed by like a torrent with irresistible rapidity. How, then, is it possible to suppose that Melpum resisted them for two centuries, or that they conquered it and yet did not disturb the Etruscans for two hundred years? It would be absurd to believe it, merely to save an uncritical expression of Livy. According to the common chronology, the Tribali, who in the time of Herodotus inhabited the plains, and were afterward expelled by the Gauls, appeared in Thrace twelve years after the taking of Rome. According to a more correct chronology, it was only nine years after that event. It was the same movement, assuredly, which led the Gauls to the countries through which the middle course of the Danube extends, and to the Po. And could the people who came in a few days from Clusium to Rome, and afterward appeared in Apulia, have been sitting quiet in a corner of Italy for two hundred years? If they had remained there because they had not the power to advance, they would have been cut to pieces by the Etruscans. We must therefore look upon it as an established fact that the migration took place at the late period mentioned by Polybius and Diodorus. These Gauls were partly Celts and partly, indeed principally, Belge or Cymri, as may be perceived from the circumstance that their king, as well as the one who appeared before Delphi, is called Brennus. Brennin, according to Adelang, in his Mithridates, signifies in the language of Wales and Lower Brittany, a king. But what caused the whole emigration? The statement of Livy that the Gauls were compelled by famine to leave their country is quite in keeping with the nature of all traditions about migrations, such as we find them in Saxo Grammaticus, in Paul Wernefried, from the sagas of the Swedes, in the Tyrannian traditions of Lydia, and others. However, in the case of a people like the Celts, every specific statement of this kind, in which even the names of their leaders are mentioned, is of no more value than the traditions of other barbarous nations, which were unacquainted with the art of writing. It is indeed well known that the Celts in writing used the Greek alphabet, but they probably employed it only in the transactions of daily life, for we know that they were not allowed to commit their ancient songs to writing. During the Gaelic migration, we are again made aware how little we know of the history of Italy generally. Our knowledge is limited to Rome, so that we are in the same predicament there as if, of all the historical authorities of the whole German Empire, we had nothing 
were the annals of a single imperial city. According to Livy's account, it would seem as if the only object of the Gauls had been to march to Rome, and yet this immigration changed the whole aspect of Italy. After the Gauls had once crossed the Apennines, there was no further obstacle to prevent their marching to the south of Italy by any road they pleased, and it is in fact mentioned that they did proceed farther south. The Umbrians still inhabited the country on the lower Po, in the modern Romania and Urbino, parts of which were occupied by Liburnians. Polybius says that many people there became tributary to the Gauls, and that this was the case of the Umbrians is quite certain. The first historical appearance of the Gauls is at Clusium, whither a noble Clusine is said to have invited them for the purpose of taking vengeance on his native city. Whether this account is true, however, must remain undecided. And if there is any truth in it, it is more probable that the offended Clusine went across the Apennines and fetched his avengers. Clusium has not been mentioned since the time of Porsena. The fact of the Clusines soliciting the aid of Rome is a proof how little that northern city of Etruria was concerned about the fate of the southern towns, and makes us even suspect that it was allied with Rome. However, the danger was so great that all jealousy must have been suppressed. The natural road for the Gauls would have been along the Adriatic, then through the country of Umbrians, who were tributary to them, and already quite broken down, and thence through the Romagna across the Apennines. But the Apennines which separate Tuscany from the Romagna are very difficult to cross, especially for sumpter horses, as therefore the Gauls could not enter Etruria on that side, which the Etruscans had intentionally allowed to grow wild. And as they had been convinced of this in an unsuccessful attempt, they crossed the Apennines in the neighborhood of Clusium, and appeared before that city. Clusium was the great bulwark of the valley of the Tiber, and if it were taken, the roads along the Tiber and the Arno would be open, and the Gauls might reach Arezzo from the rear. The Romans, therefore, looked upon the fate of Clusium as decisive of their own. The Clusines sued for a treaty with the mighty city of Rome, and the Romans were wise enough readily to accept the offer. They sent ambassadors to the Gauls, ordering them to withdraw. According to a very probable account, the Gauls had demanded of the Clusines a division of their territory as the condition of peace, and not as was customary with the Romans as a tax upon a people already subdued. If this is correct, the Romans sent the embassy, confiding in their own strength, but the Gauls scorned the ambassadors, and the latter, allowing themselves to be carried away by their warlike disposition, joined the Etruscans in a fight against the Gauls. This was probably only an insignificant and isolated engagement. Such is the account of Livy, who goes on to say that the Gauls, as soon as they perceived this violation in the law of nations, gave the signal for a retreat, and, having called upon the gods to avenge the wrong, marched against Rome. This is evidently a mere fiction, for a barbarous nation like the Gauls cannot possibly have had such ideas, nor was there in reality any violation of the law of nations, as the Romans stood in no kind of connection with the Gauls. But it was a natural feeling with the Romans to look upon the fall of their city as the consequence of an efface which no human power could resist. Roman vanity also is at work here, 
inasmuch as the Roman ambassadors are said to have so distinguished themselves that they were recognized by the barbarians among the hosts of Etruscans. Now, according to another tradition directly opposed to these statements, the Gauls sent to Rome to demand the surrender of those ambassadors. As the Senate was hesitating and left the decision to the people, the latter not only rejected the demand, but appointed the same ambassadors to the office of military tribunes, whereupon the Gauls with all their forces at once marched towards Rome. Livy here again speaks of the populace as the people to whom the Senate left the decision. This must have been the patricians only, for they alone had the right to decide upon the fate of the members of their own order. It is not fair to accuse the Romans on that occasion of dishonesty, but this account assuredly originated with later writers, who transferred to barbarians the right belonging to a nation standing in a legal relation to another. The statement that the three ambassadors, all of whom were Fabi, were appointed military tribunes, is not even the usual one, for there is another in Diodorus, who must here have used Roman authorities written in Greek, that is, Fabius, since he calls the Kerites Greek Keri and not Greek Agulei. He speaks of a single ambassador, who, being a son of a military tribune, fought against the Gauls. This is at least a sign how uncertain history yet is. The battle on the Alia was fought on the 16th of July. The military tribunes entered upon their office on the 1st of that month, and the distance between Clusium and Rome is only three good days' marches. It is impossible to restore the true history, but we can discern what is fabulous from what is really historical. An innumerable host of Gauls now march from Clusium toward Rome. For a long time the Gauls were most formidable to the Romans, as well as to all other nations with whom they came in contact even as far east as the Ukraine. As to Rome, we see this as late as the Cisalpine War of the Year, AU 527. Polybius and Diodorus are our best guides in seeking for information about the manners of the Gauls, for in the time of Caesar they had already become changed, in the description of their persons, we partly recognize the modern Gael, or the inhabitants of the highlands of Scotland, huge bodies, blue eyes, bristly hair. Even their dress and armor are those of the highlanders, for they wore the checked and variegated tartans. Their arms consisted of the broad, unpointed battle sword, the same weapon as the claymore among the highlanders. They had a vast number of horns, which were used in the highlands for many centuries after, and threw themselves upon the enemy in immense irregular masses with terrible fury, those standing behind impelling those stationed in front whereby they became irresistible by the tactics of those times. The Romans ought to have used against them their phalanx and doubled it, until they were accustomed to this enemy, and were enabled by their greater skill to repel them. If the Romans had been able to withstand their first shock, the Gauls would have easily been thrown into disorder and put to flight. The Gauls, who were subsequently conquered by the Romans, were the descendants of such as were born in Italy, and had lost much of their courage and strength. The Goths under Vitiges 
not fifty years after the immigration of Theodoric in Italy, were cowards and unable to resist the twenty thousand men of Belisarius, showing how easily barbarians degenerate in such climates. The Gauls, moreover, were terrible on account of their inhuman cruelty, for wherever they settled, the original towns and their inhabitants completely disappeared from the face of the earth. In their own country, they had the feudal system and a priestly government. The Druids were their only rulers, who avenged the oppressed people on the lords, but in their turn became tyrants. All the people were in the condition of serfs, a proof that the Gauls, in their own country too, were the conquerors who had subdued an earlier population. We always find mention of the wealth of the Gauls in gold. And yet France has no rivers that carry gold sand, and the Pyrenees were then no longer in their possession. The gold must therefore have been obtained by barter. Much may be exaggeration, and the fact of some noble individuals wearing gold chains was probably transferred by ancient poets to the whole nation, since popular poetry takes great liberty, especially in such embellishments. End of section 12「Section 13 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Brennus Burns Rome, B.C. 388, by Bartold Georg Niebuhr, Part 2. Pliny states that previous to the Gallic Calamity, the census amounted to 150,000 persons, which probably refers only to men entitled to vote in the assemblies, and does not comprise women, children, slaves, and strangers. If this be correct, the number of citizens was enormous, but it must not be supposed to include the inhabitants of the city only, the population of which was doubtless much smaller. The statement of Diodorus, that all men were called to arms to resist the Gauls, and that the number amounted to 40,000, is by no means improbable. According to the testimony of Polybius, Latins and Hernicans also were enlisted. Another account makes the Romans take the field against the Gauls with 24,000 men, that is, with four field legions and four civic legions. The field legions were formed only of plebeians, and served according to the order of the classes, probably in maniples. The civic legions contained all those who belonged neither to the patricians nor to the plebeians, that is, all the aerari, proletari, freedmen, and artisans who had never before faced an enemy. They were certainly not armed with a pilum, nor drawn up in maniples, but used pikes and were employed in phalanxes. Now, as for the field legions, each consisted half of Latins and half of Romans, there being in each maniple one century of Roman and one of Latins. There were at that time four legions, and as a legion, including the reserve troops, contained 3,000 men, the total is 12,000. Now, the account which mentions 24,000 men 
must have presumed that there were four field legions and four irregular civic ones. There would accordingly have been no more than 6,000 plebeians, and even if the legions were all made up of Romans, only 12,000. If in addition to these we take 12,000 irregular troops and 16,000 allies, the number of 40,000 would be completed. In this case, the population of Rome would not have been as large as that of Athens in the Peloponnesian War, and this is indeed very probable. The cavalry is not included in this calculation, but 40,000 must be taken as the maximum of the whole army. There seems to be no exaggeration in this statement, and the battle on the Alia, speaking generally, is an historical event. It is surprising that the Romans did not appoint a dictator to command in the battle. It cannot be said, indeed, that they regarded this war as an ordinary one, for in that case they would not have raised so great a force. But they cannot have comprehended the danger in all its greatness. New swarms continue to come across the Alps. The Senons also now appear to seek habitations for themselves. They, like the Germans in after times, demanded land, as they found the Insubrians, Boyans, and others already settled. The latter had taken up their abode in Umbria, but only until they should find a more extensive and suitable territory. The Romans committed the great mistake of fighting with their hurriedly collected troops a battle against an enemy who had hitherto been invincible. The hills along which the right wing is said to have been drawn up are no longer discernible, and they were probably nothing but little mounds of earth. At any rate, it was senseless to draw up a long line against the immense mass of enemies. The Gauls, on the other hand, were enabled without any difficulty to turn off to the left. They proceeded to a higher part of the river, where it was more easily fordable, and with great prudence threw themselves with all their force upon the right wing, consisting of the civic legions. The latter at first resisted, but not long and when they fled, the whole remaining line, which until then seems to have been useless and inactive, was seized with a panic. Terror preceded the Gauls as they laid waste everything on their way, and this paralyzed the courage of the Romans, instead of rousing them to a desperate resistance. The Romans, therefore, were defeated on the Alia in the most inglorious manner. The Gauls had taken them in their rear and cut off their return to Rome. A portion fled toward the Tiber, where some effected a retreat across the river, and others were drowned. Another part escaped into the forest. The loss of life must have been prodigious, and it is inconceivable how Livy could have attached so much importance to the mere disgrace. If the Roman army had not been almost annihilated, it would not have been necessary to give up the defense of the city, as was done, for the city was left undefeated and deserted by all. Many fled to Veii instead of returning to Rome. Only a few who had escaped along the high road entered the city by the Colian Gate. Rome was exhausted, her power shattered, her legions defenseless, and her warlike allies had partly been beaten in the same battle, and were partly awaiting the fearful enemy in their own countries. At Rome it was believed that the whole army was destroyed, for nothing was known of those who had reached Veii. In the city itself there were only old men, women and children, so that there was no possibility of defending it. 
It is, however, inconceivable that the gates should have been left open, and that the Gauls, from the fear of a stratagem, should have encamped for several days outside the gates. A more probable account is that the gates were shut and barricaded. We may form a vivid conception of the condition of Rome after this battle, by comparing it with that of Moscow before the conflagration. The people were convinced that a long defense was impossible, since there was probably a want of provisions. Levy gives a false notion of the evacuation of the city, as if the defenseless citizens had remained immovable in their consternation, and only a few had been received into the capital. The determination, in fact, was to defend the capital, and the tribune Sulpicius had taken refuge there, with about one thousand men. There was on the capital an ancient well which still exists, and without which the garrison would soon have perished. This well remained unknown to all antiquaries, till I discovered it by means of information gathered from the people who live there. Its depth in the rock descends to the level of the Tiber, but the water is now not fit to drink. The capital was a rock which had been hewn steep, and thereby made inaccessible, but a clevus closed by gates both below and above led up from the forum and the sacred way. The rock, indeed, was not so steep as in later times, as is clear from the account of the attempt to storm it, but the capital was nevertheless very strong. Whether some few remained in the city, as at Moscow, who in their stupefaction did not consider what kind of enemy they had before them, cannot be decided. The narrative is very beautiful and reminds us of the taking of the Acropolis of Athens by the Persians, where, likewise, the old men allowed themselves to be cut down by the Persians. Notwithstanding the improbability of the matter, I am inclined to believe that a number of aged patricians, their number may not be exactly historical, sat down in the forum, in their official robes, on their curule chairs, and that the chief pontiff devoted them to death. Such devotions are a well-known Roman custom. It is certainly not improbable that the Gauls were amazed when they found the city deserted, and only those old men sitting immovable, that they took them for statues or supernatural visions, and did nothing to them, until one of them struck a goal who touched him, whereupon all were slaughtered. To commit suicide was repugnant to the customs of the Romans, who were guided in many things by feelings more correct and more resembling our own than many other ancient nations. The old men, indeed, had given up the hope of their country being saved, but the capital might be maintained, and the survivors preferred dying in the attempt of self-defense to taking refuge at Vei, where, after all, they could not have maintained themselves in the end. The sacred treasures were removed to Kere, and the hope of the Romans now was that the barbarians would be tired of the long siege. Provisions, for a time, had been conveyed to the capital, where a couple of thousand men may have been assembled, and where all buildings, temples, as well as public and private houses, were used as habitations. The Gauls made fearful havoc at Rome, even more fearful than the Spaniards and Germans did in the year 1527. Soldiers plunder, and when they find no human beings, they engage in the work of destruction. And fires break out, as at Moscow, 
without the existence of any intention to cause a conflagration. The whole city was changed into a heap of ashes, with the exception of a few houses on the Palatine, which were occupied by the leaders of the Gauls. It is astonishing to find, nevertheless, that a few monuments of the preceding period, such as statues, situated at some distance from the capital, are mentioned as having been preserved. But we must remember that Travertino is tolerably fireproof. That Rome was burned down is certain, and when it was rebuilt, not even the ancient streets were restored. The Gauls were now encamped in the city. At first they attempted to storm the Clivus, but were repelled with great loss, which is surprising, since we know that at an earlier time the Romans succeeded in storming it against Appius Herdonius. Afterward they discovered the footsteps of a messenger who had been sent from Vei, in order that the state might be taken care of in due form. For the Romans in the capital were patricians, and represented the curies and the government, whereas those assembled at Vei represented the tribes but had no leaders. The latter had resolved to recall Camillus and raise him to the dictatorship. For this reason Pontius Comenius had been sent to Rome to obtain the sanction of the Senate and the Curies. This was quite in the spirit of the ancient times. If the Curies had interdicted him, Aqua et Igni, they alone could recall him, if they previously obtained a resolution of the Senate authorizing them to do so. But if he had gone into voluntary exile, and had given up his Roman franchise by becoming a citizen of Ardea, before a sentence had been passed upon him by the centuries, it was again in the power of the curies alone, he being a patrician, to recall him as a citizen, and otherwise he could not have become a dictator, nor could he have regarded himself as such. It was the time of the dog days when the Gauls came to Rome, and as the summer at Rome is always pestilential, especially during the two months and a half before the first of September, the unavoidable consequence must have been, as Livy relates, that the barbarians, bivouacking on the ruins of the city in the open air, were attacked by disease and carried off like the army of Frederick Barbarossa when encamped before the castle of St. Angelo. The whole army of the Gauls, however, was not in the city, but only as many as were necessary to blockade the garrison of the capital. The rest were scattered far and wide over the face of the country and were ravaging all the unprotected places and isolated farms in Latium. Many an ancient town, which is no longer mentioned after this time, may have been destroyed by the Gauls. None but fortified places like Ostia, which could obtain supplies by sea, made a successful resistance, for the Gauls were unacquainted with the art of besieging. The Ardeatans, whose territory was likewise invaded by the Gauls, opposed them, under the command of Camillus. The Etruscans would seem to have endeavored to avail themselves of the opportunity of recovering Vei, for we are told that the Romans at Vei, commanded by Cadetius, gained a battle against them, and that, encouraged by this success, they began to entertain a hope of regaining Rome, since by this victory they got possession of arms. A Roman of the name of Fabius Dorso is said to have offered up, in broad daylight, a gentilician sacrifice on the Quirinal, and the astonished Gauls are said to have done him no harm, 
a tradition which is not improbable. The provisions in the capital were exhausted, but the Gauls themselves, being seized with epidemic diseases, became tired of their conquests, and were not inclined to settle in a country so far away from their own home. They once more attempted to take the capital by storm, having observed that the messenger from Vei had ascended the rock, and came down again near the Porta Carmentalis, below Araceli. The ancient rock is now covered with rubbish and no longer discernible. The besieged did not think of a storm on that side. It may be that, formerly, there had in that part been a wall, which had become decayed, and in southern countries an abundant vegetation always springs up between the stones. And if this had actually been neglected, it cannot have been very difficult to climb up. The Gauls had already gained a firm footing. As there was no wall at the top, the rock which they stormed was not the Tarpeian, but the Arx. When Manlius, who lived there, was aroused by the screaming of the geese, he came to the spot and thrust down those who were climbing up. This rendered the Gauls still more inclined to commence negotiations. They were, moreover, called back by an inroad of some Alpine tribes into Lombardy, where they left their wives and children. They offered to depart if the Romans would pay them a ransom of a thousand pounds of gold, to be taken, no doubt, from the Capitoline treasury. Considering the value of money at that time, the sum was enormous. In the time of Theodosius, indeed, there were people at Rome who possessed several hundred weight of gold. Nay, one is said to have had an annual revenue of two hundred weight. There can be no doubt that the Gauls received the sum they demanded and quitted Rome. That in weighing it, they scornfully imposed upon the Romans is very possible, and the vae victis, too, may be true. We ourselves have seen similar things before the year 1813, but there can be no truth in the story told by Livy that while they were disputing, Camillus appeared with an army and stopped the proceedings, because the military tribunes had had no right to conclude the treaty. He is there said to have driven the Gauls from the city, and afterward, in a twofold battle, to have so completely defeated them that not even a messenger escaped. Beaufort, inspired by Gaelic patriotism, has most excellently shown what a complete fable this story is. To attempt to disguise the misfortunes of our forefathers, by substituting fables in their place, is mere childishness. This charge does not affect Livy, indeed, for he copied only what others had written before him. But he did not allow his own conviction to appear as he generally does, for he treats the whole of the early history with a sort of irony, half believing, half disbelieving it. According to another account in Diodorus, the Gauls besieged the town allied with Rome. Its name seems to be miswritten, but is probably intended for Vulcini, and the Romans relieved it and took back from the Gauls the gold which they had paid them. But this siege of Vulcini is quite unknown to Livy. A third account in Strabo, and also mentioned by Diodorus, does not allow this honor to the Romans, but states that the Kerites pursued the Gauls, attacked them in the country of the Sabines, and completely annihilated them. In like manner, the Greeks endeavored to disguise the fact that the Gauls took the money from the Delphic treasury, and that, in a quite historical period, Olymp, 120. The true explanation is undoubtedly the one found in Polybius, that the Gauls were induced to quit Rome, 
by an insurrection of the Alpine tribes, after it had experienced the extremity of humiliation. Whatever the enemy had taken as booty was consumed. They had not made any conquests, but only indulged in plunder and devastation. They had been staying at Rome for seven or eight months, and could have gained nothing further than the capital, and the very money which they received without taking that fortress. The account of Polybius throws light upon many discrepant statements, and all of them, not even accepting Livy's fairy tale like embellishment, may be explained by means of it. The Romans attempted to prove that the Gauls had actually been defeated by relating that the gold afterward taken from the Gauls and buried in the capital was double the sum paid to them as ransom. But it is much more probable that the Romans paid their ransom out of the treasury of the temple of the Capitoline Jupiter and of other temples, and that afterward double this sum was made up by a tax, which agrees with a statement in the history of Manlius, that a tax was imposed for the purpose of raising the Gaelic ransom. Surely this could not have been done at the time of the siege, when the Romans were scattered in all parts of the country, but must have taken place afterward, for the purpose of restoring the money that had been taken. Now, if at a later time there actually existed in the capital such a quantity of gold, it is clear that it was believed to be a proof that the Gauls had not kept the gold which was paid to them. Even as late as the time of Cicero and Caesar, the spot was shown at Rome in the Carinae, where the Gauls had heaped up and burned their dead. It was called Busta Gallica, which was corrupted in the Middle Ages into Protogallo. Whence the church which was built there was in reality called St. Andreas in Bustis Gallicis, or, according to the later Latinity, in Busta Gallica, Busta Gallica not being declined. The Gauls departed with their gold, which the Romans had been compelled to pay on account of the famine that prevailed in the capital, which was so great that they pulled the leather from their shields and cooked it, just as was done during the siege of Jerusalem. The Gauls were certainly not destroyed. Justin has preserved the remarkable statement that the same Gauls who sacked Rome went to Apulia, and there offered for money their assistance to the elder Dionysius of Syracuse. From this important statement, it is at any rate clear that they traversed all Italy, and then probably returned along the shore of the Adriatic. Their devastations extended over many parts of Italy, and there is no doubt that the Equians received their death blow at that time, for henceforth we hear no more of the hostilities of the Equians against Rome. Preneste, on the other hand, which must formerly have been subject to the Equians, now appears as an independent town. The Equians, who inhabited small and easily destructible towns, must have been annihilated during the progress of the Gauls. There is nothing so strange in the history of Livy as his view of the consequences of the Gallic calamity. He must have conceived it as a transitory storm by which Rome was humbled but not broken. The army, according to him, was only scattered, and the Romans appear afterward just as they had been before, as if the preceding period had only been an evil dream and as if there had been nothing to do but to rebuild the city. But assuredly the devastation must have been tremendous throughout the Roman territory. For eight months the barbarians had been ravaging the country. Every trace of cultivation, 
every farmer's house, all the temples and public buildings were destroyed. The walls of the city had been purposely pulled down. A large number of its inhabitants were led into slavery. The rest were living in great misery at Vei, and what they had saved scarcely sufficed to buy their bread. In this condition they returned to Rome. Camillus, as dictator, is called a second Romulus, and to him is due the glory of not having despaired in those distressing circumstances. End of section 13Section 14 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Tartar Invasion of China by Meha, B.C. 341. By Demetrius Charles Bulger. The first Chinese are supposed to have been a nomad tribe in the provinces of Shenxi, which lies in the northwest of China, and among them, at last appeared the ruler, Fo He, whose name at least has been preserved. His deeds and his person are mythical, but he is credited with giving his country its first regular institutions. The analysts of the Chinese chronicles place the date of the creation at a point of time two millions of years before Confucius. This interval they filled up with lines of dynasties. Preceding the Chao dynasty, the chronicles give ten epochs. Prior to the eighth of these, there is no authentic history. Yu Chao She, the nest having, taught the people to build huts of the boughs of trees. Fire was discovered by Sai Jin She, the fire producer. Fu He, B.C. 2862, was the discoverer of iron, with Yao Wu, B.C. 2356, is the period whence Confucius begins his history. He says of that epoch, The house door could safely be left open. Yao Wu greatly extended and strengthened the empire, and established fairs and marts over the land. One of China's most notable rulers was Qin Chi Huangti, who was studious in providing for the security of his empire, and with this object began the construction of a fortified wall across the northern frontier to serve as a defense against the troublesome Hyongnu tribes who are identified with the Huns of Attila. This wall, which he began in the first years of his reign, about the close of the 3rd century BC, was finished before his death. It still exists, known as the Great Wall of China, and has long been considered one of the wonders of the world. Every third man of the whole empire was employed on this work. It is said that 500,000 of them died of starvation. The contents of the Great Wall would be enough to build two walls six feet high and two feet thick around the equator. It is the largest artificial structure in the world, carried for 1,400 miles over height and hollow reaching in one place the level of 5,000 feet, nearly one mile above the sea. Earth, gravel, brick, and stone were used in its construction. The weak successors of Huang Ti finally gave way to the usurper, Kao Tzu, who had been originally the ruler of a small town. 
and had borne the name of Liu Pang. The reign of Cao Tzu was distinguished by the consolidation of the empire. The connection of western and eastern China by high walls and bridges, some of which are still in perfect condition, and the institution of an elaborate code of court etiquette. His attention to these things was, however, rudely interrupted by an eruption of the Hyongnu Tartars. The death of Tsin Chi Huang Ti proved the signal for the outbreak of disturbances throughout the realm. Within a few months, five princes had founded as many kingdoms, each hoping, if not to become supreme, at least to remain independent. Meng Tian, beloved by the army and at the head, as he tells us in his own words, of 300,000 soldiers, might have been the arbiter of the empire. But a weak feeling of respect for the imperial authority induced him to obey an order sent by Yul Chi, Huang Ti's son and successor, commanding him to drink the waters of eternal life. Yul Chi's brief reign of three years was a succession of misfortunes, the reins of office were held by the Yunuk Chao Kao, who first murdered the minister Li Sep and then Yul Chi himself. Ying Wang, a grandson of Huang Ti, was the next and last of the Qin emperors. On coming to power, he at once caused Chao Kao, whose crimes had been discovered, to be arrested and executed. This vigorous commencement proved very transitory, for when he had enjoined nominal authority during six weeks, Ying Guang's troops, after a reverse in the field, went over in a body to Li Yu Pang, the leader of the rebel force. Ying Guang put an end to his existence, thus terminating in a manner not less ignominious than any of its predecessors, the dynasty of the Tsins, which Huang Ti had hoped to place permanently on the throne of China, and to which his genius gave a luster far surpassing that of many other families who had enjoyed the same privilege during a much longer period. The crisis in the history of the country had afforded one of those great men, who rise periodically from the ranks of the people, to give law to nations the opportunity for advancing his personal interests, at the same time that he made them appear to be identical with the public will. Of such geniuses, if the test applied be the work accomplished, there have been few with higher claims to respectful and admiring consideration than Li Yu Pang, who, after the fall of the Tsins, became the founder of the Han dynasty under the style of Cao Tzu. Originally the governor of a small town, he had, soon after the death of Huang Ti, gathered round him the nucleus of a formidable army and while nominally serving under one of the greater princes, he scarcely affected to conceal that he was fighting for his own interest. On the other hand, he was no mere soldier of fortune, and the moderation which he showed after victory enhanced his reputation as a general. The path to the throne being thus cleared, the successful general became emperor. His first act was to proclaim an amnesty to all those who had borne arms against him. In a public proclamation, he expressed his regret at the suffering of the people from the evils which follow in the train of war. During the earlier years of his reign, he chose the city of Luoyang as his capital, now the flourishing and populous town of Honan 
but at a later period he removed it to Singan Fu, in the western province of Xianxi. His dynasty became known by the name of the small state where he was born, and which had fallen early in his career into his hands. Cao Tzu sanctioned or personally undertook various important public works, which in many places still exist to testify to the greatness of his character. Prominent among those must be placed the bridges constructed along the great roads of western China. Some of them are still believed to be in perfect condition. No act of Cao Tzu's reign places him higher in the scale of sovereigns than the improvement of the roads and the construction of those remarkable bridges. Cao Tzu loved splendor and sought to make his receptions and banquets imposing by their brilliance. He drew up a special ceremonial, which must have proved a trying ordeal for his courtiers, and dire was the offense if it were infringed in the smallest particular. He kept up festivities at Singan Fu for several weeks, and on one of these occasions he exclaimed, Today I feel I am emperor, and perceive all the difference between a subject and his master. Cao Tzu's attention was rudely summoned away from these trivialities, by the outbreak of revolts against his authority and by inroads on the part of the Tartars. The latter were the more serious. The disturbances that followed Huang Ti's death were a fresh inducement to these clans, to again gather round a common head and prey upon the weakness of China, for Cao Tzu's authority was not yet recognized in many of the tributary states which had been fain to admit the supremacy of the great Qin Emperor. About this time, the Hyongnu Tartars were governed by two chiefs in particular, one named Tonggu, the other Meha, or Mehe. Of these, the former appears to have been instigated by a reckless ambition, or an overweening arrogance, and at first it seemed that the forbearance of Meha would allow his pretensions to pass unchallenged. Meha's successes followed rapidly upon each other. Issuing from the desert and marching in the direction of China, he wrested many fertile districts from the feeble hands of those who held them, and while establishing his personal authority on the banks of the Huang Ho, his lieutenants returned laden with plunder from expeditions into the rich provinces of Shanxi and Shezhuan. He won back all the territory lost by his ancestors to Huang Ti and Mong Tian, and he paved the way to greater success by the siege and capture of the city of Mai Ye, thus obtaining possession of the key of the road to Qinyang. Several of the border chiefs and of the emperor's lieutenants, dreading the punishment allotted to China to want of success, went over to the Tartars, and took service under Meha. The emperor, fully aroused to the gravity of the danger, assembled his army, and placing himself at its head, marched against the Tartars. Encouraged by the result of several preliminary encounters, the emperor was eager to engage Meha's main army, and after some weeks searching and maneuvering, the two forces halted in front of each other. Cao Tzu, imagining that victory was within his grasp, and believing the stories brought to him by spies, of the weakness of the Tartar army, resolved on an immediate attack. He turned a deaf ear to the cautious advice of one of his generals, who warned him that, in war, we should never despise an enemy and marched in person at the head of his advance guard to find the Tartars. Meha, who had been at all these pains to throw dust in the emperor's eyes and to conceal his true strength, 
no sooner saw how well his stratagem had succeeded, and that Kao Tzu was rushing into the trap so elaborately laid for him. Then, by a skillful movement, he cut off his communications with the main body of his army, and, surrounding him with an overwhelming force, compelled him to take refuge in the city of Pingqing in Shanxi. With a very short supply of provisions and hopelessly outnumbered, it looked as if the Chinese emperor could not possibly escape the grasp of the desert chief. In this strait, one of his officers suggested as a last chance that the most beautiful virgin in the town should be discovered and sent as a present to mollify the conqueror. Kao Tzu seized at this suggestion as the drowning man will catch at a straw. And the story is preserved, though her name has passed into oblivion, of how the young Chinese girl entered into the plan and devoted all her wits to charming the Tartar conqueror. She succeeded as much as their fondest hopes could have led them to believe, and Meha permitted Kao Tzu after signing an ignominious treaty, to leave his place of confinement and rejoin his army, glad to welcome the return of the emperor, yet without him helpless to stir a hand to effect his release. Meha retired to his own territory, well satisfied with the material results of the war and the rich booty, which he had obtained in the sack of Chinese cities, while Kao Tzu, like the ordinary type of an oriental ruler, vented his discomfiture on his subordinates. The closing acts of war were the lavishing of rewards on the head of the general to whose warnings he had paid no heed, and the execution of the scouts who had been misled by the wiles of Meha. The success which had attended this incursion and the spoil of war were potent inducements to the Tartars to repeat the invasion. While Kao Tzu was meditating over the possibility of revenge and considering schemes for the better protection of his frontier, the Tartars, disregarding the truce that had been concluded, retraced their steps and pillaged the border districts with impunity. In this year, B.C. 199, they were carrying everything before them, and the emperor, either unnerved by recent disaster or appalled at the apparently irresistible energy of the followers of Meha, remained apathetic in his palace. The representations of his ministers and generals failed to rouse him from his stupor, and the weapon to which he resorted was the abuse of his opponent and not his prompt chastisement. Meha was a wicked and faithless man, who had risen to power by the murder of his father, and one of whom oaths and treaties carried no weight. In the meanwhile, the Tartars were continuing their victorious career. The capital itself could not be pronounced safe from their assaults, or from the insult of their presence. In this crisis, councils of craft and dissimulation alone found favor in the emperor's cabinet. No voice was raised in support of the bold and only true course of going forth to meet the national enemy. The capitulation of Ping Ching had for the time destroyed the manhood of the race, and Kao Tzu held in esteem the advice of men widely different to those who had placed him on the throne. Kao Tzu opened fresh negotiations with Meha, who concluded a treaty on the condition of the emperor's daughter being given to him in marriage, and on the assumption that he was an independent ruler. With these terms, Kao Tzu felt obliged to comply, and thus, for the first time, this never-ceasing collision between the tribes of the desert and the agriculturists of the plains of China closed with the admitted triumph of the former. 
The contest was soon to be renewed, with different results, but the triumph of Meha was beyond question. The weakness thus shown against a foreign foe brought its own punishment in domestic troubles. The palace became the scene of broils, plots, and counterplots, and so badly did Kao Tzu manage his affairs at this epoch that one of his favorite generals raised the standard of revolt against him, through apparently a mere misunderstanding. In this instance, Kao Tzu easily put down the rising, but others followed, which, if not pregnant with danger, were at the least extremely troublesome. The murder of Han Sin, to whose aid Kao Tzu owed his elevation to the throne as much as to any other, by order of the Empress, during a reception at the palace, shook confidence still more in the ruler, and many of his followers were forced into open rebellion through dread of personal danger. What wonder that, as he had said, the very name of revolt inspired Kao Tzu with apprehension. In B.C. 195, we find Kao Tzu going out of his way to visit the tomb of Confucius. Shortly after this event, it became evident that he was approaching his end. His eldest son, Hiao Hoi, was proclaimed heir apparent. Kao Tzu died in the 53rd year of his age, having reigned as emperor during eight years. The close of his reign did not bear out all the promise of its commencement, and the extent of his authority was greatly curtailed by the disastrous effects of the war with the Tartars and the subsequent revolts among his generals. Despite these reverses, there remains much in favor of his character. He had performed his part in the consolidations of the Huns, it remained for those who came after him to complete what he left half-finished. Under Ho E T, the Tartar king Meha sent an envoy to the capital, but either the form or the substance of his message enraged the empress mother, who ordered his execution. The two peoples were thus again brought to the brink of war, but eventually the difference was sunk for the time and the Chinese chroniclers have represented that the satisfactory turn in the question was due to Meha saying the error of his ways. Not long afterward, the Tartar king died, and was succeeded by his son, Lao Chang. Meha's letter of excuse is thus given. In the barbarous country which I govern, both virtue and the decencies of life are unknown. I have been unable to free myself from them, and therefore I blush. China has her wise men. That is a happiness which I envy. They would have prevented my being wanting in the respect due to your rank. End of section 14 Section 15 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Mike Botez The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2 Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Alexander reduces Tyre, later founds Alexandria. B.C. 332 by Oliver Goldsmith. The master spirit, who could sigh for more worlds to conquer, was at this time high in his dazzling flight. Alexander has always been considered one of the most striking and picturesque characters of history. His personality was pleasing, his endurance remarkable, 
and courage dauntless. Educated by Aristotle, his keen mind was well trained. He was skilled in horsemanship, and his control over the fiery Bucephalus, untamable by others, has become a household tale in all lands. There never was a more kingly prince. A king at twenty, his career has been an object of wonder to succeeding generations. He shot like a meteor across the sky of ancient civilizations. His military achievements were remarkable for quickness of conception and rapidity of execution. His life was a progress from conquest to conquest. Alexander's army, with its solid phalanx, its darting cavalry and light troops, had become irresistible. He possessed Napoleon's ability to select good generals and to make the most of his talents. In battle, Alexander was entirely devoid of fear. After a victory, his chief thoughts were for the wounded. Like Napoleon, he also possessed that personal equation of absolute popularity with his soldiers. Their devotion to him was simply complete. After Thebes came the invasion of Asia. The invincible Macedonian had fought and won the Battle of Granicus. In this battle, nearly all of the Persian leaders were slain, and its result spread terror throughout Persia. Halicarnassus was next reduced. The march of Alexander was ever onward. In the citadel of Gordium, he cut the Gordian knot, and prophecy marked him for the lord of Asia. And now Darius marched to meet him, making a fatally bad choice of battleground. Darius was totally defeated at the celebrated Battle of Issus, although he anticipated a victory. After the Persian rout and the flight of Darius, whose numbers counted for nothing before the Macedonians' skill, Lyndon welcomed the invaders, and Alexander determined to take Tyre. This was accomplished after a siege, which was attended with much cruelty. The siege of Gaza followed, in which nearly all of the citizens perished. In B.C. 332, Alexander began his expedition to Egypt. He conciliated the natives by paying honors to their gods. In his progress, he was struck by the advantages of a certain site for a city, and founded there the town which is now called Alexandria. All Phoenicia was subdued, except Tyre, the capital city. The city was justly entitled the Queen of the Sea, that element bringing to it the tribute of all nations. She boasted of having first invented navigation, and taught mankind the art of braving the winds and waves by the assistance of a frail bark. The happy situation of Tyre at the upper end of the Mediterranean, the conveniency of its ports, which are both safe and capacious, and the character of its inhabitants, who were industrious, laborious, patient, and extremely courteous to strangers, invited thither merchants from all parts of the globe, so that it might be considered not so much a city belonging to any particular nation, as the common city of all nations and the center of their commerce. Alexander thought it necessary, both for his glory and his interest, to take this city. The spring was now coming on. Tyre was at that time seated on an island of the sea, about a quarter of a league from the continent. It was surrounded by a strong wall, a hundred and fifty feet high, which the waves of the sea washed. And the Carthaginians, a colony from Tyre, a mighty people, and sovereigns of the ocean, promised to come to the assistance of their parent state. 
Encouraged, therefore, by these favorable circumstances, the Tyrians determined not to surrender, but to hold out the place to the last extremity. This resolution, however imprudent, was certainly magnanimous, but it was soon after followed by an act which was as blamable as the other was praiseworthy. Alexander was desirous of gaining the place rather by treaty than by force of arms, and with this in view sent heralds into the town with offers of peace. But the inhabitants were so far from listening to his proposals or endeavoring to avert his resentment by any kind of concession that they actually killed his ambassadors and threw their bodies from the top of the walls into the sea. It is easy to imagine what effect so shocking an outrage must produce in a mind like Alexander's. He instantly resolved to besiege the place, and not to desist until he had made himself master of it, and raised it to the ground. As Tyre was divided from the continent by an arm of the sea, there was necessity for filling up the intermediate space with a bank or pier, before the place could be closely invested. This work, accordingly, was immediately undertaken, and in a great measure completed, when all the wood of which it was principally composed was unexpectedly burned by means of a fire ship sent him by the enemy. The damage, however, was very soon repaired, and the mole rendered more perfect than formerly, and carried nearer to the town, when all of a sudden a furious tempest arose, which, undermining the stonework that supported the wood, laid the hole at once in the bottom of the sea. Two such disasters following so closely on the heels of each other would have cooled the ardor of any man except Alexander, but nothing could daunt his invincible spirit or make him relinquish an enterprise he had once undertaken. He therefore resolved to prosecute the siege, and in order to encourage his men to second his views, he took care to inspire them with the belief that heaven was on their side, and would soon crown their labor with a wished-for success. At one time he gave out that Apollo was about to abandon the Tyrians to their doom, and that, to prevent his flight, they had bound him to his pedestal with a golden chain. At another he pretended that Hercules, the tutelar deity of Macedon, had appeared to him, and having opened prospects of the most glorious kind, had invited him to proceed to take possession of Tyre. These favorable circumstances were announced by the augurs as intimations from above, and every heart was in consequence cheered. The soldiers, as if that moment arrived before the city, forgetting all the toils they had undergone, and the disappointments they had suffered, began to raise a new mole, at which they worked incessantly. To protect them from being annoyed by the ships of the enemy, Alexander fitted out a fleet, with which he not only secured his own men, but offered the Tyrians battle, which, however, they thought proper to decline, and withdrew all their galleys into the harbor. The besiegers, now allowed to proceed unmolested, went on with the work with the utmost vigor, and in a little time completed it and brought it close to the walls. A general attack was therefore resolved on, both by sea and land, and with this in view, the king, having manned his galleys and joined them together with strong cables, ordered them to approach the walls about midnight and attack the city with resolution. But just as the assault was going to begin, a dreadful storm arose, which not only shook the ships asunder, 
but even shattered them in a terrible manner, so that they were all obliged to be towed toward the shore, without having made the least impression on the city. The Tyrians were elated with this gleam of good fortune, but that joy was of short duration, for in a little time they have received intelligence from Carthage that they must expect no assistance from that quarter, as the Carthaginians themselves were then overawed by a powerful army of Syracusans who had invaded their country. Reduced, therefore, to the hard necessity of depending entirely upon their own strength and their own resources, the Tyrians sent all their women and children to Carthage, and prepared to encounter the very last extremities, for now the enemy was attacking the place with greater spirit and activity than ever. And, to do the Tyrians justice, it must be acknowledged that they employed a number of methods of defense, which, considering the rude state of the art of war at that early period, were really astonishing. They warded off the darts discharged from the balusters against them by the assistance of turning wheels, which either broke them to pieces or carried them another way. They deadened the violence of the stones that were hurled at them by setting up sails and curtains made of a soft substance which easily gave way. To annoy the ships which advanced against their walls, they fixed grappling irons and scythes to joists or beams, then straining their catapultas, an enormous kind of crossbow, they laid those great pieces of timber upon them instead of arrows, and shot them off on a sudden at the enemy. These crushed some of their ships by their great weight, and by the means of the hooks or hanging scythes tore others to pieces. They also had brazen shields, which they drew red-hot out of the fire, and filling these with burning sand hurled them in an instant from the top of the wall upon the enemy. There was nothing the Macedonians dreaded so much as this fatal instrument, for the moment the burning sand got to the flesh through the crevices of the armor, it penetrated to the very bone, and stuck so close that there was no pulling it off, so that the soldiers throwing down their arms and tearing their clothes to pieces, were in this manner exposed, naked and defenseless, to the shot of the enemy. Alexander, finding the resources and even the courage of the Tyrians increased in proportion as the siege continued, resolved to make a last effort and attack them at once, both by sea and land, in order, if possible, to overwhelm them with the multiplicity of dangers to which they would be thus exposed. With this view, having managed his galleys with some of the bravest of his troops, he commanded them to advance against the enemy's fleet, while he himself took his post at the head of his men on the mole. And now the attack began on all sides with irresistible and unremitting fury. Wherever the battering rams had beat down any part of the wall, and the bridges were thrown out, instantly the Argiraspides mounted the bridge with the utmost valor, being led by Admetus, one of the bravest officers in the army, who was killed by the thrust of a spear as he was encouraging his soldiers. The presence of the king and the example he set fired his troops with unusual bravery. He himself ascended one of the towers on the mole, which was of a prodigious height, and there was exposed to the greatest dangers he had ever yet encountered, for being immediately known by his insignia and the richness of his armor, he served as a mark for all the arrows of the enemy. 
On this occasion, he performed wonders, killing with javelins several of those who defended the wall. Then, advancing nearer to them, he forced some with his sword, and others with his shield, either into the city or the sea, the tower on which he fought almost touching the wall. He soon ascended the wall, followed by his principal officers, and possessed himself of two towers and the space between them. The battering rams had already made several breaches. The fleet had forced its way into the harbor, and some of the Macedonians had possessed themselves of the towers which were abandoned. The Tyrians, seeing the enemy, masters of their rampart, retired toward an open place called Agenor, and there stood their ground. But Alexander, marching up with his regiment of bodyguards, killed part of them and obliged the rest to fly. At the same time, Tyre being taken on that side which lay toward the harbor, a general carnage of the citizens ensued, and none was spared, except the few that fell into the hands of the Cyclonians in Alexander's army, who, considering the Tyrians as countrymen, granted them protection and carried them privately on board their ships. The number that was slaughtered on this occasion is almost incredible. Even after conquest, the victor's resentment did not subside. He ordered no less than 5,000 men who were taken in the storming to be nailed to crosses along the shore. The number of prisoners amounted to 30,000 and were all sold as slaves in different parts of the world. Thus fell Tyre, that had been for many ages the most flourishing city in the world, and had spread the arts and commerce into the remotest regions. While Alexander was employed in the siege of Tyre, he received a second letter from Darius, in which that monarch treated him with greater respect than before. He now gave him the title of king, he offered him ten thousand talents as a ransom for his captive mother and queen, and he promised him his daughter Statira in marriage, with all the country he had conquered, as far as the river Euphrates, provided he would agree to a peace. These terms were so advantageous that, when the king debated upon them in council, Parmenio, one of his generals, could not help observing that he would certainly accept of them were he Alexander. And so would I, replied the king, were I Parmenio. But deeming it inconsistent with his dignity to listen to any proposal from a man whom he had so lately overcome, he haughtily rejected them and scorned to accept of that as a favor which he already considered his own by conquest. From Tyre, Alexander marched to Jerusalem, fully determined to punish that city for having refused to supply his army with provisions during the siege. But his resentment was mollified by a deputation of the citizens coming out to meet him with their high priest, Tadua, before them, dressed in white and having a mitre on his head, on the front of which the name of God was written. The moment the king perceived the high priest, he advanced toward him with an air of the most profound respect, bowed his body, adored the august name upon his front, and saluted him, who wore it with religious veneration. And when some of his courtiers expressed their surprise that he, who was adored by everyone, should adore the high priest of the Jews, I do not, said he, adore the high priest, but the God whose minister he is, for while I was at Dium in Macedonia, my mind wholly fixed on the great design of the Persian war, as I was revolving the methods how to conquer Asia, this very man, dressed in the same robes, appeared to me in a dream, 
exhorted me to banish my fear, bade me cross the Hellespont boldly, and assured me that God would march at the head of my army and give me the victory over the Persians. This speech, delivered with an air of sincerity, no doubt, had its effect in encouraging the army and establishing an opinion that his mission was from heaven. From Jerusalem he went to Gaza, where, having met with a more obstinate resistance than he expected, he cut to pieces the whole garrison, consisting of ten thousand men. Not satisfied with this act of cruelty, he caused holes to be bored through the hills of Boetes, the governor, and tying him with cords to the back of his chariot, dragged him in this manner around the walls of the city. This he did in imitation of Achilles, whom Homer describes of having dragged Hector around the walls of Troy in the same manner. It was reading the past to very little, or rather, indeed, to very bad purpose, to imitate this hero in the most unworthy part of his character. Alexander, having left the garrison in Gaza, turned his arms toward Egypt, of which he made himself master without opposition. Here he formed the design of visiting the temple of Jupiter, which was situated in the sandy deserts of Libya, at the distance of twelve days' journey from Memphis, the capital of Egypt. His chief object in going thither was to get himself acknowledged the son of Jupiter, an honor he had long aspired to. In this journey he founded the city of Alexandria, which soon became one of the greatest towns in the world for commerce. Nothing could be more dreary than the desert through which he passed, nor anything more charming, according to the fabulous accounts of the poets, than the particular spot where the temple was situated. It was a perfect paradise in the midst of an immeasurable wilderness, at last, having reached the place and appeared before the altar of the deity, the priest, who was no stranger to Alexander's wishes, declared him to be the son of Jupiter. The conqueror, elated with this high compliment, asked whether he should have success in his expedition. The priest answered that he should be the monarch of the world. The conqueror inquired if his father's murderers were punished. The priest replied that his father, Jupiter, was immortal, but that the murderers of Philip had all been extirpated. End of section 15、section、16 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. The Battle of Arbella. B.C. 331 by Sir Edward Shepherd Creasy Part 1 When Alexander, having returned from his campaign against the barbarians of the north, had suppressed the revolt which meanwhile had broken out in Greece, he found himself free for undertaking those great foreign conquests which he had planned. When he left Greece to conquer the world, he said farewell to his own country forever. Crossing the Hellespont into Asia Minor, with a small but well-equipped and disciplined army, he advanced unopposed until he reached the river Granicus, where he found himself confronted with a Persian host. Upon this army he inflicted a defeat, so signal as to bring at once to submission nearly the whole of Asia Minor. He next advanced into Syria and met the Persian king 
Darius III, who in person commanded an immense body of soldiers, against which the young conqueror fought at Issus, winning a decisive victory. He not only captured the Persian camp, but also secured the king's treasures and took his family prisoners. From this time, Alexander held complete mastery of the western dominions of Darius, whom the conqueror afterward dethroned. After he had next invaded and subjugated Egypt, and there founded the city of Alexandria, he pursued King Darius, who had taken flight into the very heart of his empire, where the Persian monarch on the plains of Gugamela, near the village of Arbela, made his last stand against his invincible foe. Of the battle to which Arbela gave its name, and which proved the death blow of the Persian Empire, Chris's narrative furnishes a realistic description. A long and uninstructive list might be made out of illustrious men whose characters have been vindicated during recent times from aspersions which for centuries had been thrown on them. The spirit of modern inquiry and the tendency of modern scholarship, both of which are often said to be solely negative and destructive, have in truth restored to splendor and almost created anew far more than they have assailed with censure or dismissed from consideration as unreal. The truth of many a brilliant narrative of brilliant exploits has of late years been triumphantly demonstrated, and the shallowness of the skeptical scoffs with which little minds have carped at the great minds of antiquity has been in many instances decisively exposed. The laws, the politics, and the lines of action adopted or recommended by eminent men and powerful nations have been examined with keener investigation and considered with more comprehensive judgment than formerly were brought to bear on these subjects. The result has been at least as often favorable as unfavorable to the persons and the states so scrutinized, and many an oft-repeated slander against both measures and men has thus been silenced, we may hope, forever. The veracity of Herodotus, the pure patriotism of Pericles, of Demosthenes, and of the Gracchi, the wisdom of Cleisthenes and of Licinius as constitutional reformers, may be mentioned as facts which recent writers have cleared from unjust suspicion and censure. And it might be easily shown that the defensive tendency which distinguishes the present and recent great writers of Germany, France, and England, has been equally manifested in the spirit in which they have treated the heroes of thought and heroes of action, who lived during what we term the Middle Ages, and whom it was so long the fashion to sneer at or neglect. The name of the victor of Arbella has led to these reflections. For, although the rapidity and extent of Alexander's conquests have through all ages challenged admiration and amazement, the grandeur of genius which he displayed in his schemes of commerce, civilization, and a comprehensive union and unity among nations has until lately been comparatively unhonored this long-continued depreciation was of early date. The ancient rhetoricians, a class of bubblers, a school for lies and scandal, as Nibur justly termed them, chose among the stock themes for their commonplaces the character and exploits of Alexander. They had their followers in every age and, until a very recent period, all who wished to point a moral or adorn a tale 
about unreasoning ambition, extravagant pride, and the formidable frenzies of free will, when leagued with free power, have never failed to blazon forth the so-called madman of Macedonia as one of the most glaring examples. Without doubt, many of these writers adopted with implicit credence traditional ideas and supposed with uninquiring philanthropy that in blackening Alexander they were doing humanity good service. But also, without doubt, many of his assailants, like those of other great men, have been mainly instigated by that strongest of all antipathies, the antipathy of a second-rate mind to a first-rate one, and by the envy which talent, too, often bears to genius. Arian, who wrote his history of Alexander when Hadrian was emperor of the Roman world, and when the spirit of declamation and dogmatism was at its full height, but who was himself, unlike the dreaming pedants of the schools, a statesman and a soldier of practical and proved ability, well rebuked the malevolent aspersions which he heard continually thrown upon the memory of the great conqueror of the East. He truly says, Let the man who speaks evil of Alexander not merely bring forward those passages of Alexander's life which were really evil, but let him collect and review all the actions of Alexander, and then let him thoroughly consider first who and what manner of a man he himself is, and what has been his own career, and then let him consider who and what manner of a man Alexander was, and to what an eminence of human grandeur he arrived. Let him consider that Alexander was a king, and the undisputed lord of the two continents, and that his name is renowned throughout the whole earth. Let the evil speaker against Alexander bear all this in mind, and then let him reflect on his own insignificance, the pettiness of his own circumstances and affairs, and the blunders that he makes about these, paltry and trifling as they are. Let him then ask himself whether he is a fit person to censure and revile such a man as Alexander. I believe that there was in his time no nation of men, no city, nay, no single individual with whom Alexander's name had not become a familiar word. I therefore hold that such a man, who was like no ordinary mortal, was not born into the world without some special providence, and one of the most distinguished soldiers and writers, Sir Walter Raleigh, though he failed to estimate justly the full merits of Alexander, has expressed his sense of grandeur of the part played in the world by the great Emathian conqueror in language that well deserves quotation. So much hath the spirit of some one man excelled as it hath undertaken and effected the alteration of the great estates and commonwealths, the erection of monarchies, the conquest of kingdoms and empires, guided handful of men against multitudes of equal bodily strength, contrived victories beyond all hope and discourse of reason, converted the fearful passions of his own followers into magnanimity, and the valor of his enemies into cowardice. Such spirits have been stirred up in sundry ages of the world, and in diverse parts thereof to erect and cast down again, to establish and to destroy, and to bring all things, persons, and states, to the same certain ends which the infinite spirit of the universal, piercing, moving, and governing all things, hath ordained. Certainly the things that this king did were marvelous, and would hardly have been undertaken by anyone else. And though his father had determined to have invaded the lesser Asia, it is like enough 
that he would have contented himself with some part thereof, and not have discovered the river of Indus as this man did. A higher authority than either Arian or Raleigh may now be referred to by those who wish to know the real merit of Alexander as a general, and how far the commonplace assertions are true that his successes were the mere result of fortunate rashness and unreasoning pugnacity. Napoleon selected Alexander as one of the seven greatest generals, whose noble deeds history has handed down to us, and from the study of whose campaigns the principles of war are to be learned. The Critique of the Greatest Conqueror of Modern Times on the military career of the great conqueror of the world world is no less graphic than true. Alexander crossed the Dardanelles, B.C. 334, with an army of about 40,000 men, of which one-eighth was cavalry. He forced the passage of the Granicus in opposition to an army under Memnon, the Greek, who commanded for Darius on the coast of Asia, and he spent the whole of the year 333 in establishing his power in Asia Minor. He was seconded by the Greek colonies, who dwelt on the borders of the Black Sea and on the Mediterranean, and in Sardis, Ephesus, Tarsus, Miletus, etc. The kings of Persia left their provinces and towns to be governed according to their own particular laws. Their empire was a union of confederate states and did not form one nation. This facilitated its conquest. As Alexander only wished for the throne of the monarch, he easily effected the change by respecting the customs, manners, and laws of the people, who experienced no change in their condition. In the year 332, he met with Darius at the head of 60,000 men, who had taken up a position near Tarsus on the banks of the Isus, in the province of Cilicia. He defeated him, entered Syria, took Damascus, which contained all the riches of the great king, and laid siege to Tyre. This superb metropolis of the commerce of the world detained him nine months. He took Gaza after a siege of two months, crossed the desert in seven days, entered Pelusium and Memphis, and founded Alexandria. In less than two years, after two battles and four or five sieges, the coasts of the Black Sea from Phasis to Byzantium, those of the Mediterranean as far as Alexandria, all Asia Minor, Syria and Egypt, had submitted to his arms. In 331 he repassed the desert, encamped in Tyre, recrossed Syria, entered Damascus, passed the Euphrates and Tigris, and defeated Darius on the field of Arbela, when he was at the head of a still stronger army than that which he commanded on the Issus, and Babylon opened her gates to him. In 330 he overran Susa and took that city, Persepolis and Pasargada, which contained the tomb of Cyrus. In 329 he directed his course northward, entered Egbatana and extended his conquests to the coasts of the Caspian, punished Bessus, the cowardly assassin of Darius, penetrated into Scythia and subdued the Scythians. In 328 he forced the passage of the Oxus, received 16,000 recruits from Macedonia and reduced the neighboring people to subjection. In 327 he crossed the Indus, vanquished Porus in a pitched battle, took him prisoner and treated him as a king. He contemplated passing the Ganges, but his army refused. 
He sailed down the Indus in the year 326 with 800 vessels. Having arrived at the ocean, he sent Nearchus with a fleet to run along the coasts of the Indian Ocean and the Persian Gulf, as far as the mouth of the Euphrates. In 325, he took 60 days in crossing from Gedrosia, entered Keramania, returned to Pasargada, Persepolis, and Susa, and married Satira, the daughter of Darius. In 324, he marched once more to the north, past Ekatana, and terminated his career at Babylon. The enduring importance of Alexander's conquests is to be estimated not by the duration of his own life and empire, or even by the duration of the kingdoms which his generals, after his death, formed out of the fragments of that mighty dominion. In every region of the world that he traversed, Alexander planted Greek settlements and founded cities in the populations of which the Greek element at once asserted its predominance. Among his successors, the Seleucidae and the Ptolemies imitated their great captain in blending schemes of civilization, of commercial intercourse, and of literary and scientific research, with all their enterprises of military aggrandizement and with all their systems of civil administration. Such was the ascendancy of the Greek genius, so wonderfully comprehensive and assimilating was the cultivation which it introduced, that within thirty years after Alexander crossed the Hellespont, the Greek language was spoken in every country from the shores of the Aegean, to the Indus, and also throughout Egypt, not indeed wholly to the extirpation of the native dialects, but it became the language of every court, of all literature, of every judicial and political function, and formed a medium of communication among the many myriads of mankind inhabiting these large portions of the old world. Throughout Asia Minor, Syria, and Egypt, the Hellenic character that was thus imparted remained in full vigor down to the time of the Mohammedan conquests. The infinite value of this to humanity, in the highest and holiest point of view, has often been pointed out, and the workings of the finger of providence have been gratefully recognized by those who have observed how the early growth and progress of Christianity were aided by the diffusion of the Greek language and civilization throughout Asia Minor, Syria and Egypt, which had been caused by the Macedonian conquests of the East. In Upper Asia, beyond the Euphrates, the direct and material influence of Greek ascendancy was more short-lived. Yet, during the existence of the Hellenic kingdoms in these regions, especially of the Greek kingdom of Bactria, the modern Bokhara, very important effects were produced on the intellectual tendencies and tastes of the inhabitants of those countries and the adjacent ones, by the animating contact of the Grecian spirit. Much of Hindu science and philosophy, much of the literature of the later Persian kingdom of the Arsacidae, either originated from or was largely modified by Grecian influences. So also the learning and science of the Arabians were in a far less degree the result of original invention and genius, then the reproduction in an altered form of the Greek philosophy and the Greek lore, acquired by the Saracenic conquerors, together with their acquisition of the provinces which Alexander has subjugated, nearly a thousand years before the armed disciples of Mohammed commenced their career in the East. It is well known that Western Europe in the Middle Ages drew its philosophy, its arts, and its science principally from Arabian teachers. 
And thus, we see how the intellectual influence of ancient Greece poured on the Eastern world by Alexander's victories, and then brought back to bear on medieval Europe by the spread of the Saracenic powers, has exerted its action on the elements of modern civilization by this powerful though indirect channel, as well as by the more obvious effects of the remnants of classic civilization which survived in Italy, Gaul, Britain and Spain after the eruption of the Germanic nations. These considerations invest the Macedonian triumphs in the East with never-dying interest, such as the most showy and sanguinary successes of mere low ambition and the pride of kings however they may dazzle for a moment, can never retain with posterity. Whether the old Persian empire which Cyrus founded could have survived much longer than it did, even if Darius had been victorious at Arbella, may safely be disputed. That ancient dominion, like the Turkish at the present time, labored under every cause of decay and dissolution. The satraps, like the modern pashas, continually rebelled against the central power, and Egypt in particular was almost always in a state of insurrection against its nominal sovereign. There was no longer any effective central control or any internal principle of unity fused through the huge mass of the empire and binding it together. Persia was evidently about to fall. But had it not been for Alexander's invasion of Asia, she would most probably have fallen beneath some other oriental power, as Media and Babylon had formerly fallen before herself, and as in after times the Parthian supremacy gave way to the revived ascendancy of Persia in the east under the scepters of the Arsacidae a revolution that merely substituted one eastern power for another, would have been utterly barren and unprofitable to mankind. Alexander's victory at Arabella not only overthrew an oriental dynasty, but established European rules in its stead. It broke the monotony of the eastern world by the impression of western energy and superior civilization even as England's present mission is to break up the mental and moral stagnation of India and Cathay by pouring upon and through them the impulsive current of Anglo-Saxon commerce and conquest. Arbella, the city which has furnished its name to the decisive battle which gave Asia to Alexander, lies more than twenty miles from the actual scene of conflict. The little village, then named Gagamela, is close to the spot where the armies met, but has ceded the honor of naming the battle to its more euphonious neighbor. Gagamela is situated in one of the wide plains that lie between the Tigris and the mountains of Kurdistan. A few undulating hillocks diversify the surface of this sandy tract but the ground is generally level and admirably qualified for the evolution of cavalry, and also calculated to give the larger of two armies the full advantage of numerical superiority. The Persian king, who before he came to the throne, had proved his personal valor as a soldier and his skill as a general, had wisely selected this region for the third and decisive encounter between his forces and the invader. The previous defeat of his troops, however severe they had been, were not looked on as irreparable. The Granicus had been fought by his generals rashly and without mutual concert, and though Darius himself had commanded and been beaten at Issus, that defeat might be attributed to the disadvantageous nature of the ground, where, cooped up between the mountains, the river, and the sea, the numbers of the Persians confused and clogged alike the general's skill and the soldier's prowess, and their very strength had been made their weakness. 
Here, on the broad plains of Kurdistan, there was scope for Asia's largest host to array its lines, to will, to skirmish, to condense or expand its squadrons, to maneuver, and to charge at will. Should Alexander and his scanty band dare to plunge into that living sea of war, their destruction seemed inevitable. Darius felt, however, the critical nature to himself, as well as to his adversary, of the coming encounter. He could not hope to retrieve the consequences of a third overthrow. The great cities of Mesopotamia and Upper Asia, the central provinces of the Persian Empire, were certain to be at the mercy of the victor. Darius knew also the Asiatic character well enough to be aware how it yields to prestige of success and the apparent career of destiny. He felt that the diadem was now either to be firmly replaced on his own brow or to be irrevocably transferred to the head of his European conqueror. He therefore, during the long interval left him after the Battle of Issus, while Alexander was subjugating Syria and Egypt, assiduously busied himself in selecting the best troops which his vast empire supplied, and in training his varied forces to act together with some uniformity of discipline and system. The hardy mountaineers of Afghanistan, Bokhara, Kiva, and Tibet were then, as at present, far different from the generality of Asiatics in warlike spirit and endurance. From these districts Darius collected large bodies of admirable infantry, and the countries of the modern Kurds and Turkomans supplied as they do now squadrons of horsemen, hardy, skillful, bold, and trained to a life of constant activity and warfare. It is not uninteresting to notice that the ancestors of our own late enemies, the Sikhs, served as allies of Darius against the Macedonians. They are spoken of in Arian as Indians who dwelt near Bactria, they were attached to the troops of that satrapy, and their cavalry was one of the most formidable forces in the whole Persian army. Besides these picked troops, contingents also came in from the numerous other provinces that yet obeyed the great king. Altogether, the horse are said to have been forty thousand, the scythe bearing chariots two hundred, and the armed elephants, fifteen in number. The amount of the infantry is uncertain, but the knowledge which both ancient and modern times supply of the usual character of oriental armies and of their populations of camp followers may warrant us in believing that many myriads were prepared to fight or to encumber those who fought for the last Darius. The position of the Persian king near Mesopotamia was chosen with great military skill. It was certain that Alexander, on his return from Egypt, must march northward along the Syrian coast before he attacked the central provinces of the Persian Empire. A direct eastward march from the lower part of Palestine across the great Syrian desert was then, as ever, utterly impracticable. Marching eastward from Syria, Alexander would, on crossing the Euphrates, arrive at the vast Mesopotamian plains. The wealthy capitals of the empire, Babylon, Susa, and Persepolis, would then lie to the south, and if he marched down through Mesopotamia to attack them, Darius might reasonably hope to follow the Macedonians with his immense force of cavalry, and, without even risking a pitched battle, to harass and finally overwhelm them. We may remember that three centuries afterward, 
a Roman army under Crassus was thus actually destroyed by the Oriental archers and horsemen in these very plains, and that the ancestors of the Parthians who thus vanquished the Roman legions served by thousands under King Darius. If, on the contrary, Alexander should defer his march against Babylon and first seek an encounter with the Persian army, the country on each side of the Tigris in this latitude was highly advantageous for such an army as Darius commanded, and he had closed in his rear the mountainous districts of northern Media, where he himself had in early life been satrap, where he had acquired reputation as a soldier and a general, and where he justly expected to find loyalty to his person, and a safe refuge in case of defeat. His great antagonist came on across the Euphrates against him, at the head of an army which Arian, copying from the journals of Macedonian officers, states to have consisted of 40,000 foot and 7,000 horse. In studying the campaigns of Alexander, we possess the peculiar advantage of deriving our information from two of Alexander's generals of division, who bore an important part in all his enterprises. Aristobulus and Ptolemy, who afterward became king of Egypt, kept regular journals of the military events which they witnessed and these journals were in the possession of Arian when he drew up his history of Alexander's expedition. The high character of Arian for integrity makes us confident that he used them fairly, and his comments on the occasional discrepancies between the two Macedonian narratives prove that he used them sensibly. He frequently quotes the very words of his authorities, and his history thus acquires a charm such as very few ancient or modern military narratives possess. The anecdotes and expressions which he records we fairly believe to be genuine, and not to be the coinage of a rhetorician like those in Curtius. In fact, in reading Arian, we read General Aristobulus and General Ptolemy on the campaigns of the Macedonians, and it is like reading General Jomini or General Foy on the campaigns of the French. The estimate which we find in Arian of the strength of Alexander's army seems reasonable enough when we take into account both the losses which he had sustained and the reinforcements which he had received since he left Europe. Indeed, to Englishmen who know with what a mere handful of men our own generals have at Plassey, at Asai, at Meani, and other Indian battles, routed large hosts of Asiatics, the disparity of numbers that we read of in the victories won by the Macedonians over the Persians presents nothing incredible. The army which Alexander now led was wholly composed of veteran troops in the highest possible state of equipment and discipline, enthusiastically devoted to their leader and full of confidence in his military genius and his victorious destiny. The celebrated Macedonian phalanx formed the main strength of his infantry. This force had been raised and organized by his father Philip, who, on his accession to the Macedonian throne, needed a numerous and quickly formed army, and who, by lengthening the spear of the ordinary Greek phalanx and increasing the depth of the files, brought the tactics of armed masses to the highest extent of which it was capable with such materials as he possessed. He formed his men sixteen deep, and placed in their grasp the sarissa, as the Macedonian pike is called, which was four and twenty feet in length, and when couched for action, 
reached 18 feet in front of the soldier, so that a space of about 2 feet was allowed between the ranks. The spears of five files behind him projected in front of each front rank man. The phalangite soldier was fully equipped in the defensive armor of the regular Greek infantry. And thus the phalanx presented a ponderous and bristling mass, which, as long as its order was kept compact, was sure to bear down all opposition. The defects of such an organization are obvious, and were proved in after years, when the Macedonians were opposed to the Roman legions. But it is clear that under Alexander, the phalanx was not the cumbrous, unwieldy body which it was at Sinocephate and Pydna. His men were veterans, and he could obtain from them an accuracy of movement and steadiness of evolution, such as probably the recruits of his father would only have floundered in attempting, and such as certainly were impracticable in the phalanx when handled by his successors, especially as under them it ceased to be a standing force, and became only a militia, End of section 16。section 17 of the great events by famous historians, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2 Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd The Battle of Arbella, B.C. 331 By Sir Edward Shepherd Creasy Part 2 Under Alexander the Phalanx consisted of an aggregate of 18,000 men who were divided into six brigades of 3,000 each. These were again subdivided into regiments and companies, and the men were carefully trained to wheel, to face about, to take more ground, or to close up, as the emergencies of the battle required. Alexander also arrayed troops armed in a different manner, in the intervals of the regiments of his phalangites, who could prevent their line from being pierced and their companies taken in flank, when the nature of the ground prevented a close formation, and who could be withdrawn when a favorable opportunity arrived for closing up the phalanx or any of his brigades for a charge, or when it was necessary to prepare to receive cavalry, Besides the phalanx, Alexander had a considerable force of infantry who were called shield-bearers. They were not so heavily armed as the phalangites, or as was the case with the Greek regular infantry in general, but they were equipped for close fight as well as for skirmishing, and were far superior to the ordinary irregular troops of Greek warfare. They were about 6,000 strong. Besides these, he had several bodies of Greek regular infantry, and he had archers, slingers, and javelin men, who fought also with broadsword and target, and who were principally supplied him by the highlanders of Illyria and Thracia. The main strength of his cavalry consisted in two chosen regiments of cuirassiers, one Macedonian and one Thessalian, each of which was about 1,500 strong. They were provided with long lances and heavy swords, and horse, as well as man was fully equipped with defensive armor. Other regiments of regular cavalry were less heavily armed, and there were several bodies of light horsemen, whom Alexander's conquests in Egypt and Syria had enabled him to mount superbly. 
A little before the end of August, Alexander crossed the Euphrates at Thapsacus. A small corps of Persian cavalry under Mazeus retiring before him. Alexander was too prudent to march down through the Mesopotamian deserts and continued to advance eastward with the intention of passing the Tigris, and then, if he was unable to find Darius and bring him to action, of marching southward on the left side of that river along the skirts of a mountainous district where his men would suffer less from heat and thirst and where provisions would be more abundant. Darius, finding that his adversary was not being enticed into the march through Mesopotamia against his capital, determined to remain on the battleground which he had chosen on the left of the Tigris, where, if his enemy met a defeat or a check, the destruction of the invaders would be certain. With two such rivers as the Euphrates and the Tigris in their rear, the Persian king availed himself to the utmost of every advantage in his power. He caused a large space of ground to be carefully leveled for the operation of his scythe-armed chariots, and he deposited his military stores in the strong town of Arbella, about twenty miles in his rear. The rhetoricians of after ages have loved to describe Darius Codomanus as a second Xerxes in ostentation and imbecility, but a fair examination of his generalship in this his last campaign shows that he was worthy of bearing the same name as his great predecessor, the royal son of Histaspes. On learning that Darius was with a large army on the left of the Tigris, Alexander hurried forward and crossed that river without opposition. He was at first unable to procure any certain intelligence of the precise position of the enemy, and after giving his army a short interval of rest, he marched for four days down the left bank of the river. A moralist may pause upon the fact that Alexander must in this march have passed within a few miles of the ruins of Nineveh, the great city of the primeval conquerors of the human race. Neither the Macedonian king nor any of his followers knew what those vast mounds had once been. They had already sunk into utter destruction, and it is only within the last few years that the intellectual energy of one of our own countrymen has rescued Nineveh from its long centuries of oblivion. On the fourth day of Alexander's southward march, his advance guard reported that a body of enemy's cavalry was in sight. He instantly formed his army in order for battle, and directed them to advance steadily, he rode forward at the head of some squadrons of cavalry, and charged the Persian horse whom he found before him. This was a mere reconnoitering party, and they broke and fled immediately. But the Macedonians made some prisoners, and from them Alexander found that Darius was posted only a few miles off, and learned the strength of the army that he had with him. On receiving this news, Alexander halted and gave his men repose for four days, so that they should go into action fresh and vigorous. He also fortified his camp and deposited in it all his military stores and all his sick and disabled soldiers, intending to advance upon the enemy with the serviceable part of his army perfectly unencumbered. After this halt he moved forward, while it was yet dark, with the intention of reaching the enemy and attacking them at break of day. About halfway between the camps there were some undulations of the ground, which concealed the two armies from each other's view. But on Alexander arriving at their summit he saw, by early light, the Persian host arrayed before him, and he probably also observed traces of some engineering operation having been carried on 
along part of the ground in front of them. Not knowing that these marks had been caused by the Persians having leveled ground for the free use of their war chariots, Alexander suspected that hidden pitfalls had been prepared with a view of disordering the approach of his cavalry. He summoned the council of war forthwith. Some of the officers were for attacking instantly at all hazards, but the more prudent opinion of Parmenio prevailed, and it was determined not to advance farther till the battleground had been carefully surveyed. Alexander halted his army on the heights, and, taking with him some light-armed infantry and some cavalry, he passed part of the day in reconnoitring the enemy and observing the nature of the ground which he had to fight on. Darius wisely refrained from moving from his position to attack the Macedonians on the eminences which they occupied, and the two armies remained until night without molesting each other. On Alexander's return to his headquarters, he summoned his generals and superior officers together, and telling them that he knew well that their zeal wanted no exhortation, he besought them to do their utmost in encouraging and instructing those whom each commanded to do their best in the next day's battle. They were to remind them that they were now not going to fight for a province, as they had hitherto fought, but they were about to decide by their swords the dominion of all Asia. Each officer ought to impress this upon his subalterns, and they should urge it on their men. Their natural courage required no long words to excite its ardor, but they should be reminded of the paramount importance of steadiness in action. The silence in the ranks must be unbroken as long as silence was proper, but when the time came for the charge, the shout and the cheer must be full of terror for the foe. The officers were to be alert in receiving and communicating orders, and everyone was to act as if he felt that the whole result of the battle depended on his own single good conduct. Having thus briefly instructed his generals, Alexander ordered that the army should sup and take their rest for the night. Darkness had closed over the tents of the Macedonians when Alexander's veteran general, Parmenio, came to him and proposed that they should make a night attack on the Persians. The king is said to have answered that he scorned to filch a victory, and that Alexander must conquer openly and fairly. Arian justly remarks that Alexander's resolution was as wise as it was spirited. Besides the confusion and uncertainty which are inseparable from night engagements, the value of Alexander's victory would have been impaired if gained under circumstances which might supply the enemy with any excuse for his defeat and encourage him to renew the contest. It was necessary for Alexander not only to beat Darius, but to gain such a victory as should leave his rival without apology and without hope of recovery. The Persians, in fact, expected and were prepared to meet a night attack. Such was the apprehension that Darius entertained of it, that he formed his troops at evening in order of battle, and kept them under arms all night. The effect of this was that the morning found them jaded and dispirited, while it brought their adversaries all fresh and vigorous against them, the written order of battle, which Darius himself caused to be drawn up, fell into the hands of the Macedonians after the engagement, and Aristobulus copied it into his journal. We thus possess, through Arian, unusually authentic information as to the composition and arrangement of the Persian army. On the extreme left were the Bactrian, 
Dan, and Arakosian cavalry. Next to these, Darius placed the troops from Persia proper, both horse and foot. Then came the Susians, and next to these, the Caducians. These forces made up the left wing. Darius's own station was in the center. This was composed of the Indians, the Carians, the Mardian archers, and the division of Persians who were distinguished by the golden apples that formed the knobs of their spears. Here also were stationed the bodyguard of the Persian nobility. Besides these, there were in the center, formed in deep order, the Axian and Babylonian troops and the soldiers from the Red Sea. The brigade of Greek mercenaries whom Darius had in service and who alone were considered fit to stand the charge of the Macedonian phalanx, was drawn up on either side of the royal chariot. The right wing was composed of the Colossirians and Mesopotamians, the Medes, the Parthians, the Satians, the Tapurians, Hyrcanians, Albanians and Sassacine. In advance of the line on the left wing were placed the Scythian cavalry, with a thousand of the Bactrian horse and a hundred scythe-armed chariots. The elephants and fifty scythe-armed chariots were ranged in front of the center, and fifty more chariots with the Armenian and Cappadocian cavalry were drawn up in advance of the right wing. Thus arrayed, the great host of King Darius passed the night that to many thousands of them was the last of their existence. The morning of the 1st of October dawned slowly to their wearied watching, and they could hear the note of the Macedonian trumpet sounding to arms, and could see the King Alexander's forces descend from their tents on the heights, and form in order of battle on the plain. There was deep need of skill as well as valor on Alexander's side, and few battlefields have witnessed more consummate generalship than was now displayed by the Macedonian king. There were no natural barriers by which he could protect his flanks, and not only was he certain to be overlapped on either wing, by the vast lines of the Persian army, but there was imminent risk of their circling round him, and charging him in the rear while he advanced against their center. He formed, therefore, a second or reserve line, which was to wheel round if required, or detach troops to either flank, as the enemy's movements might necessitate. And thus, with their whole army ready at any moment to be thrown into one vast hollow square, the Macedonians advanced in two lines against the enemy, Alexander himself leading on the right wing, and the renowned phalanx forming the center, while Parmenio commanded on the left. Such was the general nature of the disposition which Alexander made of his army, but we have in Arian the details of the position of each brigade and regiment. And as we know that these details were taken from the journals of Macedonian generals, it is interesting to examine them, and to read the names and stations of King Alexander's generals and colonels, in this the greatest of his battles. The eight regiments of the Royal Horse Guards formed the right of Alexander's line. Their colonels were Clitus, whose regiment was on the extreme right, the post of peculiar danger. Glocias, Ariston, Sapolis, Heraclides, Demetrius, Meliager, and Hegelochus. Philotas was general of the whole division. Then came the shield-bearing infantry. Nicanor was their general. 
Then came the phalanx in six brigades. Quinus's brigade was on the right and nearest to the shield-bearers. Next to this stood the brigade of Perdicas, then Meliagoras, then Polyspercons, and then the brigade of Aminias, but which was now commanded by Simias, as Aminias had been sent to Macedonia to levy recruits. Then came the infantry of the left wing, under the command of Craterus. Next to Craterus infantry were placed the cavalry regiments of the allies, with Erigius for their general. The Thessalian cavalry commanded by Philippus were next, and held the extreme left of the whole army. The whole left wing was entrusted to the command of Parmenio, who had round his person the Pharsalian regiment of cavalry, which was the strongest and best of all the Thessalian horse regiments. The center of the second line was occupied by a body of phalangite infantry, formed of companies which were drafted for this purpose from each of the brigades of their phalanx. The officers in command of this corps were ordered to be ready to face about if the enemy should succeed in gaining the rear of the army. On the right of this reserve of infantry in the second line, and behind the royal horse guards, Alexander placed half the Agrian light-armed infantry under Atalus, and with them Brisson's body of Macedonian archers and Cleander's regiment of foot. He also placed in this part of his army Manida's squadron of cavalry and Aretes and Ariston's light horse. Manidas was ordered to watch if the enemy's cavalry tried to turn their flank, and if they did so, to charge them before they wheeled completely round, and so take them in flank themselves. A similar force was arranged on the left of the second line for the same purpose. The Thracian infantry of Citalces were placed there and Keranus' regiment of the cavalry of the Greek allies, and Agathon's troops of the Odrysians' irregular horse. The extreme left of the second line in this quarter was held by Andromachus's cavalry. A division of Thracian infantry was left in guard of the camp. In advance of the right wing and center was scattered a number of light-armed troops, of javelin men and bowmen, with the intention of warding off the charge of the armed chariots. Conspicuous by the brilliancy of his armor, and by the chosen band of officers who were around his person, Alexander took his own station, as his custom was, in the right wing, at the head of his cavalry. And when all the arrangements for the battle were complete, and his generals were fully instructed how to act in each probable emergency, he began to lead his men toward the enemy. It was ever his custom to expose his life freely in battle, and to emulate the personal prowess of his great ancestor, Achilles. Perhaps in the bold enterprise of conquering Persia, it was politic for Alexander to raise his army's daring to the utmost by the example of his own heroic valor, and in his subsequent campaigns the love of the excitement of the ruptures of the strife may have made him, like Murat, continue from choice a custom which he commenced from duty. But he never suffered the ardor of the soldier to make him lose the coolness of the general. Great reliance had been placed by the Persian king on the effects of the scythe-bearing chariots. It was designed to launch these against the Macedonian phalanx and to follow them up by a heavy charge of cavalry, which, it was hoped, would find the ranks of the spearmen disordered by the rush of the chariots and easily destroy this most formidable part of Alexander's force. In front, therefore, 
of the Persian center, where Darius took his station, and which it was supposed that the phalanx would attack, the ground had been carefully leveled and smoothed, so as to allow the chariots to charge over it with their full sweep and speed. As the Macedonian army approached the Persian, Alexander found that the front of his whole line barely equaled the front of the Persian center, so that he was outflanked on his right by the entire left wing of the enemy, and by their entire right wing on his left. His tactics were to assail some one point of the hostile army and gain a decisive advantage, while he refused as far as possible the encounter along the rest of the line. He therefore inclined his order of march to the right, so as to enable his right wing and center to come into collision with the enemy on as favorable terms as possible, although the maneuver might in some respect compromise his left. The effect of this oblique movement was to bring the phalanx and his own wing nearly beyond the limits of the ground which the Persians had prepared for the operations of the chariots, and Darius, fearing to lose the benefit of this arm against the most important parts of the Macedonian force, ordered the Scythian and Bactrian cavalry, who were drawn up in advance on his extreme left, to charge round upon Alexander's right wing, and check its farther lateral progress. Against these assailants, Alexander sent from his second line Menida's cavalry. As these proved too few to make head against the enemy, he ordered Ariston also from the second line with his right horse, and Cleander with his foot in support of Menidas. The Bactrians and Scythians now began to give way, but Darius reinforced them by the mass of Bactrian cavalry from his main line, and an obstinate cavalry fight now took place. The Bactrians and Scythians were numerous, and were better armed than the horsemen under Menidas and Ariston, and the loss at first was heaviest on the Macedonian side. But still, the European cavalry stood the charge of the Asiatics, and at last... By their superior discipline and by acting in squadrons that supported each other, instead of fighting in a confused mass like the barbarians, the Macedonians broke their adversaries and drove them off the field. Darius now directed the scythe-armed chariots to be driven against Alexander's horse guards and the phalanx and these formidable vehicles were accordingly sent rattling across the plain, against the Macedonian line. When we remember the alarm which the war chariots of the Britons created among Caesar's legions, we shall not be prone to deride this arm of ancient warfare as always useless. The object of the chariots was to create unsteadiness in the ranks against which they were driven, and squadrons of cavalry followed close up on them to profit by such disorder. But the Asiatic chariots were rendered ineffective at Arbella by the light-armed troops, whom Alexander had specially appointed for the service and who, wounding the horses and drivers with their missile weapons, and running alongside so as to cut the traces or seize the reins, marred the intended charge. And the few chariots that reached the phalanx passed harmlessly through the internals which the spearmen opened for them, and were easily captured in the rear. A mass of the Asiatic cavalry was now, for the second time, collected against Alexander's extreme right, and moved round it with the view of gaining the flank of his army. At the critical moment when their own flanks were exposed by this evolution, Aretes dashed on the Persian squadrons with his horsemen from Alexander's second line. While Alexander thus met and baffled all the flanking attacks of the enemy, with troops brought up from his second line, 
He kept his own horse guards and the rest of the front line of his wing fresh and ready to take advantage of the first opportunity for striking a decisive blow. This soon came. A large body of horse who were posted on the Persian left wing nearest to the center quitted their station and rode off to help their comrades in the cavalry fight that still was going on at the extreme right of Alexander's wing against the detachments from his second line. This made a huge gap in the Persian array, and into this space Alexander instantly charged with his guard and all the cavalry of his wing, and then, pressing toward his left, he soon began to make havoc in the left flank of the Persian center. The shield-bearing infantry now charged also among the reeling masses of the Asiatics, and five of the brigades of the phalanx, with the irresistible might of their sarissas, bore down the Greek mercenaries of Darius, and dug their way through the Persian center. In the early part of the battle, Darius had showed skill and energy, and he now, for some time, encouraged his men by voice and example to keep firm, but the lances of Alexander's cavalry and the pikes of the phalanx now pressed nearer and nearer to him. His charioteer was struck down by a javelin at his side, and at last Darius's nerve failed him, and, descending from his chariot, he mounted on a fleet horse and galloped from the plain, regardless of the state of the battle in other parts of the field where matters were going on much more favorably for his cause, and where his presence might have done much toward gaining a victory. Alexander's operations with his right and center had exposed his left to an immensely preponderating force of the enemy. Parmenio kept out of action as long as possible, but Mazeus, who commanded the Persian right wing, advanced against him, completely outflanked him, and pressed him severely with reiterated charges by superior numbers. Seeing the distress of Parmenio's wing, Simeas, who commanded the 6th Brigade of the Phalanx, which was next to the left wing, did not advance with other brigades in the great charge upon the Persian center, but kept back to cover Parmenio's troops on their right flank, as otherwise they would have been completely surrounded and cut off from the rest of the Macedonian army. By so doing, Simeas had unavoidably opened a gap in the Macedonian left center, and a large column of Indian and Persian horse from the Persian right center had galloped forward through this interval and right through the troops of the Macedonian second line. Instead of then wheeling round upon Parmenio, or upon the rear of Alexander's conquering wing, the Indian and Persian cavalry rode straight onto the Macedonian camp, overpowered the Thracians who were left in charge of it, and began to plunder. This was stopped by the phalangite troops of the second line who, after the enemy's horsemen had rushed by them, faced about, counter-marched up on the camp, killed many of the Indians and Persians in the act of plundering, and forced the rest to ride off again. Just at this crisis, Alexander had been recalled from his pursuit of Darius, by tidings of the distress of Parmenio, and of his inability to bear up any longer, against the hot attacks of Mazeus. Taking his horse guards with him, Alexander rode toward the part of the field where his left wing was fighting, but on his way thither he encountered the Persian and Indian cavalry on their return from his camp. These men now saw that their only chance of safety was to cut their way through, and in one huge column they charged desperately upon the Macedonian regiments. 
There was here a close hand-to-hand -hand fight, which lasted some time, and sixty of the royal horse guards fell, and three generals who fought close to Alexander's side were wounded. At length the Macedonian discipline and valor again prevailed, and a large number of the Persian and Indian horsemen were cut down, some few only succeeding in breaking through and riding away. Relieved of these obstinate enemies, Alexander again formed his regiments of horse guards and led them toward Parmenio, but by this time that general also was victorious. Probably the news of Darius' flight had reached Mazeus and had damped the ardor of the Persian right wing, while the tidings of their comrade's success must have proportionally encouraged the Macedonian forces under Parmenio. His Thessalian cavalry particularly distinguished themselves by their gallantry and preserving good conduct, and by the time that Alexander had ridden up to Parmenio, the whole Persian army was in full flight from the field. It was of the deepest importance to Alexander to secure the person of Darius, and he now urged on the pursuit. The river Lycus was between the field of battle and the city of Arbella, whither the fugitives directed their course, and the passage of this river was even more destructive to the Persians than the swords and spears of the Macedonians had been in the engagement. The narrow bridge was soon choked up by the flying thousands who rushed toward it, and vast numbers of the Persians threw themselves, or were hurried by others into the rapid stream, and perished in its waters. Darius had crossed it, and had ridden on through Arbella without halting. Alexander reached the city on the next day, and made himself master of all Darius's treasure and stores. But the Persian king, unfortunately for himself, had fled too fast for his conqueror but had only escaped to perish by the treachery of his Bactrian satrap, Bessus. A few days after the battle, Alexander entered Babylon, the oldest seat of earthly empire then in existence, as its acknowledged lord and master. There were yet some campaigns of his brief and bright career to be accomplished. Central Asia was yet to witness the march of his phalanx. He was yet to effect that conquest of Afghanistan in which England since has failed. His generalship as well as his valor was yet to be signalized on the banks of the Hidaspis and the field of Chilianwala, and he was yet to precede the Queen of England in annexing the Punjab to the dominions of a European sovereign. But the crisis of his career was reached. The great object of his mission was accomplished, and the ancient Persian Empire, which once menaced all the nations of the earth with subjection, was irreparably crushed when Alexander had won his crowning victory at Arbella. End of section 17《セクション18 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez.《The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn. Rossiter Johnson and John Rudd. First Battle Between Greeks and Romans, B.C. 280-279, by Plutarch. The Romans, in B.C. 290, had conquered the Samnites, and this extended the Roman power to the very gates of the Grecian cities 
on the Gulf of Tarentine. Tarentum, the chief city among them, was almost totally controlled by a party which advised a peaceful submission to the Roman conquerors. The opposing party of patriots, against such cowardly measures, looked abroad for aid and found a ready ally in Pyrrhus, the Molosian king of Epirus. He was warlike and adventurous, and a member of the royal family of Macedonia through Olympias, who was the mother of Alexander the Great. Pyrrhus had established a reputation for fighting. Not alone had he fought at the memorable battle of Ipsus in Phrygia, but he had proven a formidable opponent to Demetinus, king of Macedonia. Having forced the latter powerful monarch to conclude a truce with him, though afterward he had been conquered and driven back in his little kingdom of Epirus. At the time the Tarentines sent to him to help them against Rome, he was eager for a field in which he might do something to prove his mettle. This was the greatest opportunity of his life, and he seized upon it. The campaign is memorable for having brought the Romans and Greeks into conflict on the battlefield for the first time. Pyrrhus, now that he had lost Macedonia, might have spent his days peacefully ruling his own subjects in Epirus, but he could not endure repose thinking that not to trouble others and be troubled by them was a life of unbearable ennui, and, like Achilles in the Iliad, he could not rest in indolence at home. He longed for battle and the joys of war. As he desired some new adventures, he embraced the following opportunity. The Romans were at war with the Tarentines and as that people were not sufficiently powerful to carry on the war, and yet were not allowed by the audacious folly of their mob orators to make peace, they proposed to make Pyrrhus their leader and to invite him to be their ally in the war, because he was more at leisure than any of the other kings, and also was the best general of them all. Of the older and more sensible citizens, some endeavored to oppose this fatal decision, but were overwhelmed by the clamor of the war party, while the rest, observing this, ceased to attend the public assembly. There was one citizen of good repute, named Meton, who, on the day when the final decision was to be made, when the people were all assembled, took a withered garland and a torch, and, like a drunkard, reeled into the assembly with a girl playing the flute before him. At this, as one may expect in a disorderly popular meeting, some applauded and some laughed, but no one stopped him. They next bade the girl play, and Meton came forward and danced to the music and he made as though he would do so. When he had obtained silence, he said, Men of Tarentum, you do well in encouraging those who wish to be merry, and amuse themselves while they may. If you are wise, you will all enjoy your freedom now, for when Pyrrhus is come to our city, you will have very different things to think of, and will live very differently. By these words he made an impression on the mass of the Tarentine people, and a murmur ran through the crowd that he had spoken well. But those politicians who feared that, if peace were made, they should be delivered up to the Romans, reproached the people for allowing anyone to insult them by such a disgraceful exhibition and prevailed on them to turn Meton out of the assembly. Thus the vote for war was passed, and ambassadors were sent to Epirus, not from Tarentum alone, but from the other Greek cities in Italy, carrying with them presents for Pyrrhus, 
with instructions to tell him that they required a leader of skill and renown, and that they possessed a force of Lucanians, Messapians, Samnites, and Tarentines, which amounted to 20,000 cavalry and 350,000 infantry. This not only excited Pyrrhus, but also made all the Epirotes eager to take part in the campaign. There was one Kineas, a Thessalian, who was thought to be a man of good sense, and who, having heard Demosthenes, the orator, speak, was better able than any of the speakers of his age to delight his hearers with an imitation of the eloquence of that great master of rhetoric. He was now in the service of Pyrrhus, and being sent about to various cities, proved the truth of the Euripidean saw that all can be done by words, which foemen wish to do with conquering swords. Pyrrhus, at any rate, used to say that more cities were won for him by Kineas with words than he himself won by force of arms. This man, observing that Pyrrhus was eagerly preparing for his Italian expedition, once when he was at leisure, conversed with him in the following manner. Pyrrhus, said he, the Romans are said to be good soldiers, and to rule over many warlike nations. Now, if heaven grants us victory over them, what use shall we make of it? You ask what is self-evident, answered Pyrrhus. If we can conquer the Romans, there is no city, Greek or barbarian, that can resist us, and we shall gain possession of the whole of Italy, a country whose size, richness, and power no one knows better than yourself. Kineas then, after waiting for a short time, said, O king, when we have taken Italy, what shall we do then? Pyrrhus, not yet seeing his drift, answered, Close to it, Sicily invites us, a noble and populous island, and one which is very easy to conquer. For, my Kineas, now that Agathocles is dead, there is nothing there but revolution and faction, and the violence of party spirit. What you say, answered Kinas, is very probably true. But is this conquest of Sicily to be the extreme limit of our campaign? Heaven, answered Pyrrhus, alone can give us victory and success. But these conquests would merely prove to us the stepping stones to greater things. Who could refrain from making an attempt upon Carthage and Libya when he was so close to them, countries which were all but conquered by Agathocles, when he ran away from Syracuse with only a few ships? And if we were masters of these countries, none of the enemies who now give themselves such heirs at our expense will dare to resist us. Certainly not, answered Kineas. With such a force at our disposal, we clearly could recover Macedonia and have the whole of Greece at our feet. And after we have made all these conquests, what shall we do then? Pyrrhus, laughing, answered, we will take our ease and carouse every day, and enjoy pleasant conversation with one another. Having brought Pyrrhus to say this, Kineas asked in reply, But what prevents our carousing and taking our ease now, since we have already at hand all those things, which we propose to obtain with much bloodshed, and great toils and perils? and after suffering much ourselves and causing much suffering to others. By talking in this manner, Kineas vexed Pyrrhus, because he made him reflect on the pleasant home which he was leaving, but his reasoning had no effect in turning him from his purpose, 
he first dispatched Cineas to Tarentum with three thousand men. Next, he collected from Tarentum many horse transports, decked vessels and boats of all sorts, and embarked upon them twenty elephants, twenty-three thousand cavalry, twenty-two thousand infantry and five hundred slingers. When all was ready, he put to sea, and when halfway across, a storm burst upon him from the north, which was unusual at that season of the year. He himself, though his ship was carried away by the tempest, yet by the great pains and skill of the sailors and pilots, resisted it and reached the land with great toil to the rowers and beyond everyone's expectation, for the rest of the fleet was overpowered by the gale and scattered. Some ships were driven off the Italian coast altogether, and forced into the Libyan and Sicilian seas, and some which could not weather the Apigian Cape were overtaken by night and being dashed by a violent and boisterous sea, against that harborless coast were utterly lost, except only the king's ship. She was so large and strongly built as to resist the waves as long as they broke upon her from the seaward. But when the wind changed and blew directly off the shore, the ship, which now met the waves directly with her head, was in great danger of going to pieces, while to let her drive out to sea again, now that it was so rough, and the wind changed so frequently, seemed more terrible than to remain where they were. Pyrrhus rose and leaped into the water, and at once was eagerly followed by his friends and his bodyguard. The darkness of night and the violent recoil of the roaring waves made it hard for them to help him, and it was not until daybreak, when the wind abated, that he reached the land, faint and helpless in body, but with his spirit invincible in misfortune. The Messapians upon whose coast he had been thrown now assembled from the neighboring villages and offered their help, while some of the ships which had outlived the storm appeared, bringing a few horsemen, about two thousand foot, and two elephants. With these, Pyrrhus marched to Tarentum. Cineas, as soon as he heard of his arrival, bringing out the Tarentine army to meet him, when he reached the city, he did nothing to displease the Tarentines, until his fleet returned to the coast, and he had assembled the greater part of his army. But then, as he saw that the populace, unless ruled by a strong hand, could neither help him nor help themselves, but intended to stay idling about their baths and entertainments at home, while he fought their battles in the field, he closed the gymnasia and public walks, in which the people were wont to waste their time in empty talk about the war. He forbade all drinking, feasting, and unseasonable revels, and forced the people to take up arms, proving himself inexorable to everyone who was on the master roll of able-bodied citizens. This conduct made him much disliked, and many of the Tarentines left the city in disgust, for they were so unused to discipline that they considered that not to be able to pass their lives as they chose was no better than slavery. When news came that Levinius, the Roman consul, was marching to attack him with a large force, and was plundering the country of Lucania as he advanced, while Pyrrhus's allies had not yet arrived, he thought it a shameful thing to allow the enemy to proceed any farther, and marched out with his army. He sent before him a herald to the Roman general, informing him that he was willing to act as arbitrator, 
in the dispute between the Romans and the Greek cities of Italy, if they chose to terminate it peacefully. On receiving for an answer that the Romans neither wished for Pyrrhus as an arbitrator, nor feared him as an enemy, he marched forward and encamped in the plain between the city of Pandosia and Heraclea. Learning that the Romans were close by and were encamping on the farther side of the river Siris, the river Assyris, now called Agri, he rode up to the river to view them, and when he observed their even ranks, their orderly movements, and their well-arranged camp, he was surprised and said to the nearest of his friends, These barbarians, Megacles, have nothing barbarous in their military discipline, but we shall soon learn what they can do. He began indeed already to feel some uncertainty as to the issue of the campaign, and determined to wait until his allies came up, and till then to observe the movements of the Romans, and prevent their crossing the river. They, however, perceiving his object, at once crossed the river, the infantry at a ford, the cavalry at many points at once, so that the Greeks feared they might be surrounded, and drew back. Pyrrhus, perceiving this, ordered his officers instantly to form the troops in order of battle, and wait under arms while he himself charged with the cavalry, three thousand strong, hoping to catch the Romans in the act of crossing the river and consequently in disorder. When he saw many shields of the Roman infantry appearing over the river bank, and their horsemen all ranged in order, he closed up his own ranks and charged them first himself, a conspicuous figure in his beautiful glittering armor, and proving by his exploits that he deserved his high reputation, especially as although he fought personally and engaged in combat with the enemy, yet he continually watched the whole battle and handle his troops with as much facility as though he were not in the thick of the fight, appearing always wherever his presence was required, and reinforcing those who seemed likely to give way. In this battle, Leonatus the Macedonian, observing one of the Italians watching Pyrrhus and constantly following him about the field, said to him, My king, do you see that barbarian on the black horse with white feet? He seems to be meditating some desperate deed. He is a man of spirit and courage, and he never takes his eyes off you, and takes no notice of anyone else. Beware of that man. Pyrrhus answered, Leonatus, no man can avoid his fate. But neither that Italian nor anyone else who attacks me will do so with impunity. While they were yet talking, the Italian leveled his lance and urged his horse in full career against Pyrrhus. He struck the king's horse with his spear, and at the same instant his own horse was struck, a sidelong blow by Leonatus. Both horses fell. Pyrrhus was saved by his friends, and the Italian perished fighting. He was of the nation of Frentani, Hoplacus by name, and was the captain of a troop of horse. This incident taught Pyrrhus to be more cautious. He observed that his cavalry were inclined to give way, and therefore sent for his phalanx, and arrayed it against the enemy. Then he gave his cloak and armor to one of his companions, Megacles, and after partially disguising himself in those of his friend, led his main body to attack the Roman army. The Romans stoutly resisted him, and an obstinate battle took place, for it is said that the combatants alternately yielded and again pressed forward no less than seven distinct times. The king's exchange of armor, too, 
though it saved his life, yet very nearly lost him the victory. For many attacked Megacles, and the man who first struck him down, who was named Decius, snatched up his cloak and helmet, and rode with them to Levinus, displaying them and shouting aloud that he had slain Pyrrhus. The Romans, when they saw these spoils, carried in triumph along their ranks, raised a joyful cry, while the Greeks were correspondingly disheartened, until Pyrrhus, learning what had taken place, rode along the line with his head bare, stretching out his hands to his soldiers and telling them that he was safe. At length he was victorious chiefly by means of a sudden charge of his Thessalian horse on the Romans, after they had been thrown into disorder by the advance of the elephants. The Roman horses were terrified at these animals, and long before they came near, ran away with their riders in panic. The slaughter was very great. Dionysius says that of the Romans there fell but little short of fifteen thousand, but Hieronymus reduces this to seven thousand, while on Pyrrhus' side there fell, according to Dionysius, thirteen thousand, but according to Hieronymus less than four thousand. These, however, were the very flower of Pyrrhus' army, for he lost all his most trusty officers and his most intimate personal friends. Still, he captured the Roman camp, which was abandoned by the enemy, induced several of their allied cities to join him, plundered a vast extent of country, and advanced within three hundred states, less than forty English miles, of Rome itself. After the battle, many of the Lucanians and Samnites came up. These allies he reproached for their dilatory movements, but was evidently well pleased at having conquered the great Roman army with no other forces but his own Epirotes and the Tarentines. The Romans did not remove Levinus from his office of consul, although Caius Fabricius is reported to have said that it was not the Epirotes who had conquered the Romans but Pyrrhus, who had conquered Levinus, meaning that he thought that the defeat was owing not to the greater force, but the superior generalship of the enemy. They astonished Pyrrhus by quickly filling up their ranks with fresh levies, and talking about the war in a spirit of fearless confidence. He decided to try whether they were disposed to make terms with him, as he perceived that to capture Rome and utterly subdue the Roman people would be a work of no small difficulty, and that it would be vain to attempt it with a force at his disposal, while after his victory he could make peace on terms which would reflect great luster on himself. Kinas was sent as ambassador to conduct this negotiation. He conversed with leading men in Rome and offered their wives and children presents from the king. No one, however, would accept them, but they all, men and women alike, replied that if peace were publicly concluded with the king, they would then have no objection to regard him as a friend. And when Kinya spoke before the senate in a winning and persuasive manner, he could not make any impression upon his audience although he announced to them that Pyrrhus would restore the prisoners he had taken without any ransom, and would assist them in subduing all Italy, while all that he asked in return was that he should be regarded as a friend, and that the people of Tarentum should not be molested. The common people, however, were evidently eager for peace, in consequence of their having been defeated in one great battle, and expecting that they would have to fight another against a larger force, because the Italian states would join Pyrrhus. At this crisis, Appius Claudius 
an illustrious man, but who had long since been prevented by old age and blindness from taking any active part in politics, when he heard of the proposals of Perus, and that the question of peace or war was about to be voted upon by the Senate, could no longer endure to remain at home, but caused his slaves to carry him through the forum to the Senate House in a litter. When he reached the doors of the Senate House, his sons and sons-in-law supported him and guided him into the house while all the assembly observed a respectful silence. Speaking from where he stood, he addressed them as follows. My countrymen, I used to grieve at the loss of my sight, but now I am sorry not to be deaf also. When I hear the disgraceful propositions with which you are tarnishing the glory of Rome, what has become of that boast? which we were so fond of making before all mankind, that if Alexander the Great had invaded Italy, and had met us when we were young, and our fathers when they were in the prime of life, he would not have been reputed invincible, but would either have fled or perhaps even have fallen, and added to the glory of Rome. You now prove that this was mere empty vaporing, by your terror of these Caonians and Molossians, nations who have always been a prey and a spoil to the Macedonians, and by your fear of this Pyrrhus, who used formerly to dance attendance on one of Alexander's bodyguards, and who has now wandered hither not so much in order to assist the Greeks in Italy, as to escape from his enemies at home, and promises to be our friend and protector. Forsooth, when the army he commands did not suffice to keep for him the least portion of that Macedonia which he once acquired, do not imagine that you will get rid of this man by making a treaty with him. Rather, you will encourage other Greek princes to invade you, for they will despise you and think you an easy prey to all men if you let Pyrrhus go home again without paying the penalty of his outrages upon you. Nay, with the power to boast that he has made Rome a laughing stock for Tarentines and Samnites. By these words, Appius roused a warlike spirit in the Romans, and they dismissed Cineas with the answer that, if Pyrrhus would leave Italy, they would, if he wished, discuss the question of an alliance with him, but that, while he remained in arms in their country, the Romans would fight him to the death, however many Levinuses he might defeat. It is related that Cineas, during his mission to Rome, took great interest in observing the national life of the Romans, and fully appreciated the excellence of their political constitution, which he learned by conversing with many of the leading men of the state. On his return, he told Pyrrhus that the Senate seemed to him like an assembly of kings, and that, as to the populace, he feared that the Greeks might find in them a new Lernian Hydra, for twice as many troops had been enrolled in the consul's army as he had before, and yet there remained many more Romans capable of bearing arms. After this, Caius Fabricius came to arrange terms for the exchange of prisoners, a man whom Cineas said the Romans especially valued for his virtue and bravery, but who was excessively poor. Pyrrhus, in consequence of this, entertained Fabricius privately, and made him an offer of money, not as a bribe for any act of baseness, but speaking of it as a pledge of friendship and sincerity. 
As Fabricius refused this, Pyrrhus waited till the next day, when, desirous of making an impression on him, as he had never seen an elephant, he had his largest elephant placed behind Fabricius during their conference, concealed by a curtain. At a given signal, the curtain was withdrawn, and the creature reached out his trunk over the head of Fabricius with a harsh and terrible cry. Fabricius, however, quietly turned round and then said to Pyrrhus with a smile, You could not move me by your gold yesterday, nor can you with your beast today. At table that day they conversed upon all subjects, but chiefly about Greece and Greek philosophy. Kineas repeated the opinion of Epicurus and his school about the gods and the practice of political life and the objects at which we should aim, how they considered pleasure to be the highest good and held aloof from taking any active part in politics because it spoiled and destroyed perfect happiness and about how they thought that the gods lived far removed from hopes and fears and interest in human affairs in a placid state of eternal fruition. While he was speaking in this strain, Fabricius burst out. Hercules, cried he, may Pyrrhus and the Samnites continue to waste their time on these speculations as long as they remain at war with us. Pyrrhus, at this, was struck by the spirit and noble disposition of Fabricius, and longed more than ever to make Rome his friend instead of his enemy. He begged him to arrange terms of peace, and after they were concluded, to come and live with him as the first of his friends and officers. Fabricius is said to have quietly answered, That, O king, will not be to your advantage. For those who now obey you and look up to you, if they had any experience of me, would prefer me to you for their king. Pyrrhus was not angry at this speech, but spoke to all his friends about the magnanimous conduct of Fabricius and entrusted the prisoners to him alone, on the condition that, if the Senate refused to make peace, they should be allowed to embrace their friends, and spend the festival of the Saturnalia with them, and then be sent back to him. And they were sent back after the Saturnalia, for the Senate decreed that any of them who remained behind should be put to death, after this, when C. Fabricius was consul, a man came into his camp, bringing a letter from King Pyrrhus's physician, in which he offered to poison the king, if he could be assured of a suitable reward for his service, in thus bringing the war to an end without a blow. Fabricius, disgusted at the man's treachery, brought his colleagues to share his views and in haste sent off a letter to Pyrrhus, bidding him be on his guard. The letter ran as follows. Caius Fabricius and Quintus Emilius, the Roman consuls, greet King Pyrrhus. You appear to be a bad judge both of your friends and of your enemies. You will perceive by reading the enclosed letter, which has been sent to us, that you are fighting against good and virtuous men, and trusting to wicked and treacherous ones. We do not give you this information out of any love we bear you, but with a fear that we might have assassinated you, and be thought to have brought the war to a close, by treachery, because we could not do so by manhood. Pyrrhus, on receiving this letter, in discovering the plot against his life, punished his physician, and in return for the kindness of Fabricius and the Romans, delivered up their prisoners without ransom.
and sent Kineas a second time to arrange terms of peace. However, the Romans refused to receive their prisoners back without ransom, being unwilling either to receive a favor from their enemy or to be rewarded for having abstained from treachery toward him, but set free an equal number of Tarentines and Samnites and sent them to him. As to the terms of peace, they refused to entertain the question, unless Pyrrhus first placed his entire armament on board the ships in which it came and sailed back to Epirus with it. As it was now necessary that Pyrrhus should fight another battle, he advanced with his army to the city of Asculum and attacked the Romans. Here he was forced to fight on rough ground, near the swampy banks of a river, where his elephants and cavalry were of no service, and he was forced to attack with his phalanx. After a drawn battle in which many fell, night parted the combatants. Next day Pyrrhus maneuvered so as to bring the Romans fairly into the plain, where his elephants could act upon the enemy's line. He occupied the rough ground on either side, placed many archers and slingers among his elephants, and advanced with his phalanx in close order and irresistible strength. The Romans, who were unable on the level ground to practice the bushfighting and skirmishing of the previous day, were compelled to attack the phalanx in front. They endeavored to force their way through that hedge of spears before the elephants could come up and showed marvelous courage in hacking at the spears with their swords, exposing themselves recklessly, careless of wounds or death. After a long struggle, it is said that they first gave way at the point where Pyrrhus was urging on his soldiers in person, though the defeat was chiefly due to the weight and crushing charge of the elephants. The Romans could not find any opportunity in this sort of battle for the display of their courage, but thought it their duty to stand aside and save themselves from a useless death, just as they would have done in the case of a wave of the sea or an earthquake coming up on them. In the flight to their camp, which was not far off, Hieronymus says that 6,000 Romans perished, and that in Pyrrhus's commentaries, his loss is stated at 3,505. Dionysius, on the other hand, does not admit that there were two battles at Asculum, or that the Romans suffered the defeat but tells us that they fought the whole of one day until sunset, and then separated, Pyrrhus being wounded in the arm by a javelin, and the Samnites having plundered his baggage. He also states the total loss on both sides to be above 15,000. The armies separated after the battle, and it is said that Pyrrhus, when congratulated on his victory by his friends, said in reply, If we win one or more such victory over the Romans, we shall be utterly ruined. For a large part of the force which he had brought with him had perished, and very nearly all his friends and officers, and there were no more to send for at home. End of section 18 Section 19 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rosator Johnson, and John Rudd. Section 19. The Punic Wars, B.C. 264, 219, 149, by Florus. The three Punic Wars stand out in history as a mighty duel a la trance, 
a fight to the death, as Victor Hugo says, in the final scene of which Rome, having herself been brought near to defeat, rises again, uses the limits of her strength in a last blow, throws herself on Carthage, and effaces her from the world. Jealousy and antagonism had long existed between Rome and Carthage, but it was the preeminence of the African city which held Roman ambition in check, and for generations deferred the final struggle. But when at last Rome had acquired the strength she needed in order to assert her rivalry, it was only a question of actual preparation, and the first cause of quarrel was sure to be seized upon by either party, especially by the growing and haughty Italian power. The immediate object of contention was the island of Sicily, lying between the territory of Rome and that of Carthage. In Sicily, the First Punic War, lasting about twenty-three years, was mainly carried on by the Romans with success, while on the sea, Carthage, for a long time, maintained superiority. During the intervals between the Punic Wars, two things appeared with striking force in the history of these events, the passive strength and recuperative power of Carthage, which enabled her to return again and again to the struggle from almost crushing defeat, and the marvelous development of resources and aggressive vigor on the part of Rome, in whose case the rise of powerful individual leaders more than offset the weight of long-accumulated energies, supplemented, as these were, by the genius and achievement of great Carthaginian warriors. The wars progressed in a spirit of deadly hatred, constantly intensified on both sides, and the Roman determination, of which Cato was the mouthpiece, that Carthage must be destroyed, met its stubborn answer in the endeavors of the Carthaginians to turn this vengeance against Rome herself. Carthage had been mistress of the world, the richest and most powerful of cities. Her naval supremacy alone had sufficed to secure her safety and superiority over all rivals or possible combinations of force. But the strength of her government lay not so much in her people or even in her statesmen and soldiers as in her men of wealth. A political establishment founded upon such supports was peculiarly liable to all the dangers of corruption and of public ignorance and apathy in the conduct of affairs. These causes appear conspicuously in the history of the Punic Wars, as contributing largely to the overthrow and final extinguishment of Carthage, which left to her successful rival the open way to universal dominion. The account of Florus presents in a style at once comprehensive and succinct a splendid narrative of these wars, with their decisive and world-changing events. The First Punic War The victor people of Italy, having now spread over the land as far as the sea, checked its course for a little, like a fire, which, having consumed the woods lying in its track, is stopped by some intervening river. But soon after, seeing at no great distance, a rich prey, which seemed in a manner detached and torn away from their own Italy, they were so inflamed with a desire to possess it, that, since it could neither be joined to their country by a mole or bridge, they resolved that it should be secured by arms and war, and reunited, as it were, to their continent. And behold, as if the fates themselves opened a way for them, an opportunity was not wanting, for Messana, a city of Sicily, in alliance with them, happened then to make a complaint concerning the tyranny of the Carthaginians. As the Romans coveted Sicily, so likewise did the people of Carthage, and both at the same time, with equal desires and equal forces, contemplated the attainment of the empire of the world. Under the pretext, therefore, of assisting their allies, 
but in reality being allured by the prey, that rude people, that people sprung from shepherds and merely accustomed to the land, made it appear, though the strangeness of the attempt startled them, yet such confidence is there in true courage, that to the brave it is indifferent whether a battle be fought on horseback or in ships, by land or by sea. It was in the consulship of Appius Claudius that they first ventured upon that strait which has so ill a name from the strange things related of it, and so impetuous a current. But they were so far from being affrighted that they regarded the violence of the rushing tide as something in their favor, and, sailing forward immediately and without delay, they defeated Hiero, king of Syracuse, with so much rapidity that he owned he was conquered before he saw the enemy. In the consulship of Duilius and Cornelius, they likewise had courage to engage at sea, and then the expedition used in equipping the fleet was a presage of victory, for within sixty days after the timber was felled, a navy of a hundred and sixty ships lay at anchor, so that the vessels did not seem to have been made by art, but by the trees themselves appear to have been turned into ships by the aid of the gods. The aspect of the battle, too, was wonderful, as the heavy and slow ships of the Romans closed with the swift and nimble barks of the enemy. Little availed their naval arts, such as breaking off the oars of a ship and eluding the beaks of the enemy by turning aside. For the grappling irons and other instruments, which before their engagement had been greatly derided by the enemy, were fastened upon their ships, and they were compelled to fight as on solid ground. Being victorious, therefore, at Lepar, by sinking and scattering the enemy's fleet, they celebrated their first naval triumph, and how great was the exultation at it! Duilius, the commander, not content with one day's triumph, ordered, during all the rest of his life, when he returned from supper, lighted torches to be carried, and flutes to play before him, as if he would triumph every day. The loss in this battle was trifling, in comparison with the greatness of the victory. Though the other consul, Cornelius Cecina, was cut off, being invited by the enemy to a pretended conference and put to death, an instance of Carthaginian perfidy. Under the dictatorship of Calatinus, the Romans expelled almost all of the garrisons of the Carthaginians from Agrigentum, Drepanum, Panormus, Eryx, and Lilibium. Some alarm was experienced at the forest of Camarina, but we were rescued by the extraordinary valor of Calpurnius Flama, a tribune of the soldiers, who, with a choice troop of three hundred men, seized upon an eminence occupied by the enemy, to our annoyance, and so kept them in play till the whole army escaped. Thus, by imminent success, equaling the fame of Thermopolis and Leonidas, though our hero was indeed more illustrious, inasmuch as he escaped and outlived so great an effort, notwithstanding he wrote nothing with his blood. In the consulship of Lucius Cornelius Scipio, when Sicily was become as a suburban province of the Roman people, and the war was spreading farther, they crossed over into Sardinia, and into Corsica, which lies near it. In the latter they terrified the natives by the destruction of the city of Olbia, in the former by that of Illyria, and so effectually humbled the Carthaginians both by land and sea that nothing remained to be conquered but Africa itself. Accordingly, under the leadership of Marcus Atilius Regulus, the war passed over into Africa. Nor were there wanting some on the occasion who mutinied at the mere name of the dread of the Punic Sea, a tribune named Manius, increasing their alarm. But the general threatening him with the axe if he did not obey, produced courage for the voyage by the terror of death. They then hastened their course by the aid of the winds and oars, and such was the terror of the Africans at the approach of the enemy that Carthage was almost surprised with its gates opened. 
The first prize taken in the war was the city of Clipia, which juts out from the Carthaginian shore as a fortress or watchtower. Both this and more than three hundred fortresses besides were destroyed, nor had the Romans to contend only with men, but with monsters also, for a serpent of vast size, born, as it were, to avenge Africa, harassed their camp on the Bagrada. But Regulus, who overcame all obstacles, having spread the terror of his name far and wide, having killed or taken prisoners of great number of the enemy's force, and their captains themselves, and having dispatched his fleet, laden with so much spoil and stored with materials for a triumph to Rome, proceeded to besiege Carthage herself, the origin of the war, and took his position close to the gates of it. Here fortune was a little changed, but it was only that more proofs of Roman fortitude might be given, the greatness of which was generally best shown in calamities. For the enemy applying for foreign assistance, and Lacedaemon having sent them Xanthippus as a general, were defeated by a captain so eminently skilled in military affairs. It was then that by an ignominious defeat, such as the Romans had never before experienced, their most valiant commander fell alive into the enemy's hands. But he was a man able to endure so great a calamity, as he was neither humbled by his imprisonment at Carthage, nor by the deputation which he headed to Rome, for he advised what was contrary to the injunctions of the enemy, and recommended that no peace should be made, and no exchange of prisoners admitted even by his voluntary return to his enemies, and by his last sufferings, whether in prison or on the cross. The dignity of the man was not at all obscured, but being rendered by all these occurrences even more worthy of admiration. What can be said of him but that, when conquered, he was superior to his conquerors, and that, though Carthage had not submitted, he triumphed over fortune herself." The Roman people were now much keener and more ardent to revenge the fate of Regulus than to obtain victory. Under the consul Metellus, therefore, when the Carthaginians were growing insolent, and when the war had returned into Sicily, they gave the enemy such a defeat at Pennormus that they thought no more of that island. A proof of the greatness of this victory was the capture of about a hundred elephants, a vast prey, even if they had taken that number, not in war, but in hunting. Under the consulship of Appius Claudius, they were overcome, not by the enemy, but by the gods themselves, whose auspices they had despised, their fleet being sunk in that very place where the consul had ordered the chickens to be thrown overboard, because he was warned by them not to fight. Under the consulship of Marcus Fabius Butio, they overthrew, near Aegemorus, in the African Sea, a fleet of the enemy which was just sailing for Italy. But, oh, how great materials for a triumph were then lost by a storm, when the Roman fleet, richly laden with spoil and driven by contrary winds, covered with its wreck the coasts of Africa and the Syrtes and of all the islands lying amid those seas. A great calamity, but not without some honor to this eminent people, from the circumstance of that victory, was intercepted only by a storm, and that the matter for their triumph was lost only by a shipwreck. Yet though the Punic spoils were scattered abroad, and thrown up by the waves on every promontory and island, the Romans still celebrated a triumph, in the consulship of Lutatius Catullus, an end was at last put to the war near the islands named Agathes. Nor was there any greater fight during this war, for the fleet of the enemy was laden with provisions, troops, towers, and arms. Indeed, all Carthage, as it were, was in it, a state of things which proved its destruction as the Roman fleet, on the contrary, being active, light, free from encumbrance, and in some degree resembling a land camp, was wheeled about by its oars like cavalry in a battle by the reins. And the beaks of the vessels, 
directed now against one part of the enemy and now against another, presented the appearance of living creatures. In a very short time, accordingly, the ships of the enemy were shattered to pieces and filled the whole sea, between Sicily and Sardinia, with their wrecks. So great indeed was the victory that there was no thought of demolishing the enemy city, since it seemed superfluous to pour their fury on towers and walls, when Carthage had already been destroyed at sea. THE SECOND PUNIC WAR After the First Carthaginian War, there was scarcely a rest of four years, when there was another war, inferior indeed in length of time, for it occupied but eighteen years, but so much more terrible from the direfulness of its havoc, that if any one compares the losses on both sides, the people that conquered was more like one defeated. What provoked this noble people was that the command of the sea was forced from them, that their islands were taken, and that they were obliged to pay tribute which they had before been accustomed to impose. Hannibal, when but a boy, swore to his father before an altar to take revenge on the Romans. Nor was he backwards to execute his oath. Seguntum, accordingly, was made the occasion of a war, an old and wealthy city of Spain, and a great but sad example of fidelity to the Romans. This city, though granted by the common treaty the special privilege of enjoying its liberty, Hannibal seeking pretenses for new disturbances destroyed with his own hands and those of its inhabitants, in order that, by an infraction of the compact, he might open a passage for himself into Italy. Among the Romans there is a highest regard to treaties, and consequently on hearing of the siege of an allied city, and remembering, too, the compact made with the Carthaginians, they did not at once have recourse to arms, but chose rather to expostulate on legal grounds. In the meantime the Saguntines, exhausted with famine, the assaults of machines and the sword, and their fidelity being at last carried to desperation, raised a vast pile in the marketplace, on which they destroyed, with fire and sword, themselves, their wives, and children, and all that they possessed. Hannibal, the cause of this great destruction, was required to be given up. The Carthaginians, hesitating to comply, Fabius, who was at the head of the embassy, exclaimed, What is the meaning of this delay? In this fold of this garment I carry war and peace. Which of the two do you choose? As they cried out war, Take war, then, he rejoined, and shaking out the fore part of his toga in the middle of the Senate house, as if he really carried war in its folds, he spread it abroad, not without awe on the part of the spectators. The sequel of the war was in conformity with its commencement, for, as if the last imprecations of the Saguntines, at their public self-immolation and burning of the city, had required such obsequies to be performed to them, atonement was made to their manes by the devastation of Italy, the reduction of Africa, and the destruction of the leaders and kings who engaged in that contest. When once, therefore, that sad and dismal force and storm of the Punic War had arisen in Spain and had forged in the fire of Siguntum, the thunderbolt, long before intended for the Romans, it immediately burst, as if hurried along by resistless violence, through the middle of the Alps, and descended from those snows of incredible altitude on the plains of Italy as if it had been hurled from the skies. The violence of its first assault burst with a mighty sound between the Po and the Ticinus. There the army under Scipio was rooted and the general himself, being wounded, would have fallen into the hands of the enemy, had not his son, then quite a boy, covered his father with his shield, and rescued him from death. This was the Scipio who grew up from the conquest of Africa, and who was to receive a name from its ill fortune. To Ticinus succeeded Trebia, 
where in the consulship of Sempronius, the second outburst of the Punic War was spent. On that occasion, the crafty enemy, having chosen a cold and snowy day, and having first warmed themselves at their fires and anointed their bodies with oil, conquered us, though they were men that came from the south and a warm sun, by the aid, strange to say, of our own winter. The third thunderbolt of Hannibal fell at the Trasimene Lake, where Flaminius was commander. There also was employed a new stratagem of Carthaginian subtlety, for a body of cavalry, being concealed by a mist rising from the lake, and by the osiers growing in the fens, fell upon the rear of the Romans as they were fighting. Nor can we complain of the gods, for swarms of bees settling upon the standards, the reluctance of the eagles to move forward, and a great earthquake that happened at the commencement of the battle, unless indeed it was the trampling of horse and foot, and the violent concussion of arms that produced this trembling of the ground, had forewarned the rash leader of approaching defeat. The fourth and almost mortal wound of the Roman Empire was at Cannae, an obscure village of Apulia, which, however, became famous by the greatness of the defeat, its celebrity being acquired by the slaughter of forty thousand men. Here the general, the ground, the face of heaven, the day, indeed all nature, conspired together for the destruction of the unfortunate army. For Hannibal, the most artful of generals, not content with sending pretend deserters among the Romans, who fell upon their rear as they were fighting, but having also noted the nature of the ground in those open plains where the heat of the sun is extremely violent, the dust very great, and the wind blows constantly, as if it were statedly from the east, drew up his army in such a position that while the Romans were exposed to all these inconveniences, he himself, having heaven, as it were, on his side, fought with wind, dust, and sun in his favor. Two vast armies, in consequence, were slaughtered, till the enemy were satiated, and till Hannibal said to his soldiers, Put up your swords. Of the two commanders, one escaped, the other was slain. Which of them showed the greater spirit is doubtful. Paulus was ashamed to survive. Varro did not despair. Of the greatness of the slaughter, the following proofs may be noticed, that the Ophidus was for some time red with blood, that a bridge was made of dead bodies, by order of Hannibal, over the torrent of Virgilus, and that two modi of rings were sent to Carthage, and the equestrian dignity estimated by measure. It was afterward not doubted, but that Rome might have seen its last day and that Hannibal, within five days, might have feasted in the capital, if, as they say, that Adherbal, the Carthaginian, the son of Bamilcar, observed, he had known as well how to use his victory as how to gain it. But at that crisis, as is generally said, either the fate of the city that was to be empress of the world, or his own want of judgment, and the influence of deities unfavorable to Carthage, carried him in a different direction. When he might have taken advantage of his victory, he chose rather to seek enjoyment from it, and, leaving Rome, to march into Campania and to Tarentum, where both he and his army soon lost their vigor, so that it was justly remarked that Capua proved a cane to Hannibal, since the sunshine of Campania and the warm springs of Baiae subdued. Who could have believed him? him who had been unconquered by the Alps and unshaken in the field. In the meantime, the Romans began to recover and to rise, as it were, from the dead. They had no arms, but they took them down from the temples. Men were wanting, but slaves were freed to take the oath of service. The treasury was exhausted, but the Senate willingly offered their wealth for the public service, leaving themselves no gold, 
but what was contained in their children's boule, and in their own belts and rings. The knights followed their example, and the common people that of the knights, so that when the wealth of private persons was brought to the public treasury in the consulship of Lavinus and Marcellus, the registers scarcely sufficed to contain the account of it, or the hands of the clerks to record it. But how can I sufficiently praise the wisdom of the centuries in the choice of magistrates? When the younger sought advice from the elder as to what consuls should be created, they saw that against an enemy so often victorious and so full of subtlety, it was necessary to contend not only with courage, but with his own wiles. The first hope of the empire now recovering, and, if I may use the expression, coming to life again, was Fabius, who found a new mode of conquering Hannibal, which was not to fight. Hence he received that new name, so salutary to the commonwealth, of Cunctator, or Delayer. Hence, too, it happened that he was called by the people the shield of the empire. Through the whole of Samnium, and through the Falerian and Goran forests, he so harassed Hannibal that he who could not be reduced by valor was weakened by delay. The Romans then ventured under the command of Claudius Marcellus to engage him. They came to close quarters with him, drove him out of his dear Campania, and forced him to raise the siege of Nola. They ventured likewise under the leadership of Sempronius Gracchus to pursue him through Lucania, and to press hard upon his rear as he retired, though they then fought him, sad dishonor, with a body of slaves. For to this extremity had so many disasters reduced them, but they were rewarded with liberty, and from slaves they made them Romans." O oh, amazing confidence in the midst of so much adversity! O oh, extraordinary courage and spirit of the Roman people in such oppressive and distressing circumstances! At a time when they were uncertain of preserving their own Italy, they yet ventured to look to other countries, and when the enemy were at their throat, flying through Campania and Apulia, and making an Africa in the middle of Italy, they at the same time both withstood that enemy and dispersed their arms over the earth into Sicily, Sardinia, and Spain. Sicily was assigned to Marcellus, and did not long resist his efforts, for the whole island was conquered in the conquest of one city, Syracuse its great, and till that period, unconquered capital, though defended by the genius of Archimedes, was at last obliged to yield. Its triple wall and three citadels, its marble harbor and the celebrated fountain of Arethusa, were no defense to it, except so far as to procure consideration for its beauty when it was conquered. Sardinia Gracchus reduced the savages of the inhabitants, and the vastness of its mad mountains, for so they are called, availed it nothing. Great severity was exercised upon its cities, and upon Corallus, the city of its cities, that a nation, obstinate and regardless of death, might at least be humbled by concern for the soil of its country. Into Spain were sent the two Scipios, Cineus and Publius, who wrestled almost the whole of it from the Carthaginians. But, being surprised by the artifices of Punic subtlety, they again lost it, even after they had slaughtered the enemy's forces in great battles. The wiles of the Carthaginians, cut off of them by the sword, as he was pitching his camp, and the other by surrounding him with lighted faggots after he had made his escape into a tower. But the other Scipio, to whom the fates had decreed so great a name from Africa, being sent with an army to revenge the death of his father and uncle, recovered all that warlike country of Spain, so famous for its men and arms, that seminary of the enemy's force, that instructress of Hannibal, from the Pyrenean mountains, the account is scarcely credible, to the pillars of Hercules and the ocean, whether with greater speed or good fortune is difficult to decide. How great was his speed, four years bear witness, 
how remarkable his good fortune even one city proves for it was taken on the same day in which siege was laid to it and it was an omen of the conquest of africa that carthage of spain was so easily reduced it is certain however that what most contributed to make the province submit was the eminent virtue of the general who restored to the barbarians certain captive youths and maidens of extraordinary beauty not allowing them even to be brought into his sight that he might not seem even by a single glance to have detracted from their virgin purity o oh, people worthy of the empire of the world worthy of the favor and admiration of all not only men but gods though they were brought into the greatest alarm they desisted not from their original design though they were concerned for their own city they did not abandon their attempts on capua but part of their army being left there with the consul appius and part having followed flaccus to rome they fought both at home and abroad at the same time why then should we wonder that the gods themselves the gods i say nor shall i be ashamed to admit it again opposed hannibal as he was preparing to march forward when at three miles distance from rome for at every movement of his force so copious a flood of rain descended and such a violent storm of wind arose that it was evident the enemy was repulsed by divine influence and the tempest proceeded not from heaven but from the walls of the city and the capital he therefore fled and departed and withdrew to the furthest corner of italy leaving the city in a manner adored but it was a small matter to mention yet sufficiently indicative of the magnanimity of the roman people that during those very days in which the city was besieged the ground which hannibal occupied with his camp was offered for sale at rome and being put up to auction actually found a purchaser hannibal on the other side wished to imitate such confidence and put up for sale the bankers' houses in the city. But no buyer was found, so that it was evident that the fates had their presages. But as yet, nothing had been effectually accomplished by so much valor, or even through such eminent favor from the gods. For Hasdrubal, the brother of Hannibal, was approaching with a new army, new strength, and every fresh requisite for war. There had doubtless been an end of Rome, if that general had united himself with his brother. But Claudius Nero, in conjunction with Livius Salinator, overthrew him as he was pitching his camp. Nero was at that time keeping Hannibal at bay in the farthest corner of Italy, while Livius had marched to the very opposite quarter, that is, to the very entrance and confines of Italy and of the ability and expedition with which the consuls joined their forces, though so vast a space that is the whole of Italy where it is longest lay between them, and defeated the enemy with their combined strength when they expected no attack, and without the knowledge of Hannibal, it is difficult to give a notion. When Hannibal, however, had knowledge of the matter, and saw his brother's head thrown down before the camp, he exclaimed, I perceive the evil destiny of Carthage. This was his first confession of that kind, not without a sure presage of his approaching fate, and it was now certain, even from his own acknowledgment, that Hannibal might be conquered. But the Roman people, full of confidence from so many successes, thought it would be a noble enterprise to subdue such a desperate enemy in his own Africa directing their whole force therefore under the leadership of scipio upon africa itself they began to imitate hannibal and to avenge upon africa the sufferings of their own italy what forces of hasdrubal good gods what armies of syphax did that commander put to flight how great were the camps of both that he destroyed in one night by casting firebrands into them at last not at three miles distance but by a close siege he shook the very gates of Carthage itself, and thus he succeeded in drawing off Hannibal when he was still clinging to and brooding over Italy. 
there was no more remarkable day during the whole course of the roman empire than that on which those two generals the greatest of all that ever lived whether before or after them the one the conqueror of italy and the other of spain drew up their forces for a close engagement but previously a conference was held between them concerning conditions of peace they stood motionless a while in admiration of each other when they could not agree on a peace they gave the signal for battle it is certain from the confession of both that no troops could have been better drawn up and no fight more obstinately maintained this hannibal acknowledged concerning the army of scipio and scipio concerning that of hannibal but hannibal was forced to yield and africa became the prize of the victory and the whole earth soon followed the fate of africa the third punic war the third war with africa was both short in its duration for it was finished in four years and compared with those that preceded it of much less difficulty as we had to fight not so much against troops in the field as against the city itself but it was far the greatest of the three in its consequences for in it carthage was at last destroyed and if any one contemplates the events of the three periods, he will understand that the war was begun in the first, greatly advanced in the second, and entirely finished in the third. The cause of this war was that Carthage, in violation of an article in the treaty, had once fitted out a fleet and army against the Numidians, and had frequently threatened the frontiers of Massinissa. But the Romans were partial to this good king, who was also their ally. When the war had been determined upon, they had to consider about the end of it. Cato, even when his opinion was asked on any other subject, pronounced with implacable enmity that Carthage should be destroyed. Scipio Nasica gave his voice for its preservation, lest, if the fear of the rival city were removed, the exaltation of Rome should grow extravagant. The Senate decided on a middle course, resolving that the city should only be removed from its place, for nothing appeared to them more glorious than that there should be a Carthage which should not be feared. In the consulship of Manlius and Censorinus, therefore, the Roman people, having attacked Carthage, but giving them some hopes of peace, burned their fleet, which they voluntarily delivered up, in sight of the city. Having next summoned the chief men, they commanded them to quit the place if they wished to preserve their lives. This requisition, from its cruelty, so incensed them that they chose rather to submit to the utmost extremities. They accordingly bewailed their necessities publicly, and shouted with one voice to arms, and a resolution was made to resist the enemy by every means in their power, not because any hope of success was left, but because they had rather their birthplace should be destroyed by the hands of the enemy than by their own. With what spirit they resumed the war may be understood from the facts that they pulled down their roofs and houses for the equipment of a new fleet that gold and silver, instead of brass and iron, were melted in their forges for the construction of arms, and that the women parted with their hair to make cordage for the engines of war. Under the command of the consul Mancinus, the siege was warmly conducted both by land and sea. The harbor was dismantled of its works, and a first, second, and even third wall taken, while nevertheless the Birsa, which was the name of the citadel, held out like another city. But though the destruction of the place was thus very far advanced, it was the name of the Scipios only that seemed fatal to Africa. The government accordingly applying to another Scipio desired from him a termination of the war. This Scipio, the son of Paulus Macedonicus, the son of the great Africanus, had adopted as an honor to his family and, as it appears, with his destiny, that the grandson should overthrow the city which the grandfather had shaken. But as the bites of dying beasts are wont to be most fatal, 
so there was more trouble with Carthage half-ruined than when it was in its full strength. The Romans, having shut the enemy up in their single fortress, had also blockaded the harbor. But upon this they dug another harbor on the other side of the city, not with a design to escape, but because no one supposed that they could even force an outlet there. Here a new fleet, as if just born, started forth, and in the meanwhile, sometimes by day and sometimes by night, some new mole, some new machine, some new band of desperate men perpetually started up like a sudden flame from a fire sunk in ashes. At last, their affairs becoming desperate, forty thousand men, and what is hardly credible, with heads drubal at their head, surrendered themselves. How much more nobly did a woman behave, the wife of the general, who, taking hold of her two children, threw herself from the top of her house into the midst of the flames, imitating the queen that built Carthage. How great a city was then destroyed is shown, to say nothing of other things, by the duration of the fire, for the flames could scarcely be extinguished at the end of seventeen days. Flames which the enemy themselves had raised in their houses and temples, that, since the city could not be rescued from the Romans, all matter for triumph might at last be burned. End of section 19of the great events by famous historians volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by mike botez the great events by famous historians volume two edited by charles f horn Rossiter Johnson and John Rudd The Battle of Metaurus B.C. 207 By Sir Edward S. Creasy Part 1 During the closing years of the Second Punic War, the resources of the Romans were drained to such an extent as to bring great disheartment to their rulers and generals. Under the stress of financial difficulties, the cost of living greatly increased, and the state was compelled to resort to loans of various kinds, and to levy upon citizens of means for the pay of seamen. This scheme for raising Roman ship money was one of the most significant indications of the extreme weight resting upon the Republic in the prosecution of this arduous war. A war with Sicily was fortunately terminated, releasing some additional force for employment against the Carthaginians. But for some time little headway was made by the Roman commanders, and when in B.C. 207 the people were called upon to elect consuls, their affairs were still in a condition which caused serious anxiety. The consuls chosen in that year were Marcus Livius and Caius Claudius Nero, and without delay they went to take command in southern Italy, which the Carthaginians under Hannibal, though not in much strength, had invaded. But when later in the season Hasdrubal crossed the Alps from the north to join his brother Hannibal, the aspect of the war became still more grave in the eyes of the Romans. Hasdrubal solicited the support of the Gauls, but to little purpose. Meanwhile Hannibal made skillful use of his small forces in eluding the consul Nero, but the capture by the Romans of dispatches from Hasdrubal disclosed his plans and Nero at once formed his own for intercepting him. The result was that Nero and Livius joined their forces in Hasdrubal's front, and to the Carthaginian they offered immediate battle. Hasdrubal attempted a retreat, but was compelled to give battle on the banks of the Metaurus. 
of this, one of the decisive battles of the world, Chrissy has left an authoritative and graphic account which here follows. The part of the consul Nero in the campaign is thus remarked upon by Lord Byron. The consul Nero, who made the unequaled march which deceived Hannibal and deceived Hasdrubal, thereby accomplished an achievement almost unrivaled in military annals. The first intelligence of his return to Hannibal was the sight of Hasdrubal's head thrown into his camp. When Hannibal saw this, he exclaimed with a sigh that Rome would now be the mistress of the world. To this victory of Nero's it might be owing that his imperial namesake reigned at all. But the infantry of the one has eclipsed the glory of the other. When the name of Nero is heard, who thinks of the consul? But such are human things. About midway between Rimini and Ancona, a little river falls into the Adriatic. After traversing one of those districts of Italy, in which a vain attempt has lately been made to revive, after long centuries of servitude and shame, the spirit of Italian nationality and the energy of free institutions. That stream is still called the Metauro, and wakens by its name the recollections of the resolute daring of ancient Rome and of the slaughter that stained its current two thousand and sixty-three years ago, when the combined consular armies of Livius and Nero encountered and crushed near its banks the varied hosts which Hannibal's brother was leading from the Pyrenees, the Rhone, the Alps, and the Po, to aid the great Carthaginian in his stern struggle to annihilate the growing might of the Roman Republic, and to make the Punic power supreme over all the nations of the world. The Roman historian who termed that struggle the most memorable of all wars that ever were carried on, wrote in no spirit of exaggeration, for it is not in ancient but in modern history that parallels for its incidents and its heroes are to be found. The similitude between the contest which Rome maintained against Hannibal and that which England was for many years engaged in against Napoleon has not passed unobserved by recent historians. Twice, says Arnold, has there been witnessed the struggle of the highest individual genius against the resources and institutions of a great nation, and in both cases the nation has been victorious. For seventeen years Hannibal strove against Rome. For sixteen years Napoleon Bonaparte strove against England. The efforts of the first ended in Zama, those of the second in Waterloo. One point, however, of the similitude between the two wars has scarcely been adequately dwelt on, that is, the remarkable parallel between the Roman general who finally defeated the great Carthaginian and the English general who gave the last deadly overthrow to the French emperor. Scipio and Wellington both held for many years commands of high importance, but distant from the main theaters of warfare. The same country was the scene of the principal military career of each. It was in Spain that Scipio, like Wellington, successively encountered and overthrew nearly all the subordinate generals of the enemy before being opposed to the chief champion and conqueror himself. Both Scipio and Wellington restored their countrymen's confidence in arms when shaken by a series of reverses, and each of them closed a long and perilous war 
by a complete and overwhelming defeat of the chosen leader and the chosen veterans of the foe, nor is the parallel between them limited to their military characters and exploits. Scipio, like Wellington, became an important leader of the aristocratic party among his countrymen and was exposed to the unmeasured invectives of the violent section of his political antagonists. When, early in the last reign, an infuriated mob assaulted the Duke of Wellington in the streets of the English capital on the anniversary of Waterloo, England was even more disgraced by that outrage than Rome was by the factious accusations which demagogues brought against Scipio, but which he proudly repelled on the day of trial by reminding the assembled people that it was the anniversary of the Battle of Zama. Happily, a wiser and a better spirit has now for years pervaded all classes of our community, and we shall be spared the ignominy of having worked out to the end the parallel of national ingratitude. Scipio died a voluntary exile from the malevolent turbulence of Rome. Englishmen of all ranks and politics have now long united in affectionate admiration of our modern Scipio, and even those who have most widely differed from the Duke on legislative or administrative questions forget what they deem the political errors of that time-honored head, while they gratefully call to mind the laurels that have rested. Scipio at Zama trampled in dust the power of Carthage, but that power had been already irreparably shattered in another field, where neither Scipio nor Hannibal commanded. When the Metaurus witnessed the defeat and death of Hasdrubal, it witnessed the ruin of the scheme by which alone Carthage could hope to organize decisive success, the scheme of enveloping Rome at once from the north and the south of Italy by two chosen armies, led by two sons of Hamilcar. That battle was the determining crisis of the contest not merely between Rome and Carthage, but between the two great families of the world, which then made Italy the arena of their oft-renewed contest for preeminence. The French historian Michelet, whose Histoire Romaine would have been invaluable if the general industry and accuracy of the writer had in any degree equaled his originality and brilliancy, eloquently remarks, It is not without reason that so universal and vivid a remembrance of the Punic Wars has dwelt in the memories of men. They formed no mere struggle to determine the lot of two cities or two empires, but it was a strife on the event of which depended the fate of two races of mankind whether the dominion of the world should belong to the Indo-Germanic or to the Semitic family of nations. Bear in mind that the first of these comprises, besides the Indians and the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and the Germans. In the other are ranked the Jews and the Arabs, the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians. On the other side is the genius of heroism, of art and legislation. On the other is the spirit of industry, of commerce, of navigation. The two opposite races have everywhere come into contact, everywhere into hostility. In the primitive history of Persia and Chaldea, the heroes are perpetually engaged in combat with their industrious and perfidious neighbors. The struggle is renewed between the Phoenicians and the Greeks on every coast of the Mediterranean. The Greek supplants the Phoenician in all his factories, all his colonies in the east. Soon will the Roman come, and do likewise in the west. 
Alexander did far more against Tyre than Shalmaneser or Nebuchadnezzar had done. No content with crushing her, he took care that the newer should revive, for he founded Alexandria as her substitute and changed forever the track of the commerce of the world. There remained Carthage, the great Carthage, and her mighty empire, mighty in a far different degree than Phoenicia's had been. Rome annihilated it. Then occurred that which has no parallel in history. An entire civilization perished at one blow, banished like a falling star. The periplus of Hanno, a few coins, a score of lines in Plautus, and, lo, all that remains of the Carthaginian world. Many generations must needs pass away before the struggle between the two races could be renewed, and the Arabs, that formidable rearguard of the Semitic world, dashed forth from their deserts. The conflict between two races then became the conflict of two religions. Fortunate was it that those daring Saracenic cavaliers encountered in the east the impregnable walls of Constantinople. In the west, the chivalrous valor of Charles Martel and the sword of the Cid. The Crusades were the natural reprisals for the Arab invasions and formed the last epoch of the great struggle between the two principal families of the human race. It is difficult, amid the glimmering light, supplied by the allusions of the classical writers, to gain a full idea of the character and institutions of Rome's great rival. But we can perceive how inferior Carthage was to her competitor in military resources, and how far less fitted than Rome she was to become the founder of centralized and centralizing dominion that should endure for centuries and fuse into imperial unity the narrow nationalities of the ancient races that dwelt around and near the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. Carthage was originally neither the most ancient nor the most powerful of the numerous colonies which the Phoenicians planted on the coast of northern Africa, but her advantageous position, the excellence of her constitution, of which, though ill-informed as to its details, we know that it commanded the admiration of Aristotle and the commercial and political energy of her citizens gave her the ascendancy over Hippo, Utica, Leptis, and her other sister Phoenician cities in those regions, and she finally reduced them to a condition of dependency similar to that which the subject allies of Athens occupied relatively to that once imperial city. When Tyre and Sidon, and the other cities of Phoenicia itself, sank from independent republics into mere vassal states of the great Asiatic monarchies, and obeyed by turns a Babylonian, a Persian, and a Macedonian master, their power and their traffic rapidly declined, and Carthage succeeded to the important maritime and commercial character which they had previously maintained. The Carthaginians did not seek to compete with the Greeks on the northeastern shores of the Mediterranean, or in the three island seas which are connected with it, but they maintained an active intercourse with the Phoenicians, and through them with Lower and Central Asia, and they and they alone, after the decline and fall of Tyre, navigated the waters of the Atlantic. They had the monopoly of all the commerce of the world that was carried on beyond the Straits of Gibraltar. We have yet extant, in a Greek translation, the narrative of the voyage of Hanno, one of their admirals, along the western coast of Africa as far as Sierra Leone.
and in the Latin poem of Festus Avienus, frequent references are made to the records of the voyage of another celebrated Carthaginian admiral, Himilco, who had explored the northwestern coast of Europe. Our own islands are mentioned by Himilco as the lands of the Hiberni and Albioni. It is indeed certain that the Carthaginians frequented the Cornish coast, as the Phoenicians had done before them, for the purpose of procuring tin, and there is every reason to believe that they sailed as far as the coasts of the Baltic for amber. When it is remembered that the mariner's compass was unknown in those ages, the boldness and skill of the seamen of Carthage and the enterprise of her merchants may be paralleled with any achievements that the history of modern navigation and commerce can produce. In their Atlantic voyages along the African shores, the Carthaginians followed the double object of traffic and colonization. The numerous settlements that were planted by them along the coast, from Morocco to Senegal, provided for the needy members of the constantly increasing population of a great commercial capital, and also strengthened the influence which Carthage exercised among the tribes of the African coast. Besides her fleets, her caravans gave her a large and lucrative trade with the native Africans. Nor we must limit our belief of the extent of the Carthaginian trade with the tribes of Central and Western Africa by the narrowness of the commercial intercourse which civilized nations of modern times have been able to create in those regions. Although essentially a mercantile and seafaring people, the Carthaginians by no means neglected agriculture. On the contrary, the whole of their territory was cultivated like a garden. The fertility of the soil repaid the skill and toil bestowed on it, and every invader from Agathocles to Scipio Emilianus was struck with admiration at the rich pasture lands carefully irrigated, the abundant harvests, the luxuriant vineyards, the plantations of fig and olive trees, the thriving villages, the populous towns, and the splendid villas of the wealthy Carthaginians, through which his march lay as long as he was on Carthaginian ground. Although the Carthaginians abandoned the Aegean and the Pontus to the Greek, they were by no means disposed to relinquish to those rivals the commerce and the dominion of the coasts of the Mediterranean westward of Italy. For centuries the Carthaginians strove to make themselves masters of the islands that lie between Italy and Spain. They acquired the Balearic Islands where the principal harbor, Port Mahon, still bears the name of a Carthaginian admiral. They succeeded in reducing the greater part of Sardinia, but Sicily could never be brought into their power. They repeatedly invaded that island and nearly overrun it, but the resistance which was opposed to them by the Syracusans under Gelon Dionysius, Timoleon, and Agathocles preserved the island from becoming Punic, though many of its cities remained under the Carthaginian rule, until Rome finally settled the question to whom Sicily was to belong by conquering it for herself. With so many elements of success, with almost unbounded wealth, with commercial and maritime activity, with a fertile territory, with a capital city of almost impregnable strength, with a constitution that ensured for centuries the blessing of social order, with an aristocracy singularly fertile in men of the highest genius, Carthage yet failed, signally and calamitously, in her contest for power with Rome.
One of the immediate causes of this may seem to have been the want of firmness among her citizens, which made them terminate the First Punic War by begging peace, sooner than endure any longer the hardships and burdens caused by a state of warfare, although their antagonists had suffered far more severely than themselves. Another cause was the spirit of faction among their leading men, which prevented Hannibal in the Second War from being properly reinforced and supported. But there were also more general causes why Carthage proved inferior to Rome. These were her position relatively to the mass of the inhabitants of the country which she ruled, and her habit of trusting to mercenary armies in her wars. Our clearest information as to the different races of men in and about Carthage is derived from Diodorus Siculus. That historian enumerates four different races. First, he mentions the Phoenicians who dwelt in Carthage. Next, he speaks of the Libby Phoenicians. These, he tells us, dwelt in many of the maritime cities and were connected by intermarriage with the Phoenicians, which was the cause of their compound name. Thirdly, he mentions the Libyans, the bulk and the most ancient part of the population, hating the Carthaginians intensely on account of the oppressiveness of their domination. Lastly, he names the Numidians, the nomad tribes of the frontier. It is evident from this description that the native Libyans were a subject class, without franchise or political rights, and accordingly we find no instance specified in history of a Libyan holding political office or military command. The half-castes, the Libby Phoenicians, seem to have been sometimes sent out as colonists, but it might be inferred from what Diodorus says of their residence that they had not the right of the citizenship of Carthage, and only a single solitary case occurs of one of this race being entrusted with authority, and that, too, not emanating from the home government. This is the instance of the officer sent by Hannibal to Sicily after the fall of Syracuse when Polybius calls Metinus the Libyan, but whom, from the fuller account in Livy, we find to have been a Libby Phoenician, and it is expressly mentioned what indignation was felt by the Carthaginian commanders in the island that this half-caste should control their operations. With respect to the composition of their armies, it is observable that Though thirsting for extended empire, and though some of her leading men became generals of the highest order, the Carthaginians, as a people, were anything but personally warlike. As long as they could hire mercenaries to fight for them, they had little appetite for the irksome training and the loss of valuable time which military service would have entailed on themselves. As Michelet remarks, the life of an industrious merchant of a Carthaginian was too precious to be risked, as long as it was possible to substitute advantageously for it that of a barbarian from Spain or Gaul. Carthage knew and could tell to a drachma what the life of a man of each nation came to. A Greek was worth more than a companion a companion worth more than a Gaul or a Spaniard. When once this tariff of blood was correctly made out, Carthage began a war as a mercantile speculation. She tried to make conquests in the hope of getting new mines to work, or to open fresh markets for her exports. In one venture she could afford to spend 50,000 mercenaries, in another rather more. If the returns were good, there was no regret felt for the capital that had been sunk in the investment. More money got more men, 
and all went on well. Armies composed of foreign mercenaries have in all ages been as formidable to their employers as to the enemy against whom they were directed. We know of one occasion between the First and Second Punic Wars, when Carthage was brought to very brink of destruction by a revolt of her foreign troops. Other mutinies of the same kind must from time to time have occurred. Probably one of these was the cause of the comparative weakness of Carthage at the time of the Athenian expedition against Syracuse, so different from the energy with which she attacked Gelon half a century earlier and Dionysius half a century later. And even when we consider her armies with reference only to their efficiency in warfare, we perceive at once the inferiority of such bands of condottieri brought together without any common bond of origin, tactics or cause to the legions of Rome, which, at the time of the Punic Wars, were raised from the very flower of a hardy agricultural population, trained in the strictest discipline, habituated to victory, and animated by the most resolute patriotism. And this shows also the transcendency of the genius of Hannibal, which could form such discordant materials into a compact organized force and inspire them with a spirit of patient discipline and loyalty to their chief, so that they were true to him in his adverse as well as in his prosperous fortunes. And throughout the checkered series of his campaigns, no panic rout ever disgraced a division under his command. No mutiny, or even attempt at mutiny, was ever known in his camp. And finally, after fifteen years of Italian warfare, his men followed their old leader to Zama, with no fear and little hope, and there on that disastrous field stood firm around him his old guard, till Scipio's Numidian allies came up on their flank, when at last surrounded and overpowered, the veteran battalions sealed their devotion to their general by their blood. But if Hannibal's genius may be likened to the Homeric god, who, in his hatred to the Trojans, rises from the deep to rally the fainting Greeks and to lead them against the enemy, so the calm courage with which Hector met his more than human adversary in his country's cause is no unworthy image of the unyielding magnanimity displayed by the aristocracy of Rome. As Hannibal utterly eclipses Carthage, so, on the contrary, Fabius, Marcellus, Claudius Nero, even Scipio himself, are as nothing when compared to the spirit and wisdom and power of Rome. The Senate, which voted its thanks to its political enemy, Varro, after his disastrous defeat, because he had not despaired of the commonwealth, and which disdained either to solicit, or to reprove, or to threaten, or in any way to notice, the twelve colonies which had refused their accustomed supplies of men for the army, is far more to be honored than the conqueror of Zama. This we should the more carefully bear in mind, because our tendency is to admire individual greatness far more than national. And as no single Roman will bear comparison to Hannibal, we are apt to murmur at the event of the contest and to think that victory was awarded to the least worthy of the combatants. On the contrary, never was the wisdom of God's providence more manifest than in the issue of the struggle between Rome and Carthage. It was clearly for the good of mankind that Hannibal should be conquered. 
his triumph would have stopped the progress of the world. For great men can only act permanently by forming great nations, and no one man, even though it were Hannibal himself, can in one generation effect such a work. But where the nation has been merely enkindled for a while by a great man's spirit, the light passes away with him who communicated it, and the nation, when he is gone, is like a dead body to which magic power had for a moment given unnatural life. When the charm has ceased, the body is cold and stiff, as before. He who grieves over the battle of Zama should carry on his thoughts to a period thirty years later, when Hannibal must in the course of nature have been dead, and consider how the isolated Phoenician city of Carthage was fitted to receive and to consolidate the civilization of Greece, or by its laws and institutions to bind together barbarians of every race and language into an organized empire, and prepare them for becoming, when that empire was dissolved, the free members of the commonwealth of Christian Europe. End of section 20「Section 21 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. The Battle of Metaurus, B.C. 207, by Sir Edward S. Creasy, Part 2. It was in the spring of 207 B.C. that Hasdrubal, after skillfully disentangling himself from the Roman forces in Spain, and after a march conducted with great judgment and little loss through the interior of Gaul and the passes of the Alps, appeared in the country that now is the north of Lombardy. At the head of troops which he had partly brought out of Spain and partly levied among the Gauls and Ligurians on his way. At this time Hannibal, with his unconquered and seemingly unconquerable army, had been eight years in Italy, executing with strenuous ferocity the vow of hatred to Rome, which had been sworn by him, while yet a child, at the bidding of his father, Hamilcar, who, as he boasted, had trained up his three sons, Hannibal, Hasdrubal, and Mago, like three lion's whelps, to prey upon the Romans. But Hannibal's latter campaigns had not been signalized by any such great victories as marked the first years of his invasion of Italy. The stern spirit of Roman resolution, ever highest in disaster and danger, had neither bent nor despaired beneath the merciless blows which the dire African dealt her in rapid succession at Trebia, at Thrasymene, and at Cannae. Her population was thinned by repeated slaughter in the field. Poverty and actual scarcity ground down the survivors through the fearful ravages which Hannibal's cavalry spread through their cornfields, their pasture lands, and their vineyards. Many of her allies went over to the invader's side, and new clouds of foreign war threatened her from Macedonia and Gaul. But Rome receded not. Rich and poor among her citizens vied with each other in devotion to their country. The wealthy place their stores, and all place their lives at the state's disposal. 
and though Hannibal could not be driven out of Italy, though every year brought its sufferings and sacrifices, Rome felt that her constancy had not been exerted in vain. If she was weakened by the continued strife, so was Hannibal also. And it was clear that the unaided resources of his army were unequal to the task of her destruction. The single deerhood could not pull down the quarry, which he had so furiously assailed. Rome not only stood fiercely at bay, but had pressed back and gored her antagonist, that still, however, watched her in act to spring. She was weary and bleeding at every pore, and there seemed to be little hope of her escape if the other hound of old Hamilcar's race should come up in time to aid his brother in the death grapple. Hasdrubal had commanded the Carthaginian armies in Spain for some time, with varying but generally unfavorable fortune. He had not the full authority over the Punic forces in that country, which his brother and his father had previously exercised. The faction at Carthage, which was at feud with his family, succeeded in fettering and interfering with his power. And other generals were from time to time sent into Spain, whose errors and misconduct caused the reverse that Hasdrubal met with. This is expressly attested by the Greek historian Polybius, who was the intimate friend of the younger Africanus, and drew his information respecting the Second Punic War from the best possible authorities. Livy gives a long narrative of campaigns between the Roman commanders in Spain and Hasdrubal, which is so palpably deformed by fictions and exaggerations as to be hardly deserving of attention. It is clear that in the year B.C. 208, at least Hasdrubal outmaneuvered Publius Scipio, who held the command of the Roman forces in Spain, and whose object was to prevent him from passing the Pyrenees and marching upon Italy. Scipio expected that Hasdrubal would attempt the nearest route along the coast of the Mediterranean, and he therefore carefully fortified and guarded the passes of the eastern Pyrenees. But Hasdrubal passed these mountains near their western extremity, and then, with a considerable force of Spanish infantry, with a small number of African troops, with some elephants and much treasure, he marched, not directly toward the coast of the Mediterranean, but in a northeastern line toward the center of Gaul. He halted for the winter in the territory of the Arverni, the modern Auvergne, and conciliated or purchased the goodwill of the Gauls in that region, so far that he not only found friendly winter quarters among them, but great numbers of them enlisted under him, and, on the approach of spring, marched with him to invade Italy. By thus entering Gaul at the southwest, and avoiding its southern maritime districts, Hasdrubal kept the Romans in complete ignorance of his precise operations and movements in that country. All that they knew was that Hasdrubal had baffled Scipio's attempts to detain him in Spain, that he had crossed the Pyrenees with soldiers, elephants, and money, and that he was raising fresh forces among the Gauls. The spring was sure to bring him into Italy and then would come the real tempest of the war, when, from the north and from the south, the two Carthaginian armies, each under a son of the thunderbolt, were to gather together around the seven hills of Rome. 
In this emergency, the Romans looked among themselves, earnestly and anxiously, for leaders fit to meet the perils of the coming campaign. The Senate recommended the people to elect as one of their consuls Caius Claudius Nero, a patrician of one of the families of the great Claudian house. Nero had served during the preceding years of the war, both against Hannibal in Italy and against Hasdrubal in Spain. But it is remarkable that the histories which we possess record no successes as having been achieved by him, either before or after his great campaign of the Metaurus. It proves much for the sagacity of the leading men of the Senate, that they recognized in Nero the energy and spirit which were required at this crisis, and it is equally creditable to the patriotism of the people that they followed the advice of the Senate by electing a general who had no showy exploits to recommend him to their choice. It was a matter of greater difficulty to find a second consul. The laws required that one consul should be a plebeian, and the plebeian nobility had been fearfully thinned by the events of the war. While the senators anxiously deliberated among themselves, what fit colleague for Nero could be nominated at the coming commissia, and sorrowfully recalled the names of Marcellus, Gracchus, and other plebeian generals who were no more, one taciturn and moody old man sat in sullen apathy among the conscript fathers. This was Marcus Livius, who had been consul in the year before the beginning of this war, and had then gained a victory over the Illyrians. After his consulship he had been impeached before the people, on a charge of peculation and unfair division of the spoils among his soldiers. The verdict was unjustly given against him, and the sense of this wrong, and of the indignity thus put upon him, had rankled unceasingly in the bosom of Livius, so that for eight years after his trial, he had lived in seclusion in his country seat, taking no part in any affairs of state. Latterly, the censors had compelled him to come to Rome, and resume his place in the Senate, where he used to sit gloomily apart, giving only a silent vote. At last, an unjust accusation against one of his near kinsmen made him break the silence, and he harangued the house in words of weight and sense, which drew attention to him and taught the senators that a strong spirit dwelt beneath that unimposing exterior. Now, while they were debating on what noble of a plebeian house was fit to assume the perilous honors of the consulate, some of the elder of them looked on Marcus Livius, and remembered that in the very last triumph which had been celebrated in the streets of Rome, this grim old man had sat in the car of victory, and that he had offered the last thanksgiving sacrifice for the success of the Roman arms which had bled before Capitoline Jove. There had been no triumphs since Hannibal came into Italy. The Illyrian campaign of Livius was the last that had been so honored. Perhaps it might be destined for him now to renew the long-interrupted series. The senators resolved that Livius should be put in nomination as consul with Nero. The people were willing to elect him. The only opposition came from himself. He taunted them with their inconsistency in honoring the man who they had convicted of a base crime. If I am innocent, said he, why did you place such a stain on me? If I am guilty, why am I more fit for a second consulship 
than I was for my first one. The other senators remonstrated with him, urging the example of the great Camillus, who, after an unjust condemnation on a similar charge, both served and saved his country. At last, Livius ceased to object, and Caius Claudius Nero and Marcus Livius were chosen consuls of Rome. A quarrel had long existed between the two consuls, and the senators strove to effect a reconciliation between them before the campaign. Here again, Livius, for a long time, obstinately resisted the wish of his fellow senators. He said it was best for the state that he and Nero should continue to hate one another. Each would do his duty better when he knew that he was watched by an enemy in the person of his own colleague. At last the entreaties of the Senate prevailed, and Livius consented to forego the feud and to cooperate with Nero in preparing for the coming struggle. As soon as the winter snows were thawed, Hasdrubal commenced his march from Auvergne to the Alps. He experienced none of the difficulties which his brother had met with from the mountain tribes. Hannibal's army had been the first body of regular troops that had ever traversed their regions, and as wild animals assail a traveler, the natives rose against it instinctively. In imagined defense of their own habitations, which they supposed to be the objects of Carthaginian ambition. But the fame of war, with which Italy had now been convulsed for twelve years, had penetrated into the Alpine passes, and the mountaineers now understood that a mighty city southward of the Alps was to be attacked by the troops whom they saw marching among them. They now not only opposed no resistance to the passage of Hasdrubal, but many of them, out of love of enterprise and plunder, or allured by the high pay that he offered, took service with him, and thus he advanced upon Italy with an army that gathered strength at every league. It is said also that some of the most important engineering works which Hannibal had constructed were found by Hasdrubal still in existence and materially favored the speed of his advance. He thus emerged into Italy from the Alpine valleys much sooner than had been anticipated. Many warriors of the Ligurian tribes joined him and crossing the river Po, he marched down its southern bank to the city of Placentia, which he wished to secure as a base for his future operations. Placentia resisted him as bravely as it had resisted Hannibal twelve years before, and for some time Hasdrubal was occupied with a fruitless siege before its walls. Six armies were levied for the defense of Italy, when the long-dreaded approach of Hasdrubal was announced. Seventy thousand Romans served in the fifteen legions of which, with an equal number of Italian allies, those armies and the garrisons were composed. Upward of thirty thousand more Romans were serving in Sicily, Sardinia, and Spain. The whole number of Roman citizens of an age fit for military duty scarcely exceeded a hundred and thirty thousand. The census taken before the commencement of the war had shown a total of two hundred and seventy thousand which had been diminished by more than half during twelve years. These numbers are fearfully emphatic of the extremity to which Rome was reduced, and of her gigantic efforts in that great agony of her fate. 
not merely men, but money and military stores, were drained to the utmost. And if the armies of that year should be swept off by a repetition of the slaughters of Thrasymene and Cannae, all felt that Rome would cease to exist. Even if the campaign were to be marked by no decisive success on either side, her ruin seemed certain. In South Italy, Hannibal had either detached Rome's allies from her, or had impoverished them by the ravages of his army. If Hasdrubal could have done the same in Upper Italy, if Etruria, Umbria, and Northern Latium had either revolted or been laid waste, Rome must have sunk beneath sheer starvation, for the hostile or desolated territory would have yielded no supplies of corn for her population, and money to purchase it from abroad there was none. Instant victory was a matter of life or death. Three of her six armies were ordered to the north, but the first of these was required to overawe the disaffected Etruscan. The second army of the north was pushed forward under Portius, the Praetor, to meet and keep in check the advanced troops of Hasdrubal, while the third, the Grand Army of the North, which was to be under the immediate command of the consul Livius, who had the chief command in all North Italy, advanced more slowly in its support. There were similarly three armies in the south, under the orders of the other consul, Claudius Nero. The lot has decided that Livius was to be opposed to Hasdrubal, and Nero should face Hannibal. And, when all was ordered as themselves thought best, the two consuls went forth from the city, each his several way. The people of Rome were now quite otherwise affected than they had been when L. Emilius Paulus and C. Terentius Varro were sent against Hannibal. They did no longer take upon them to direct their generals, or bid them dispatch, and win the victory betimes. But rather they stood in fear, lest all diligence, wisdom, and valor should prove too little. For since few years had passed, wherein some one of their generals had not been slain, and since it was manifest that, if either of these present consuls were defeated or put to the worst, the two Carthaginians would forthwith join, and make short work with the other. It seemed a greater happiness than could be expected, that each of them should return home victor, and come off with honor from such mighty opposition, as he was like to find. With extreme difficulty had Rome held up her head ever since the Battle of Cannae, though it were so that Hannibal alone, with little help from Carthage, had continued the war in Italy. But there was now arrived another son of Hamiclar, and one that in his present expedition had seemed a man of more sufficiency than Hannibal himself. For, whereas in that long and dangerous march through barbarous nations, over great rivers and mountains that were thought unpassable, Hannibal had lost a great part of his army. This Hasdrubal, in the same places, had multiplied his numbers, and gathering the people that he found in the way, descended from the Alps like a rolling snowball, far greater than he came over the Pyrenees at his first setting out of Spain. These considerations and the like, of which fear presented many unto them, caused the people of Rome to wait upon their consuls out of the town, like a pensive train of mourners, thinking upon Marcellus and Crispinus, upon whom, in the like sort, they had given attendance the last year, but so neither of them returned alive from a less dangerous war. 
particularly old Q. Fabius, gave his accustomed advice to M. Livius, that he should abstain from giving or taking battle until he well understood the enemy's condition. But the consul made him a forward answer, and said that he would fight the very first day, for that he thought it long till he should either recover his honor by victory, or by seeing the overthrow of his own unjust citizens, satisfy himself with the joy of a great, though not an honest, revenge. But his meaning was better than his words. Hannibal at this period, occupied with his veteran but much reduced forces, the extreme south of Italy. It had not been expected, either by friend or foe, that Hasdrubal would effect his passage of the Alps, so early in the year as actually occurred. And even when Hannibal learned that his brother was in Italy, and had advanced as far as Placentia, he was obliged to pause for further intelligence, before he himself commenced active operations, as he could not tell whether his brother might not be invited into Etruria to aid the party there that was disaffected to Rome, or whether he would march down by the Adriatic Sea. Hannibal led his troops out of their winter quarters in Brutium, and marched northward as far as Canusium. Nero had his headquarters near Venusia, with an army, which he had increased to 40,000 foot and 2,500 horse. By incorporating under his own command some of the legions which had been intended to act under other generals in the south, there was another Roman army, 20,000 strong, south of Hannibal at Tarentum. The strength of that city secured this Roman force from any attack by Hannibal, and it was a serious matter to march northward and leave it in his rear free to act against all his depots and allies in the friendly part of Italy, which for the two or three last campaigns had served him for a base of his operations. Moreover, Nero's army was so strong that Hannibal could not concentrate troops enough to assume the offensive against it, without weakening his garrisons and relinquishing, at least for a time, his grasp upon the southern provinces. To do this before he was certainly informed of his brother's operations would have been a useless sacrifice, as Nero could retreat before him upon the other Roman armies near the capital, and Hannibal knew by experience that a mere advance of his army upon the walls of Rome would have no effect on the fortunes of the war. In the hope probably of inducing Nero to follow him and of gaining an opportunity of outmaneuvering the Roman consul and attacking him on his march, Hannibal moved into Lucania and then back into Apulia. He again marched down into Brutium and strengthened that army by a levy of recruits in that district. Nero followed him but gave him no chance of assailing him at a disadvantage. Some partial encounters seemed to have taken place, but the council could not prevent Hannibal's junction with his Brutian levies, nor could Hannibal gain an opportunity of surprising and crushing the consul. Hannibal returned to his former headquarters at Canusium and halted there in expectation of further tidings of his brother's movements. Nero also resumed his former position in observation of the Carthaginian army. Meanwhile, Hasdrubal had raised the siege of Placentia, and was advancing toward Ariminum on the Adriatic, and driving before him the Roman army under Portius. Nor when the consul Livius had come up, and united the second and third armies of the north, could he make head against the invaders. The Romans still fell back before Hasdrubal, beyond Ariminum, beyond the Metaurus, 
and as far as the little town of Sena, to the southeast of that river. Hasdrubal was not unmindful of the necessity of acting in concert with his brother. He sent messengers to Hannibal to announce his own line of march, and to propose that they should unite their armies in South Umbria, and then wheel round against Rome. Those messengers traversed the greater part of Italy in safety, but when close to the object of their mission, were captured by a Roman detachment, and Hasdrubal's letter detailing his whole plan of the campaign was laid not in his brother's hands, but in those of the commander of the Roman armies of the south. Nero saw at once the full importance of the crisis. The two sons of Hamilcar were now within two hundred miles of each other, and if Rome were to be saved, the brothers must never meet alive. Nero instantly ordered seven thousand picked men, a thousand being cavalry, to hold themselves in readiness for a secret expedition against one of Hannibal's garrisons, and as soon as night had set in, he hurried forward on his bold enterprise, but he quickly left the southern road toward Lucania, and, wheeling round, pressed northward with the utmost rapidity toward Picenum. He had, during the preceding afternoon, sent messengers to Rome, who were to lay Hasdrubal's letters before the Senate. There was a law forbidding a consul to make war or march his army beyond the limits of the province assigned to him. But in such an emergency, Nero did not wait for the permission of the Senate to execute his project, but informed them that he was already on his march to join Livius against Hasdrubal. He advised them to send the two legions which formed the home garrison on to Narnia, so as to defend that pass of the Flaminian road against Hasdrubal, in case he should march upon Rome before the consular armies could attack him. They were to supply the place of these two legions at Rome by a levy en masse in the city and by ordering up the reserve legion from Capua. These were his communications to the Senate. He also sent horsemen forward along his line of march, with orders to the local authorities to bring stores of provisions and refreshment of every kind to the roadside, and to have relays of carriages ready for the conveyance of the wearied soldiers. Such were the precautions which he took for accelerating his march. And when he had advanced some little distance from his camp, he briefly informed his soldiers of the real object of their expedition. He told them that never was there a design more seemingly audacious and more really safe. He said he was leading them to a certain victory for his colleague had an army large enough to balance the enemy already, so that their swords would decisively turn the scale. The very rumor that a fresh consul and a fresh army had come up, when heard on the battlefield, and he would take care that they should not be heard of before they were seen and felt, would settle the business. They would have all the credit of the victory, and of having dealt the final decisive blow. He appealed to the enthusiastic reception, which they already met with on their line of march, as a proof and a nomen of their good fortune. And indeed, their whole path was amid the vows and prayers and praises of their countrymen, the entire population of the districts through which they passed flocked to the roadside to see and bless the deliverers of their country. Food, drink and refreshments of every kind were eagerly pressed on their acceptance. Each peasant thought a favor was conferred on him if one of Nero's chosen band 
would accept aught at his hands. The soldiers caught full spirit of their leader. Night and day they marched forward, taking their hurried meals in the ranks and resting by relay in the wagons which the zeal of the country people provided and which followed in the rear of the column. End of section 21《Section 22 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2 》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez《The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2 》Edited by Charles F. Horn Rossiter Johnson and John Rudd The Battle of Metaurus, B.C. 207 by Sir Edward S. Creasy Part 3 Meanwhile at Rome, the news of Nero's expedition had caused the greatest excitement and alarm. All men felt the full audacity of the enterprise, but hesitated what epithet to apply to it. It was evident that Nero's conduct would be judged of by the event, that most unfair criterion, as the Roman historian truly terms it. People reasoned on the perilous state in which Nero had left the rest of his army, without a general and deprived of the core of its strength, in the vicinity of the terrible Hannibal. They speculated on how long it would take Hannibal to pursue and overtake Nero himself and his expeditionary force. They talked over the former disasters of the war and the fall of both the consuls of the last year. All these calamities had come on them, while they had only one Carthaginian general and army to deal with in Italy. Now they had two Punic Wars at a time. They had two Carthaginian armies, they had almost two Hannibals in Italy. Hasdrubal was sprung from the same father, trained up in the same hostility to Rome, equally practiced in the battle against their legions, and if the comparative speed and success with which he had crossed the Alps were a fair test, he was even a better general than his brother. With fear for their interpreter of every rumor, they exaggerated the strength of their enemy's forces in every quarter, and criticized and distrusted their own. Fortunately for Rome, while she was thus a prey to terror and anxiety, her consul's nerves were stout and strong and he resolutely urged on his march toward Senna, where his colleague Livius and the praetor Portius were encamped, Hasdrubal's army being in position about half a mile to their north. Nero had sent couriers forward to apprise his colleague of his project and of his approach, and by the advice of Livius, Nero so timed his final march as to reach the camp at Senna by night. According to previous arrangement, Nero's men were received silently into the tents of their comrades, each according to his rank. By these means there was no enlargement of the camp that could betray to Hasdrubal the accession of force which the Romans had received. This was considerable, as Nero's numbers had been increased on the march by the volunteers, who offered themselves in crowds, and from whom he selected the most promising men, and especially the veterans of former campaigns. A council of war was held on the morning after his arrival, in which some advised that time should be given for Nero's men to refresh themselves after the fatigue of such a march. But Nero vehemently opposed all delay. The officer, said he, 
who is for giving time to my men here to rest themselves, he is for giving time to Hannibal to attack my men, whom I have left in the camp in Apulia. He is for giving time to Hannibal and Hasdrubal to discover my march, and to maneuver for a junction with each other in Cisalpine Gaul at their leisure. We must fight instantly, while both, the foe here and the foe in the south, are ignorant of our movements. We must destroy this Hasdrubal, and I must be back in Apulia before Hannibal awakes from his torpor. Nero's advice prevailed. It was resolved to fight directly, and before the consuls and praetor left the tent of Livius, the red ensign, which was the signal to prepare for immediate action, was hoisted, and the Romans forthwith drew up in battle array outside the camp. Hasdrubal had been anxious to bring Livius and Portius to battle, though he had not judged it expedient to attack them in their lines. And now on hearing that the Romans offered battle, he also drew up his men and advanced toward them. No spy or deserter had informed him of Nero's arrival, nor had he received any direct information that he had more than his old enemies to deal with. But as he rode forward to reconnoiter the Roman line, he thought that their numbers seemed to have increased, and that the armor of them was unusually dull and stained. He noticed also that the horses of some of the cavalry appeared to be rough and out of condition, as if they had just come from a succession of forced marches. So also, though owing to the precaution of Livius, the Roman camp showed no change in size, it had not escaped the quick ear of the Carthaginian general that the trumpet which gave the signal to the Roman legions sounded that morning once oftener than usual as if directing the troops of some additional superior officer. Hasdrubal, from his Spanish campaigns, was well acquainted with all the sounds and signals of Roman war, and from all that he heard and saw, he felt convinced that both the Roman consuls were before him. In doubt and difficulty as to what might have taken place between the armies of the south, and probably hoping that Hannibal also was approaching, Hasdrubal determined to avoid an encounter with the combined Roman forces, and to endeavor to retreat upon Insubrian Gaul, where he would be in a friendly country, and could endeavor to reopen his communication with his brother. He therefore led his troops back into their camp, and as the Romans did not venture on an assault upon his entrenchments, and Hasdrubal did not choose to commence his retreat in their sight, the day passed away in inaction. At the first watch of the night, Hasdrubal led his men silently out of their camp, and moved northward toward the Metaurus, in the hope of placing that river between himself and the Romans, before his retreat was discovered. His guides betrayed him, and having purposely led him away from the part of the river that was fordable, they made their escape in the dark, and left Hasdrubal and his army wandering in confusion along the steep bank, and seeking in vain for a spot where the stream could be safely crossed. At last they halted, and when day dawned on them, Hasdrubal found that a great number of his men, in their fatigue and impatience, had lost all discipline and subordination, and that many of his Gaelic auxiliaries had got drunk and were lying helpless in their quarters. The Roman cavalry was soon seen coming up in pursuit followed at no great distance by the legions, which marched in readiness for an instant engagement. It was hopeless for Hasdrubal to think of continuing his retreat 
before them. The prospect of immediate battle might recall the disordered part of his troops to a sense of duty and revive the instinct of discipline. He therefore ordered his men to prepare for action instantly, and made the best arrangement of them that the nature of the ground would permit. Heron has well described the general appearance of a Carthaginian army. He says, It was an assemblage of the most opposite races of the human species, from the farthest parts of the globe. Hordes of half-naked Gauls were ranged next to companies of white-clothed Iberians, and savage Ligurians next to the far-traveled Nasimons and Latophagi. Carthaginians and Phoenici Africans formed the center, while innumerable troops of Numidian horsemen taken from all the tribes of the desert swarmed about on unsaddled horses and formed the wings. The van was composed of Balearic slingers, and a line of colossal elephants with their Ethiopian guides formed, as it were, a chain of moving fortresses before the whole army. Such were the usual materials and arrangements of hosts that fought for Carthage. But the troops under Hasdrubal were not in all respects thus constituted or thus stationed. He seems to have been especially deficient in cavalry, and he had few African troops, though some Carthaginians of high rank were with him. His veteran Spanish infantry, armed with helmets and shields, and short cut-and-thrust swords, were the best part of his army. These and his few Africans he drew up on his right wing under his own personal command. In the center he placed his Ligurian infantry, and on his left wing he placed or retained the Gauls, who were armed with long javelins and with huge broadswords and targets. The rugged nature of the ground in front, and on the flank of this part of his line, made him hope that the Roman right wing would be unable to come to close quarters with these unserviceable barbarians, before he could make some impression with his Spanish veterans on the Roman left. This was the only chance that he had of victory or safety, and he seems to have done everything that good generalship could do to secure it. He placed his elephants in advance of his center and right wing. He had caused the driver of each of them to be provided with a sharp iron spike and a mallet, and had given orders that every beast that became unmanageable and run back upon his own ranks should be instantly killed by driving the spike into the vertebra at the junction of the head and the spine. Hasdrubal's elephants were ten in number. We have no trustworthy information as to the amount of his infantry, but it is quite clear that he was greatly outnumbered by the combined Roman forces. The tactics of the Roman legions had not yet acquired that perfection which they received from the military genius of Marius, and which we read of in the first chapter of Gibbon. We possess in that great work an account of the Roman legions at the end of the Commonwealth, and during the early ages of the Empire, which those alone can adequately admire, who have attempted a similar description. We have also in the sixth and seventeenth books of Polybius an elaborate discussion on the military system of the Romans in his time which was not far distant from the time of the Battle of the Metaurus. But the subject is beset with difficulties, and instead of entering into minute but inconclusive details, I would refer to Gibbon's first chapter as serving for a general description of the Roman army in its period of perfection, and remark that the training and armor which the whole legion received in the time of Augustus, were 
two centuries earlier, only partially introduced. Two divisions of troops called Hastati and Principes formed the bulk of each Roman legion in the Second Punic War. Each of these divisions was 1,200 strong. The Hastatus and the Princeps legionary bore a breastplate or coat of mail, brazen greaves, and a brazen helmet with a lofty upright crest of scarlet or black feathers. He had a large oblong shield and, as weapons of offense, two javelins, one of which was light and slender, but the other was a strong and massive weapon, with a shaft about four feet long and an iron head of equal length. The sword was carried on the right thigh and was a short cut and thrust weapon like that which was used by the Spaniards. Thus armed, the Hastati formed the front division of the legion and the Principes the second. Each division was drawn up about ten deep, a space of three feet being allowed between the files as well as the ranks so as to give each legionary ample room for the use of his javelins and of his sword and shield. The men in the second rank did not stand immediately behind those in the first rank, but the files were alternate, like the position of the men on a draft board. This was termed the Quenconx order. Nebur considers that this arrangement enabled the legion to keep up a shower of javelins on the enemy for some considerable time. He says, When the first line had hurled its pillar, it probably stepped back between those who stood behind it, and two steps forward restored the front nearly to its first position, a movement which, on account of the arrangement of the Quenconks, could be executed without losing a moment. Thus one line succeeded the other in the front, till it was time to draw the swords. Nay, when it was found expedient, the lines which had already been in the front might repeat this change, since the stores of Pila were surely not confined to the two which each soldier took with him into battle. The same charge must have taken place in fighting with the sword, which, when the same tactics were adopted on both sides, was anything but a confused melee. On the contrary, it was a series of single combats. He adds that a military man of experience had been consulted by him on the subject and had given it as his opinion that the change of lines as described above was by no means impracticable. But in the absence of the deafening noise of gunpowder, it cannot have had even any difficulty with well-trained troops. The third division of the legion was 600 strong and acted as a reserve. It was always composed of veteran soldiers who were called the Triarii. Their arms were the same as these of the Principes and Hastati, except that each Triarian carried a spear instead of javelins. The rest of the legion consisted of light-armed troops who acted as skirmishers. The cavalry of each legion was at this period about 300 strong. The Italian allies who were attached to the legion seem to have been similarly armed and equipped, but their numerical proportion of cavalry was much larger. Such was the nature of the forces that advanced on the Roman side to the battle of the Metaurus. Nero commanded the right wing, Livius the left and the praetor Porcius had the command of the center. Both Romans and Carthaginians well understood how much depended upon the fortune of this day, and how little hope of safety there was for the vanquished. Only the Romans herein seem to have had the better in conceit and opinion that they were to fight with men desirous to have fled from them and according to this presumption came Livius the consul, with a proud bravery, to give charge to the Spaniards and Africans, 
by whom he was so sharply entertained that the victory seemed very doubtful. The Africans and Spaniards were stout soldiers, and well acquainted with the manner of the Roman fight. The Ligurians also were a hardy nation, and not accustomed to give ground, which they needed the less, or were able now to do, being placed in the midst. Livius, therefore, and Portius found great opposition, and with great slaughter on both sides prevailed little or nothing. Besides other difficulties, they were exceedingly troubled by the elephants, that break their first ranks and put them in such disorder as the Roman ensigns were driven to fall back. All this while Claudius Nero, laboring in vain against the steep hill, was unable to come to blows with the Gauls that stood opposite him, but out of danger. This made Hasdrubal the more confident, who, seeing his own left wing safe, did the more boldly and fiercely make impression on the other side, upon the left wing of the Romans. But at last Nero, who found that Hasdrubal refused his left wing, and who could not overcome the difficulties of the ground, in the quarter assigned to him, decided the battle by another stroke of that military genius which had inspired his march. Wheeling a brigade of his best men round the rear of the rest of the Roman army, Nero fiercely charged the flank of the Spaniards and Africans. The charge was as successful as it was sudden. Rolled back in disorder upon each other and overwhelmed by numbers, the Spaniards and Ligurians died, fighting gallantly to the last. The Gauls, who had taken little or no part in the strife of the day, were then surrounded and butchered almost without resistance. Hasdrubal, after having, by the confession of his enemies, done all that a general could do, when he saw that the victory was irreparably lost, scorning to survive the gallant host which he had led, and to gratify as a captive Roman cruelty and pride, spurred his horse into the midst of a Roman cohort, and, sword in hand, met the death that was worthy of the son of Hamilcar and the brother of Hannibal. Success the most complete had crowned Nero's enterprise. Returning as rapidly as he had advanced, he was again facing the inactive enemies in the south, before they even knew of his march. But he brought with him a ghastly trophy of what he had done, in the true spirit of that savage brutality which deformed the Roman national character. Nero ordered Hasdrubal's head to be flung into his brother's camp. Ten years had passed since Hannibal had last gazed on those features. The sons of Hamilcar had then planned their system of warfare against Rome, which they had so nearly brought to successful accomplishment. Year after year had Hannibal been struggling in Italy, in the hope of one day hailing the arrival of him whom he had left in Spain, and of seeing his brother's eye flush with affection and pride at the junction of their irresistible hosts. He now saw that eye glazed in death, and in the agony of his heart the great Carthaginian groaned aloud that he recognized his country's destiny. Meanwhile, at the tidings of the great battle, Rome at once rose from the thrill of anxiety and terror to the full confidence of triumph. Hannibal might retain his hold on southern Italy for a few years longer but the imperial city and her allies were no longer in danger from his arms. And after Hannibal's downfall, the great military republic of the ancient world met in her career of conquest no other worthy competitor. Byron had termed Nero's march unequaled, and in the magnitude of its consequences it is so. Viewed only as a military exploit, it remains unparalleled, save by Marlborough's bold march from Flanders to the Danube, 
in the campaign of Blenheim, and perhaps also by the Archduke Charles's lateral march in 1796, by which he overwhelmed the French under Jourdan, and then driving Moreau through the Black Forest and across the Rhine, for a while freed Germany from her invaders. End of section 22《セクション23 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ryan Fahey, Fairfield, Connecticut.《The Great Events by Famous Historians, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd.《セクション23》。Scipio Africanus crushes Hannibal at Zama and subjugates Carthage, B.C. 202, by Livy, Part One. Sprung from a colony of Tyr, Carthage, founded about B.C. 800, rapidly developed through a wonderful system of colonization into a dominating power. Her rule extending through northwestern Africa and western Europe. In B.C. 509. Carthage made her first treaty with Rome, but the rivalry which grew up between the two powers developed into a stubborn contest for the empire of the world, culminating in the Three Punic Wars. The first of these lasted from B.C. 264 to 241, the second from B.C. 218 to 201. In the interval between these two wars, Rome acquired the northern part of Italy. Whence she sent victorious armies against the barbarians in Gaul. Meanwhile, under Hamilcar Barca, the Carthaginians had effected the conquest of southern Spain, which they reduced to the condition of a dependency. Hamilcar's greater son Hannibal was compelled by his father to swear eternal enmity to Rome, having established the Carthaginian Empire in Spain. At the age of twenty-six, he took the Spanish city of Saguntum, an ally of Rome, and this was the immediate cause of the Second Punic War, which the Romans declared. The passage of the Alps by Hannibal is regarded as one of the greatest military performances in history. He was welcomed by the Gauls as a deliverer, and was soon operating in northern Italy, his appearance there being a complete surprise to the Romans. He won victories over them at the rivers Ticinus and Trebia, B.C. 218. Another in 217 at Lake Trasimenus, a great triumph at Cannae in 216. Took Capua in the same year and wintered there. In 212 captured Tarentum, marched against Rome in 211, and in 203 was recalled to Africa. In the meantime, the Romans had decided to carry the war into Africa, although in 215 they had beaten Hannibal, and in 211 had retaken Capua. Publius Cornelius Scipio, Scipio Africanus Major, in B.C. 210 to 206, drove the Carthaginians out of Spain. In 205 he was made consul, and the next year invaded Africa. Landing on the coast, he was met by the forces of the Numidian king, who became his allies against Carthage. In 203, he defeated Syphax and Hasdrubal. Hannibal, now having returned to Carthage, he took command of the forces which she opposed to the Roman invaders, but in B.C. 202 suffered final overthrow at Zama, in the battle that ended the Second Punic War. Livy's account of the closing scenes of that war, which here follows, gives the reader a clear understanding of the sequence and conclusion of the events related. Marcus Servilius and Tiberius Claudius, having assembled the Senate, consulted them respecting the provinces. As both were desirous of having Africa, they wished Italy and Africa to be disposed of by lots. But principally in consequence of the exertions of Quintus Metellus, Africa was neither assigned to anyone nor withheld. The consuls were ordered to make application to the tribunes of the people, to the effect that if they thought proper, 
they should put it to the people to decide whom they wished to conduct the war in Africa. All the tribes nominated Publius Scipio. Nevertheless, the consuls put the province of Africa to the lot, for so the Senate had decreed. Africa fell to the lot of Tiberius Claudius, who was to cross over into Africa with a fleet of 50 ships, all quinquiremes, and have an equal command with Scipio. Marcus Servilius obtained Etruria. Caius Servilius was continued in command in the same province, in case the Senate resolved that the consul should remain at the city. Of the praetors, Marcus Sextus obtained Gaul, which province, together with two legions, Publius Quintilius Verus was to deliver to him. Caius Livius obtained Brutium, with the two legions which Publius Sempronius, the proconsul, had commanded the former year. Gnaeus Tremelius had Sicily, and was to receive the province and two legions from Publius Vilius Tapulus, a praetor of the former year. Vilius, as propraetor, was to protect the coast of Sicily with twenty men of war and a thousand soldiers, and Marcus Pomponius was to convey thence to Rome one thousand five hundred soldiers with the remaining twenty ships. The city jurisdiction fell to Caius Aurelius Cota, and the rest of the praetors were continued in command of the respective provinces and armies, which they then had. Not more than sixteen legions were employed this year in the defense of the empire, and that they might have the gods favorably disposed toward them in all their undertakings and proceedings, it was ordered that the consuls, before they set out to the war, should celebrate those games and sacrifice those victims of the larger sort, which, in the consulate of Marcus Claudius Marcellus and Titus Quinctius, Titus Manlius the dictator had vowed, provided the commonwealth should continue in the same state for the next five years. The games were exhibited in the circus during four days, and the victims sacrificed to those deities to whom they had been vowed. Meanwhile, hope and anxiety daily and simultaneously increased, nor could the minds of men be brought to any fixed conclusion, whether it was a fit subject for rejoicing that Hannibal had now at length, after the sixteenth year, departed from Italy and left the Romans in the unmolested possession of it, or whether they had not greater cause to fear from his having transported his army in safety into Africa. They said that the scene of action certainly was changed, but not the danger, that Quintus Fabius, lately deceased, who had foretold how arduous the contest would be, was used to predict, not without good reason, that Hannibal would prove a more formidable enemy in his own country than he had been in a foreign one, and that Scipio would have to encounter not Syphax, a king of undisciplined barbarians whose armies Statorius, a man little better than a soldier's drudge, was used to lead, nor his father-in-law Hasdrubal, that most fugacious general, nor tumultuary armies hastily collected out of a crowd of half-armed rustics, but Hannibal, born in a manner in the pavilion of his father, that bravest of generals, nurtured and educated in the midst of arms, who served as a soldier formerly, when a boy, and became a general when he had scarcely attained the age of manhood, who, having grown old in victory, had filled Spain, Gaul, and Italy, from the Alps to the Strait, with monuments of his vast achievements, who commanded troops who had served as long as he had himself, troops hardened by the endurance of every species of suffering, such as it is scarcely credible that men could have supported, stained a thousand times with Roman blood, and bearing with them the spoils not only of soldiers, but of generals, that many would meet the eyes of Scipio in battle, who had with their own hands slain Roman praetors, generals, and consuls, many decorated with crowns in reward for having scaled walls and crossed ramparts, many who had traversed the captured camps and cities of the Romans, that the magistrates of the Roman people had not then so many fasces as Hannibal could have carried before him, having taken them from generals whom he had slain. 
While their minds were harassed by these apprehensions, their anxiety and fears were further increased from the circumstance that, whereas they had been accustomed to carry on war for several years in different parts of Italy, and within their view, with languid hopes and without the prospect of bringing it to a speedy termination, Scipio and Hannibal had stimulated the minds of all, as generals prepared for a final contest. Even those persons whose confidence in Scipio and hopes of victory were great were affected with anxiety, increasing in proportion as they saw their completion approaching. The state of feeling among the Carthaginians was much the same, for when they turned their eyes on Hannibal and the greatness of his achievements, they repented having solicited peace, but when again they reflected that they had been twice defeated in a pitched battle, that Syphax had been made prisoner, that they had been driven out of Spain in Italy, and that all this had been effected by the valor and conduct of Scipio alone, they regarded him with horror, as a general marked out by destiny and born for their destruction. Hannibal had by this time arrived at Adramentum, from which place, after employing a few days there in refreshing his soldiers, who had suffered from the motion by sea, he proceeded by forced marches to Zama, roused by the alarming statements of messengers who brought word that all the country around Carthage was filled with armed troops. Zama is distant from Carthage a five days' journey. Some spies whom he sent out from this place, being intercepted by the Roman guard and brought before Scipio, he directed that they should be handed over to the military tribunes, and after having been desired fearlessly to survey everything, to be conducted through the camp wherever they chose. Then, asking them whether they had examined everything to their satisfaction, he assigned them an escort and sent them back to Hannibal. Hannibal received none of the circumstances which were reported to him with feelings of joy, for they brought word that, as it happened, Massinissa had joined the enemy that very day with 6,000 infantry and 4,000 horse. But he was principally dispirited by the confidence of his enemy, which doubtless was not conceived without some ground. Accordingly, though he himself was the originator of the war, and by his coming had upset the truce which had been entered into and cut off all hopes of a treaty, yet, concluding that more favorable terms might be obtained if he solicited peace while his strength was unimpaired than when vanquished, he sent a message to Scipio requesting permission to confer with him. Scipio took up his position not far from the city of Naragara, in a situation convenient not only for other purposes, but also because there was a watering place within a dart's throw. Hannibal took possession of an eminence four miles thence, safe and convenient in every respect, except that he had a long way to go for water. Here, in the intermediate space, a place was chosen open to view from all sides, that there might be no opportunity for treachery. Their armed attendants having retired to an equal distance, they met, each attended by one interpreter, being the greatest generals not only of their own times, but of any to be found in the records of the times preceding them, and equal to any of the kings or generals of any nation whatever. When they came within sight of each other, they remained silent for a short time, thunderstruck, as it were, with mutual admiration. At length Hannibal thus began, since fate hath so ordained it that I, who was the first to wage war upon the Romans, and who have so often had victory almost within my reach, should voluntarily come to sue for peace, I rejoice that it is you, above all others, from whom it is my lot to solicit it. To you also, amid the many distinguished events of your life, it will not be esteemed one of the least glorious that Hannibal, to whom the gods had so often granted victory over the Roman generals, should have yielded to you, and that you should have put an end to this war, which has been rendered remarkable by your calamities, before it was by ours. Peace is proposed at a time when you have the advantage. We who negotiate it are the persons whom it most concerns to obtain it, and we are persons whose arrangements, be they what they will, our states will ratify. You have recovered Spain, which had been lost, after driving thence fourth Carthaginian armies. When elected consul, though all others wanted courage to defend Italy, 
you crossed over into Africa, where having cut to pieces two armies, having at once captured and burnt two camps in the same hour, having made prisoner Syphax, a most powerful king, and seized so many towns of his dominions and so many of ours, you have dragged me from Italy, the possession of which I had firmly held for now sixteen years. While your affairs are in a favorable and ours in a dubious state, you would derive honor and splendor from granting peace, while to us who solicit it, it would be considered as necessary rather than honorable. It is indeed the right of him who grants, and not of him who solicits it, to dictate the terms of peace, but perhaps we may not be unworthy to impose upon ourselves the fine. We do not refuse that all those possessions on account of which the war was begun should be yours. Sicily, Sardinia, Spain, with all the islands lying in any part of the sea, between Africa and Italy. Let us Carthaginians, confined within the shores of Africa, behold you, since such is the pleasure of the gods, extending your empire over foreign nations both by sea and land. I cannot deny that you have reason to suspect the Carthaginian faith, in consequence of their insincerity lately in soliciting a peace and while awaiting the decision. The sincerity with which a peace will be observed depends much, Scipio, on the person by whom it is sought. Your Senate, as I hear, refused to grant a peace in some measure because the deputies were deficient in respectability. It is I, Hannibal, who now solicit peace, who would neither ask for it unless I believed it expedient, nor will I fail to observe it for the same reason of expedience on account of which I have solicited it. And in the same manner as I, because the war was commenced by me, brought it to pass that no one regretted it till the gods began to regard me with displeasure, so will I also exert myself that no one may regret the peace procured by my means. In answer to these things, the Roman general spoke nearly to the following effect. I was aware that it was in consequence of the expectation of your arrival that the Carthaginians violated the existing faith of the truce and broke off all hope of a peace. Nor, indeed, do you conceal the fact, inasmuch as you artfully withdraw from the former conditions of peace every concession except what relates to those things which have for a long time been in our own power. But as it is your object that your countrymen should be sensible how great a burden they are relieved from by your means, so it is incumbent upon me to endeavor that they may not receive as the reward for their perfidy the concessions which they formerly stipulated, by expunging them now from the conditions of the peace. Though you do not deserve to be allowed the same conditions as before, you now request even to be benefited by your treachery. Neither did our fathers first make war respecting Sicily, nor did we respecting Spain. In the former case, the danger which threatened our allies, the Mamertines, and in the present, the destruction of Saguntum, girded us with just and pious arms. That you were the aggressors, both you yourselves confess, and the gods are witnesses, who determined the issue of the former war, and who are now determining, and will determine, the issue of the present, according to right and justice. As to myself, I am not forgetful of the instability of human affairs, but consider the influence of fortune, and am well aware that all our measures are liable to a thousand casualties. But as I should acknowledge that my conduct would savor of insolence and oppression if I rejected you on your coming in person to solicit peace before I crossed over into Africa, you voluntarily retiring from Italy, and after you had embarked your troops, so now, when I have dragged you into Africa almost by manual force, notwithstanding your resistance and evasions, I am not bound to treat you with any respect. Wherefore, if in addition to those stipulations on which it was considered that a peace would at that time have been agreed upon, and what they are you are informed, a compensation is proposed for having seized our ships together with their stores during a truce, and for the violence offered to our ambassadors, I shall then have matter to lay before my council, but if these things also appear oppressive, prepare for war, since you could not brook the conditions of peace. 
thus without effecting an accommodation when they had returned from the conference to their armies they informed them that words had been bandied to no purpose that the question must be decided by arms and that they must accept that fortune which the gods assigned to them when they had arrived at their camps they both issued orders that their soldiers should get their arms in readiness and prepare their minds for the final contest in which if fortune should favor them they would continue victorious not for a single day but forever before tomorrow night they said they would know whether rome or carthage should give laws to the world and that neither africa nor italy but the whole world would be the prize of victory that the dangers which threatened those who had the misfortune to be defeated were proportioned to the rewards of the victors for the romans had not any place of refuge in an unknown and foreign land and immediate destruction seemed to await carthage if the troops which formed her last reliance were defeated to this important contest the day following two generals by far the most renowned of any and belonging to two of the most powerful nations in the world advanced either to crown or overthrow on that day the many honors they had previously acquired scipio drew up his troops posting the hestati in front the principes behind them and closing his rear line with the triarii he did not draw up his cohorts in close order but each before their respective standards placing the companies at some distance from each other so as to leave a space through which the elephants of the enemy passing might not at all break their ranks laelius whom he had employed before as lieutenant general but this year as quaestor by special appointment according to a decree of the senate he posted with the italian cavalry in the left wing massinissa and the numidians in the right the open spaces between the companies of those in the van he filled with velites which then formed the roman light armed troops with an injunction that on the charge of the elephants they should either retire behind the files which extended in a right line or running to the right and left and placing themselves by the side of those in the van afford a passage by which the elephants might rush in between weapons on both sides hannibal in order to terrify the enemy drew up his elephants in front and he had eighty of them being more than he had ever had in any battle behind these his ligurian and gallic auxiliaries with valerians and moors intermixed in the second line he placed the carthaginians africans and a legion of macedonians then leaving a moderate interval he formed a reserve of italian troops consisting principally of brutians more of whom had followed him on his departure from italy by compulsion and necessity than by choice his cavalry also he placed in the wings the carthaginian occupying the right the numidian the left various were the means of exhortation employed in an army consisting of a mixture of so many different kinds of men men differing in language customs laws arms dress and appearance and in the motives for serving to the auxiliaries the prospect both of their present pay and many times more from the spoils was held out the gauls were stimulated by their peculiar and inherent animosity against the romans to the ligurians the hope was held out of enjoying the fertile plains of italy and quitting their rugged mountains if victorious the moors and numidians were terrified with subjection to the government of massinissa which he would exercise with despotic severity different grounds of hope and fear were represented to different persons the view of the carthaginians was directed to the walls of their city their household gods the sepulchers of their ancestors their children and parents and their trembling wives they were told that either the destruction of their city and slavery or the empire of the world awaited them that there was nothing intermediate which they could hope for or fear while the general was thus busily employed among the carthaginians and the captains of the respective nations among their countrymen most of them employing interpreters among troops intermixed with those of different nations the trumpets and cornets of the romans sounded and such a clamor arose that the elephants especially those in the left wing turned round upon their own party the moors and numidians 
Massinissa had no difficulty in increasing the alarm of the terrified enemy and deprived them of the aid of their cavalry in that wing. A few, however, of the beasts which were driven against the enemy and were not turned back through fear made great havoc among the ranks of the Velites, though not without receiving many wounds themselves. For when the Velites, retiring to the companies, had made way for the elephants, that they might not be trampled down, they discharged their darts at them. Exposed as they were to wounds on both sides, those in the van also keeping up a continual discharge of javelins, until driven out of the Roman line by the weapons, which fell upon them from all quarters. These elephants also put to flight even the cavalry of the Carthaginians posted in their right wing. Laelius, when he saw the enemy in disorder, struck additional terror into them in their confusion. The Carthaginian line was deprived of the cavalry on both sides, when the infantry, who were now not a match for the Romans in confidence or strength, engaged. In addition to this, there was one circumstance, trifling in itself, but at the same time producing important consequences in the action. On the part of the Romans, the shout was uniform, and on that account louder and more terrific, while the voices of the enemy, consisting as they did of many nations of different languages, were dissonant. The Romans used the stationary kind of fight, pressing upon the enemy with their own weight and that of their arms, but on the other side there was more of skirmishing and rapid movement than force. Accordingly, on the first charge, the Romans immediately drove back the line of their opponents, then pushing them with their elbows and the bosses of their shields, and pressing forward into the places from which they had pushed them. They advanced a considerable space, as though there had been no one to resist them. Those who formed the rear urging forward those in front, when they perceived the line of the enemy giving way, which circumstance itself gave great additional force in repelling them. On the side of the enemy, the second line, consisting of the Africans and Carthaginians, were so far from supporting the first line when giving ground, that on the contrary they even retired, lest their enemy, by slaying those who made a firm resistance, should penetrate to themselves also. Accordingly, the auxiliaries suddenly turned their backs, and facing about upon their own party, fled, some of them into the second line, while others slew those who did not receive them into their ranks, since before they did not support them, and now refused to receive them. And now there were, in a manner, two contests going on together, the Carthaginians being compelled to fight at once with the enemy and with their own party. Not even then, however, did they receive into their line the terrified and exasperated troops, but, closing their ranks, drove them out of the scene of action to the wings and the surrounding plain, lest they should mingle these soldiers, terrified with defeat and wounds, with that part of their line which was firm and fresh. But such a heap of men at arms had filled the space in which the auxiliaries a little while ago had stood, that it was almost more difficult to pass through it than through a close line of troops. The spearmen, therefore, who formed the front line, pursuing the enemy as each could find a way through the heap of arms and men and streams of blood, threw into complete disorder the battalions and companies. The standards also of the principes had begun to waver when they saw the line before them driven from their ground. Scipio, perceiving this, promptly ordered the signal to be given for the spearmen to retreat, and having taken his wounded into the rear, brought the principes and triarii to the wings in order that the line of spearmen in the center might be more strong and secure. Thus a fresh and renewed battle commenced, inasmuch as they had penetrated to their real antagonists, men equal to them in the nature of their arms, in their experience in war, in the fame of their achievements, and the greatness of their hopes and fears. But the Romans were superior both in numbers and courage, for they had now routed both the cavalry and the elephants, and, having already defeated the front line, were fighting against the second. Laelius and Massinissa, who had pursued the routed cavalry through a considerable space, returning very opportunely, charged the rear of the enemy's line. This attack of the cavalry at length routed them. Many of them, being surrounded, were slain in the field, 
and many, dispersed in flight through the open plain around, were slain on all hands, as the cavalry were in possession of every part. Of the Carthaginians and their allies, above twenty thousand were slain on that day. About an equal number were captured, with a hundred and thirty-three military standards and eleven elephants. Of the victors, as many as two thousand fell. End of section 23